<laughs> okay. All right. I think we are live. So let's begin. All right. Greetings and salutations. Thank you so much for being here to another Roadshow event. I'm your humble host here, Dave Duford. I'm here with David Heath. David Heath. David and David. Thank you guys so much for being here. And hello out there at uh, YouTube. I think we've got about 60 or 70 live right now and hopefully more here soon so uh thank you all for being here virtually and then also in attendance personally so let me give you an overview as to uh what we're going to be doing is your mic on sorry, mic's on okay good uh so we're going to be spending a good portion of our day today training you on selling final expense that's really the sole purpose of why you guys are here and what we're trying to deliver you to for you today so what is that going to consist of it's going to consist of reviewing real life sales calls and then analyzing what the agent is doing and why they're doing things right and maybe why they're not doing things so right. The purpose of that, of course, is to convey to you how you can do the same or avoid the problems that they're doing so that you can help more people and sell more insurance. That's really the goal. And again, I think the best way to do this, and we've done tons of trainings over the years, is again, to listen to real life sales presentations. It's one thing to come up here and lecture to you and that can be useful, but it's another thing to actually hear real life calls and then compare that to how the thing actually sounds. A couple of things I wanna throw out to you today. Um, we have the scripts and I want, if you guys want the scripts, as we go through the live sales presentations, also door knocking, we're gonna review some door knocking uh, recordings as well as appointment setting calls for face-to-face -face agents. You can go to davidduford.com forward slash ISS and then request a membership there if you haven't already. And then between the breaks, I'll let you guys in. And then you can go into the classroom section, look for the free scripts and download them and kind of follow along. So that's open to everybody here, as well as anybody that's uh, watching virtually or the recording of the call. Uh, so wanna make sure to mention uh, our, our, uh, our uh, sponsors today. We've got American Home Life in the back. Also Prosperity Life and Trinity are sponsoring today as well as ttcleads.com. Speaking of which, uh, we'll also have uh, spots for all of our sponsors to come in and talk about their carrier. So if you're looking for carrier training, we're gonna get some of that today as well. Um, we're gonna talk about leads a little bit later too. And uh, anything you wanna add to that? I think we pretty no, much hit everything. I think it's everything. Yeah. So we're gonna dive right into this thing right away, guys. And what I'm gonna go down here and start playing is that again, a real life sales call from an actual agent of ours. Her name is Wendy. So Wendy is an agent that started with us probably four or five, six yeah. months ago and has just done ex exceedingly well selling over the phone. So this is a telesales presentation that you're about to listen to. Now, if you're selling face to face, don't worry. The script, the process is like 90 percent identical. We'll make sure to point out the differences if you're selling face to face just to kind of compare and contrast. But the fundamentals of sales are the same no matter if you're selling in person or over the phone. And so what we're going to do is listen to it explain to you what's going on and david and i kind of take uh, turns back and forth and then take questions from you and by the way you can ask questions throughout the uh, throughout the training today you don't have to hold your mm -hmm. questions to the end this is an interactive training and for those of you watching at home you're welcome to throw your questions in the chat we'll save some time at the end to answer everybody's calls so uh that's pretty much it so let's jump right in and uh, we're going to start with again wendy's call here uh to a guy named jimmy and uh, we're going to uh, start it and then I'll pause it as we're going through it and kind of explain what's going on. And then if you have questions, uh, I'm happy to take them from you. So bear with me here as I pull up my Zoom, I wanna make sure that we're recording or the people at home can hear this. So let me turn up my audio just a little bit. All right, so let's play. Hello. Hey, Jimmy, this is Wendy giving you a quick call back about the information you requested on Facebook about our new state regulated final expense program. And I was just calling to verify I have you um, in the state zip code as. But that's all, you know, uh, muted so the personal information isn't shared. So what happened there in the beginning? This is very important when you're opening the sales presentation for telesales is how you open the beginning so as not to let the client interject and take control. So if we go back and listen to this again, I'll explain some of the core concepts here we're trying to, to, to really hit on. Hello. So right away when the client says hello, you go right into uh, telling the person who you are 
and why you're calling. What you don't want to say is, hey, is Jimmy there? And then pause. Now, why is that a problem? Anybody have an idea of why you don't want to ask a question and then wait around to see what they're going to say? Let me put it this way. Imagine you're the person on the other end of the line being called and somebody says, hey, is this, is this uh, Charles? What are you going to say to that? What are you thinking? It's probably a telemarketer, right? Right. So one of the fundamental points of, of calling on the phone, whether you're setting appointments or whether you're selling over the phone, is not to let your prospect gain leverage and control. OK, you need to get through the beginning 30 seconds as, as streamlined as possible without the client taking over and uh, trying to dictate the terms of engagement. All right. So if you listen to Wendy's response here. Hey, Jimmy, this is Wendy giving you a quick call back about the information. Notice how she goes right into it. Hey, Jimmy, this is uh, Wendy giving you a quick call back about the information. She goes right into it. Notice she also assumed it was Jimmy. Right. If, if somebody answers and it's Jimmy on the lead and it sounds like a Jimmy, we assume it's a Jimmy. If it's the son or somebody else, they'll correct us and then hand the phone over to the other person. Does that make sense, everybody? So, yeah, Hannah. Yep. Uh, uh, hey, hey, Mr. DeFord or Mrs. DeFord, this is David DeFord getting back to you. Just assume it's the spouse. Yeah. Yes, on the spot. Um, a minor note here, a lot, a lot of people will say, well, should I use the first name or should I use the Mr. or Mrs. last name? What do you do, David? When you well, me, I'm from Tennessee. So it's Mr. or Mrs. whatever, do Ford Heath, whatever. Now, I do have agents up north and in other areas where they go the other way. They will tell you that it, say, it sounds salesy. Like in Pennsylvania, that's a good example. They don't go to the door, Mr. It, hey, Mr. Heath, how are you doing? They actually go up, hey, David, how are you? You know, so it's different. But now here, me personally, it's Mr. or Mrs. If a female answers and his last name's White, it's Miss White is how I would say that. Um, or Mr. White. Yeah, that's so the regional stuff. Go ahead, Luke. Hello. Luke. And I go with the first name. Me, I'm a little different. I'm going to say, hey, Jimmy, how you doing? And I'm going to let him correct me. That's just me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, I, it may not be correct. I don't know, but I'll usually just say, hey, Jimmy, it's David calling back about and then they'll stop me. Oh, this is not Jimmy. This is Jimmy's wife. Oh, hey. Pronounce.com wants any name on this. Okay. Pronounce.com. Pronounce.com. <laughs> We've got a dot com for everything, don't we? We do nowadays, yeah. It's, it's wild. <laughs> All right, let's keep going here. Information you requested on Facebook about our new state regulated final expense program. All right. What four letter word are they not using? That's what somebody said. Life insurance. Yes. Life. life insurance. Why do you not say life insurance on the opening of the call? Click, click. Did I hear click? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you say life insurance, people have a presumed imagined uh, belief of what it is. It could be right. It could be terribly wrong. More often than not, it is inaccurate. Right. So we don't even say life insurance. We say program, final expense program. It's only after they are comfortable with you in the process of the conversation that you start to say it's life insurance. So it comes a little bit later, typically in the introduction, as you ask questions about pre-qualifying. But one tip is if you're that this is great for door knocking, appointment setting, selling over the phone, is don't use life insurance. It's a four-letter dirty word. Don't even say it. It's the program. You're selling the program, the final expense program. Okay, makes sense. Anybody? Any questions on that? Word information interchangeable with that. The the information you requested. Is that what you're asking? I I like saying that as opposed to saying, "Hey, this is Dave Dufour getting back to sell you a policy, life insurance policy." Yeah. That we help. Can I send you information? Yeah, you're. I'm requesting. Well, the one thing, the reason we use 
program is because it corresponds with final expense or state regulated final expense. Those are pieces of language that are on most of your final expense leads. True. Tried and true. Yeah, do what works. It yeah. generally works. So we like saying state regulated final expense program that you requested on Facebook or wherever it is that they request. Okay. And that's going to match with whatever they clicked on or sent back yeah. in. That's the reason we stay with that terminology because they've seen it already. It must have enticed them enough to go forward. So we want to bring it up that way again. That way it'll correlate with them what they did, what we're calling about, basically. Yeah. So let's play this from the beginning. Now we kind of flesh this out a little bit. You kind of know how the opening sounds and we, we're going to let it ride and have the clients start talking. Hello. Hey, Jimmy, this is Wendy giving you a quick call back about the information you requested on Facebook about our new state regulated final expense program. And I was just calling to verify, I have you um, in the state zip code as now that, that verification is, is a way to establish you actually did this. Because one of the common things we hear, what, what's the most common objection we hear, we hear from, from a lead that we call? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Yeah, so you wanna overcome that before it becomes an objection. They, they manifest audibly. In other words, I have you listed here as living in Denver, Colorado and your zip code 37415, okay? And notice what you shouldn't do is say, I've got you listed as living in Denver, Colorado at 37415, right? Yep. Don't let What am I doing? Doing. Yeah. And that's actually wrong. Goodbye. Yeah. You're, you're opening the door for them to take control. And the key thing with the opening of the call is to take control always. And taking control is, is quite dependent on how you frame things and what you say. Does that make sense, everybody? So to see this as a recurring theme with all openings for, for door knocks, appointment setting, et cetera. Okay. So, uh, and she's going through this validating. Yes. All right. And how are you doing today? Well, how are you doing today? What do you think about that, David? Mm, that I, I normally don't like to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I was doing good till you called. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I don't know. To me, it's just one of them I try to stay away from personally. Okay. Um, that's just my opinion. I was taught that years ago. Don't, and even at the door, don't ask them how they're doing. They'll say it sucks. Get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. You know, again, you're opening up a door that they might take control. What should be said instead, in your opinion? Instead of how are you doing, um, if I had a favorite hobby right there, I might would go into the hobby on the Facebook lead. I'd say, now you said your favorite hobby was uh, fishing. What kind of fish do y'all catch down there? You know, give them something to talk about that we can build on. So, so this gets us into the stage of rapport building. We've gotten through the initial rough spots for the most part as we get through this and ask typically we ask some sort of rapport building question based off of the favorite hobby they said or if they live in a certain place we'll ask them something that's relevant right the question i want to pose to you guys out uh, virtually and in person here is how long do you spend building rapport with a client any any guesses want to throw some numbers out there a couple minutes more anybody say more five minutes anybody say less Anybody gonna say less? I would say just like whatever he has, like your neighbor, how he's fishing. How's the fishing out there? Yeah, yeah. What we'll tell you this in, in training agents since 2013, the emphasis I put on rapport has dropped dramatically. It just doesn't really matter that much. Okay. Um, it probably, uh, well, in person, you can get away with doing more, but when you do telesales, if you guys, by the way, who's, who's wanting to sell or is selling over the phone by raise a hand, hands in here? Okay, who's selling in person? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Okay, cool, cool. So with telesales, for those of you doing telesales, minimize it. I mean, maybe not even 30 seconds, 60 seconds. You don't need to go on about fishing. You can talk a little bit about fishing, 
but let's get to business. Let's talk about why you sent this card and we'll get to that section a little bit. So don't go overboard with rapport building. Um, you'll find a lot of people in our marketplace, guess what they like to do? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. They'll tell you all about the fish they, cat, they caught in the last 10 years or all. They'll show you all of them. They'll show you all of them, yeah. Uh, they just keep... Well, yeah. one right. thing I, I'd like to point out too, um, you know, Hanna, me and you went out yesterday. How long did I build rapport? Not long at all. But I build it through the rest of the presentation. I'd say I spent 60 seconds tops on building rapport with the lady. And then I went straight into, okay, now that I know a little bit about you, let me explain to you why I'm here. You know, so it doesn't take a lot. I think the key is you build the rest of the way through because my worst uh, if you want to call it a negative, would be I would build too much rapport. I'd sit there and talk 15 minutes to somebody. And once you do that, I think there's a fine line on rapport building. Now you're their friend. Ryan, you're my friend. I don't mind telling you no. Yeah, they, they, the, the roles have been reversed at that point. So keep that in mind as you're, you're looking at rapport. Yeah, it's, it's something that you will establish over time. And one of the things I like to say, too, is, is it's what matters to a sale is building trust. Do they trust you? Right. Likeability is important, but they got to trust you, too. And we really emphasize more of the trust in our script as we talk to our clients. And, and you'll, we'll get into some questions here in a minute about how we pose the questions so that people feel really connected. We really understand them based off of the questions we're asking, right? So that's where you're gonna find more of our emphasis as we go through the script. So let's listen to, uh, Wendy says, how are you doing? Let's hear what Jimmy says. Right now I'm sitting in dialysis. <laughs> I, I mean, he's, he's literally sitting in dialysis, you know? <laughs> Our kind of client. <laughs> she asked me. So. All right. Oh, buddy. Yeah. Right. So you were looking for some life insurance, though? Yeah. Now, notice notice how she got off of that dialysis question. Oh, wow. So you're looking for life insurance, you know, but she set up with a little bit more spunk, right? Like, wow, that's tough. Yeah. Well, she didn't. She could have gone down to how long you've been on dialysis. When did your kidneys fail? And then 10 minutes later, we're no closer to where we need to be, right? So what Wendy did there was very great. She acknowledged that, but didn't sidetrack, do some side quests that would take, you know, 15 minutes before you get back to actually selling something. Make sense, y'all? So that's good. She did well with that, actually. She did very well. She did, did well. And now we're getting back to the fundamentals here of, you know, wh who, who, you know, getting back to the script, trying to sell some insurance. So let's, let's hear what she says. She asked about, so you sent this back requesting life insurance. I don't know if I would say that too early. I don't know. It's a little early in, in my yeah. book right now. Yeah. I want to get to know it. What were your thoughts, concerns? We'll get to the questions here in a little bit. Why did you request this information, et cetera? I want to tell them a little bit about myself to introduce myself. So let's see if Wendy gets to that. Yeah. Okay. Now, is this going to be for yourself or for a loved one? Just for me. Just for you. Okay. And do you have anything in place right now? No. Okay. All right. Well, let us. So one of the things that we do with telesales that I think is markedly different than face-to-face -face is we get to the point a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Is this something you're looking on yourself or, or a loved one? So that lets us know how many policies we've got in play here, or if there's possibly a spousal objection that you have to overcome. And um, do you have existing coverage? You know, so what do you have? Is it something we can improve upon? Is it something that they bought through, you know, some two-year weight product, right? Which in his case probably was going to get more than likely. But in some cases, maybe the one you're, that was sold them, you could do better. So we're in doing some investigation. This is what's called pre-qualifying. What caused this client to request this information? Why, why does this matter to them? So, so this is the beginnings of that. We'll hopefully go a little bit deeper here in a second. So let's see where Wendy takes us. See what we can do for you here. All right. So um, again, my name is Wes Wendy Whitson. Okay. And I am a licensed life. And, and so now we're getting into the introductory phase. So when somebody calls you out of the blue and you start talking about dying, personal information, at some point you're going to want to know who is this person? I'm talking, mm -hmm. right? So we, so we tell them who we are, why we're calling, and why they should care. Okay, so when do you uh, 
told her her last name. She's going to say that she's a licensed life insurance agent. She specializes in helping people 50 and older with their final expense needs. And then what makes us different is we shop around to find the best combination of price and coverage. Okay, we need to have some kind of phrase that separates us from every other agent. Now, in the mind of our clients, they don't know that most agents are brokers, right? Uh, but we need to explain that to them like, hey, we're not married to State Farm or whatever. We shop to find the best combination of price and coverage. And that's a little benefit point in our clients' minds because they think, oh, wow, this person can get me a good deal. I'm on a fixed income. I like getting good deals, right? Anything you want to add to that? No, that, that's exactly right. Okay, and I specialize in helping people 50 and older get life insurance to cover things like final expenses, burial, and cremation costs. Okay, now I'm what's known um, as a broker, so I get to shop all the major insurance companies for you so I can help you get the best bang for your buck. All right. Yeah. Now, so Jimmy, the reason. Um, so, so again, same thing we just described, right? Any questions on the introduction there? Really important to say that early on. Uh, in the presentation. So the client just knows the agenda. They know who you are, why they should even listen to you. If you don't explain yourself, they're going to start wondering, yeah, who's this person? Okay. The other thing I want to point out here, you notice how Wendy's upbeat? And she sounds like she's got a little energy. You know, that you want to, as doing anything over the phone, uh, and maybe in person to a certain extent, but to an extent, overemphasizing on the phone your tonality. Okay. It's not like here where you get to see me talk when you're selling over the phone. It's just the noise, right? You don't have body language. You don't talk like this, right? They can't see that. So you have to up the ante when it comes to your tone. There has to be some kind of cadence, slow down, pacing in your, your, your tonality. So you'll listen to that as we go through this, because if you're setting appointments as a face-to-face -face agent or selling over the phone, if you sound mundane, boring, uh, you know, monotone. You could follow the script perfectly, but people will not want to deal with you. Yep, and that's exactly right. And with face-to-face, -face, it is an extent of that. You know, we need to be upbeat, but like David said, they can see me. I can read their body language. They can read, they can read mine. So going in face-to-face, -face, we don't work on tonality as much as looking confident, looking like the one they want to do business with. You know, you are that rock, basically. So that's going to be more what we focus on face-to-face. -face. We still want to have tonality, but we want to show confidence and show that we are professionals. We're brokers. We do this every day. Nothing new. Any questions about that? Yeah, we're going to. So, so just for the people at home that can't hear you, uh, what if you're selling other products besides final expense, mm -hmm. like Medicare Advantage, that kind of thing? How would you introduce that, if at all, David? Well, one thing you've got to remember with Medicare, there's laws, right? Okay, so think about that first of all. I'm going to go in and talk to them about final expense, and then I'm going to get back with them on the rest of it. When I'm leaving, that may be when I mention, hey, I do other things, uh, but <laughs> because of some of the rules that we have, especially in California right now, we're seeing a lot of, of rules and regulation, legal things. So, I would. I definitely wouldn't do it right here in the script by any means. This is not the place for it. But as you get through, maybe after you close and you do something, then mention. Um, but now, if now correct me if I'm wrong here, Dave. Once they're a final client, we have a business relationship yeah. with them, yeah. right? Right. That trumps the laws once you have a business relationship. So I like to go ahead and get them on the books. And, and so I've got a business relationship, then I'll work on everything else. Um, how do you feel on that? I, I think there's something to be said about a focused intent on one product. If you try to juggle, especially if you're newer, if you try to juggle final expense, Medicare, ACA, cancer plans, annuities, like all at the same time, like, and you're leading with a final expense lead, it's very overwhelming, number one. 
And number two, it could lead you down these paths that weren't originally what you came to do. Now, I think if you start with final expense and then end, and then pivot to some other product, if there's no opportunity, or if there is, and then find it, that's, I think that's easier to do. Mm -hmm. a, a, a very important tenant, and this is why our emphasis on recruiting is so final expense mm -hmm. focused, because to get good at this business, you really have to focus on one thing only. Yeah. And a cool thing, but it's also like a, a silver lining, is this business is so awesome. You could do well with any product, but you can't do well at, with all the products at the same time trying to learn, right? So pick your poison, mm -hmm. right? You know, we think it's final expense for yeah. a number of reasons. It pays high, it issues quickly. There's a lot of prospects, but don't try to come in. And that's a little sidebar to what you ask, but that's why we don't like doing agents that do Medicare and ACA and final expense as a brand new agent. That's just, it's too much. There's too much to know as a new agent that you should get through first yes. before adding those on, which usually at a later time is completely. Any questions about that or anything else? And kind of piggybacking off of that, <clears throat> excuse me, once you've built your book of business, you got a lot of people to go see, right? Yeah. Let's build our book of business first in final expense. So a, a lot of you here are face to face. And so I want to spend a little time on the confidence thing, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Yes, sir. A, a good question that comes up a lot is what do you wear? What should I wear to the door? Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, I'll tell you what I wore yesterday. I wore a pair of pants almost exactly like these. And I wore a shirt almost exactly like this, except it had gray stripes going down it. Um, I dress above what they're going to be, but I don't wear a suit. That's just me personally. But I want them to know I'm a professional. I want them to know when I walk up, that I look a little different than the rest of the folks walking around the neighborhood because I am. I'm a broker. I do this every day. To me, that gains a little bit of trust without saying anything. Um, now, is it okay to wear blue jeans? Yes, it is. If you wear nice blue jeans, don't wear all holes in them and stuff, you know, like I tell my kids, don't buy those. <laughs> but yeah, you know, dress business casual or nicer yeah um also do you what do you think about wearing a, a lanyard i've done that in the past um yeah. i i have mixed emotions on that actually so that's um, the thing that goes around your neck and it's got like an id you know you mm -hmm. kind of make the id up but it looks official yeah. you know so i used to do it when i started uh, door knocking in 2011 and I think I lost the thing and then you know never never worried about it ever so again so. probably wore it a year or so and then it, mine got lost too or something yeah. but yeah it, but we face to face we're going to have a copy of our license with it I tell each of my folks to laminate that have it with you hand it to them let them see it let them know you're the real deal because there's so Life, many yes, yes. there's so many scams out there nowadays, right? And I get so tired of people thinking I'm a scammer because I know I'm not. But that is something we have to overcome. So if you've got a license, and I hear a lot of people say, you know, this just shows that I've jumped through all the hoops that the state requires me to do to be able to come out here and broker life insurance. Um, but I think it adds to your credibility, which is going to also give that confidence level a little bit of a boost, right? So to get that, so get your license, laminate it. If you're selling face-to-face, -face, show it when you're, you're in the introduction part stage just hand it to them so they can see it right i also used to show my wife and my son yeah pictures. right because a lot of our clients are what grandparents and so when they see little kids or families it's a soft spot you know so you can use that to your advantage tony so uh, so tony's asking about business cards yeah definitely print business cards. print cards my favorite business card was a magnet refrigerator magnet yeah because if we know uh, where a, a business card is going to always be, it's on a fridge. On the fridge. Otherwise, it's going to get thrown away, you know? So if it's a little extra money, but it definitely helps, I think. One thing I did yesterday, and you'll remember, she had a dog, right? The dog kind of growled at me at first, right? You know? But that's okay. We made friends. What do I do with her when I pull out my iPad? I show her a picture of my Australian Shepherd right off the bat. You know, something 
to now normally that might have been a picture of my family also it depends on where i'm at what i'm gonna show but she this dog was 11 years old right and just she loved this dog so worked out good yes sir you guys prefer having an iPad, laptop, or something like that. Okay. Question is, do we prefer iPad or a laptop? Either one is fine. The reason I use an iPad, and I'll tell you, is because I have cellular data on my iPad. I don't have to hotspot to it uh, like I would a laptop. I don't necessarily, except for yesterday, have to jump on their Wi-Fi because 5G here is horrible. I don't care what they say. This 5G ain't working for me. Um, but I didn't have good cellular data. So I did end up having to jump on their Wi-Fi, ask them for permission, right? Make them feel like they're doing something for you. Again, we're building confidence in us the whole time we're doing this. We're building rapport throughout. When I asked her for her Wi-Fi, she felt like she did me a favor. You got a yes. Yeah, I got a yes. And I keep Perfect. trying to get yeses. Exactly. But either way you want to go with that is fine. We have agents doing it either, either way. So whatever's best for you. But me personally, I just prefer the iPad. Because when I door knock, this is getting a little ahead. I have it hidden under a folder and the lead on top so they never see anything when I go in. Then all of a sudden I pull out the pad and they're like, dang it, I let you in. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just joking, but I do conceal the iPad. And any questions on just the face-to-face -face portion of this presentation, anything here? If you have them, keep them coming. Anybody at home to throw your questions in the chat, I'll read them personally and then... Uh, answer okay let's keep going you know most people are calling is because they want to get information a lot of people are worried about how expensive funerals are and burial costs <clears throat> and they just want to have a plan in place to give them a peace of mind okay mm -hmm. yeah so my question to you is what were your thoughts and concerns that um had you request this information today are you uh, all right this is this is the question if you answer if you ask one question to your clients it's what were your thoughts, concerns that prompted you to request this information? The most important question to find out is why. Why is that important? Because it tells you the underlying motivation of what even began this process of looking at life insurance. Was it the death of a loved one? Was it a death of a friend? What was that experience? Usually it's bad. Sometimes it's good. Whatever it is, I want to know what that motivation is, because what happens with all of us, right? You can think that it's experiences in our lives where something traumatic happens. We reflect on that. But what if I'm in that situation? How will my kids respond, right? So when we go back to when that happened, that trauma or that experience and relay it to why they should buy life, they're telling us why they need to buy it. We're not telling them, they're telling us. And they're motivated to buy it because of that does that make sense how, how did your sales call go with with haunted the other day as far as it that it, it went well she uh she told us that her reason was she did not want her children to have this burden she wanted and actually the statement she made was it was it was great actually she said i want my children to have peace of mind that's where we're wanting to get with these individuals right question okay but we want to get them basically i call it hog tying them for the clothes because we're going to use that's that's a lexington tennessee term <laughs> but no i do we we want to use what they tell us when they go to object on us later on and say i got to talk to my kids I can't do it right now. We've got to get this part right here good because all I'm going to do is say, hey, Miss Jones, you just told me a little, little bit ago that Tanya, your daughter, does not have 12 grand to bury you. Why are you backing out now? Yeah. What, what's happened? You know, so it's really important that we get a true why right here. If not, it's coming back up at the close. 
So, so good point. A true why. What if they say, uh, you know, uh, Brandon, what were your thoughts, concerns when you requested this information? And your response is, I don't know. I just saw it on Facebook. Is that a true why? I'm not getting any younger. Is that a true one? Not to me. Very not surface. <laughs> at, at best. We got to dig <laughs> yeah. at that point. You cannot accept a not true why. Because if you're like, oh, great, you're not going to get, clearly you're not getting any younger. And you keep moving on. Guess what's going to happen? I'm going to think about it. Because you didn't tap into that motivation that's underlying. It's making sense, everybody. So what do you do when you hear that? What do you do if I say, well, I just, I'm not getting any younger today? I say, hey, I totally understand. I'm not either. Uh, but the real thing I'm concerned about and want to know, Mr. Do Ford, is what's happened in your life now that has caused you to request this information? You know, and what we've got to realize is this is our shot right here, folks. Yeah. Go guns a blazing. OK, if you're going to back out anywhere, don't let it be right here. Back out somewhere else. But this is so crucial that we have to get this because, honestly, the rest of our script builds upon this statement. If we don't get it, we're not doing a lot of building. Yes, sir, Brain. OK, the question is, what if we can't get a good why? What if we can't get past this? OK, me personally, I'm going to ask them two or three times. Then after that, I'm going to create a scene for them. I'm going to say, well, let me tell you what happened when my mama died. Let me tell you how it is to not have life insurance. Let me tell you how it hurt my family, how it tore us up not only financially, but emotionally. So I'm going to build my why at that point. If I've gone to them three times and they're not giving me nothing, I'm going to give them my why. And then I'm going to see if I can get them to open up and say, well, man, I didn't want to bring it up, but yeah, that's kind of my problem too. You know, so I want to put it back on me, uh, but I'm going to go with the script three times. I'm going to keep asking them and say, hey, I totally get that. That makes perfect sense. But what's the real reason? So if they don't have a why, is this a prospect? <laughs> Get out of the door if this doesn't work. <laughs> there is an exception to that. There is. And that would be if they have life insurance. Yeah. Right? So what you should do on every call, telesales, but I think it's more approachable, more regularly for the face-to-face -face people. You always need to be getting the policy to review it. Does the client have the best policy? Mm -hmm. A lot of people buy plans where maybe they were, they should, they, they, somebody wrote a plan up on them and it was not the right plan for them. maybe there's a two year wait, they could get first April coverage. And they'll tell you, I, I got enough life insurance. I don't need life insurance, but they don't know the problem with their existing coverage. They don't know the options that we get, can give our clients as brokers. Does this make sense, y'all? So they may not, they may come off this like, eh, you know, whatever. Yeah. But you got to keep digging at least to get to the policy review. Yeah. And we should hit up on some policy review stuff. Yeah, actually, that would be a good time we'll to do that later. To do a today. little out of time, but yeah, for sure, because it's very relevant. So, okay. So, the why. Everybody, any questions about the why? Uh, Charles. Oh, Charles. Well, I have some insurance. I was just going to Okay. Now, why do they want to quote? Possibly to add. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to add coverage? See where we're getting here, guys? Just keep asking why. Quotes, just it's just a smoke screen. Everybody wants a quote, but why do you want a quote? Why does Gordon have more? Hi. Yeah, yeah. So what she's saying, and then I'll say this for the people at home, 
if, if you just can't get anywhere with the why question, you can always ask the, you know, here's the three reasons why people do this and then give them the reasons and then ask which one fits. The, again, real quick for the, the virtual audience. One, there's no coverage. They don't want to die and leave a burden. Two, they've already got coverage, but they're looking more. And then three, maybe they think they're paying too much and want a better price. And sometimes we would add like just leave a legacy or something. Usually it's one or two they don't have. And so then you can kind of roll with it then. And that progresses the call, but we still want to know why. Yeah. Why would you want it? You know what I mean? So we really want to hammer out the what happens if they die and don't have coverage. How does that affect their loved ones? How does that affect their children? How would they feel about that, right? Because again, if you're new here to, to final expense, there's a three word descriptor that really describes all of our clients. World class procrastinators. <laughs> exactly. All right. World class procrastinators. They're in their 60s, their 70s, even their 80s. And they're just starting to think about getting policy. All right. They've been putting this off for a long time long time many times they've already had a bunch of agents and yes and have shoot them off right so this is why we do this like deep why investigation because this is providential you're at this time where you can make that you may be the last guy or gal in the door or on the phone to help them with what they need and so that's why we do this because we have to develop a narrative and a story to get them committed because it might be their last time and well, I, I would say, look at it from this point of view. I've, I've got a client of mine that her father, I saw twice. He turned me down both times. I wasn't tough enough on him. The third time I came back, you know what? He wasn't there anymore. Now, his daughter bought a policy that day, but he was not. So, you know, you look at that. Did I fail? Possibly. I should have been tougher. Did I know the outcome? No. But I think about that gentleman often. When people are giving me static, I'm like, no, not today. You're not dying on my watch. You know, so think about that. It really is realistic that you could be the last one that talks to them. Remember, they put 30 off. They put 30 people off before you. And you're the last one. So treat each call, each door knock like that's the last time you'll see them and you will feel so much better, first of all. And if they don't take it, that's on them at that point, right? Do you know what when what David has said becomes a reality? You know, when that when, what you've just said becomes a reality, like it actually this it's when you actually have somebody die. die right. Yeah. When you see something, when you think back and you're like, that person was healthy. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, they're not perfect health, but they're dead. They're dead. It's a now. shock. And then you start thinking about what if I didn't show up that day? What if I was lazy and just wanted to hang out, yeah. lay out, do nothing? What if I stopped at McDonald's and took a two hour lunch? Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Like your effort matters, y'all. Like you make a difference. Like that's what's cool about this business is like you really do. And these people need you. Your prospects need you badly because without well, it, they're not going to get it. More than they know they need. Yeah. So, so what's great about your clients dying? I mean, it's not great, but what it does when it happens, it's like this, wow, everything I do actually matters. And you will push that much more to get to the door, to mm -hmm. make the next phone call because you're a life insurance evangelist, right? So, cool. Any questions before we hand it over to Jack and Prosperity? So we're going to keep going with this presentation and go more into the why. We're gonna go into health questions. We're gonna go into the clothes. We're gonna do a lot of this throughout the rest of the day. We're also gonna go into door knocking, uh, appointment setting over the phone too, uh, as well. But we're gonna hand this over to Jack at Prosperity, one of our wonderful sponsors, who's uh, so nice to come down and talk business. So you're gonna learn a lot about Prosperity, why you should write them in the final expense world. And uh, let's give Jack a hand. Hey, Jack. It's mine, Jack. Sean. Make sure it's still on. Yeah, it's on. Perfect. Actually, Dave, I had to come up to get here. I live in Texas, so this is this is coming north for me. <laughs> so I am in business attire today, just in case anybody wants to know. Blue jeans are formal business attire. Sometimes you can have informal business attire, sometimes formal business attire, um, but they're always going to be blue jeans. So a um, little bit about myself. My name is Jack Heller. As Dave said, I am from Prosperity Life, and just to add a quick question for you. 
who is actually appointed with us currently? A few of you, have you sold any policies with us? Okay, well, you're gonna be uh, really excited because we have some really exciting news, Dave, you don't even know about yet. So uh, we have some exciting things that I'm gonna announce to y'all today, but a little bit about myself. I actually started in this industry 36 years ago. Yes, I did start when I was seven, in case you're wondering. Um, so I've been in this business for a long time. I spent 15 years on the street doing exactly what you guys do every day, knocking on doors, going to see people, convincing them what we do is important to them, answering their whys, and doing all the things that this group here is talking to you about, and it does make a difference. And you know, Dave, you mentioned it, when, when you get that first death claim, when you get that first person, and I had the same experience you did the first time that I found out a potential customer had passed away was when I let them convince me they wanted to think about it. And the guy got on his motorcycle two hours later and got killed in a uh, motorcycle crash. If I had done my job while I was there, he would have been insured and the family would have been insured. OK, so I live with that for the rest of my life. Um, knowing that I didn't finish the process. I let them sell me instead of me selling them. So one of the things I'm gonna ask you all to do is to make sure you do that. The second thing I'm gonna say to you is my product is not right for everybody, okay? You guys are brokers. You have an incredible opportunity. You represent a number of different companies. Some are better than others for certain situations, okay? And I'm gonna ask you to do one, me one favor treat every customer like it was your mother sitting across the table, okay? And just make sure that you know that if you're not there and some life insurance salesperson is talking to your mother today, you know, is she getting the best product out there for the money that she can get? And like I said, I think my product is, is great. I think we're great in most situations. Are we great in 100% of the situations? Absolutely not, and no company is. So if any company tells you they are, they're not being truthful with you, okay? So a little bit about prosperity as I, well, actually, before I, I do that, I do wanna tell you all, this is not the first time I've done this presentation, okay? I've done these a few times in my life. Uh, let's see, I leave here and go to Houston and do another one this afternoon. Um, so if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to uh, throw your hand up and interrupt me, you are not going to throw me off, okay? Just like you're gonna get when you're making a presentation to a customer, if somebody asks you a question, you want to engage people. I want you guys to be engaged, so don't hesitate to, if you have any questions. We have multiple products at Prosperity. I'm really only gonna talk about one today, and that's called our new Vista Final Expense product, okay? And a little bit about our new Vista Final Expense product. For starters, the product is issued ages 55 to 80, we have three different coverages. We have a level plan, a graded plan, and a modified plan. And I'm gonna go into those in a little bit of detail for you. Uh, our coverage amounts are $5,000 to $35,000. And a couple of things about our product that are really unique, we're also gonna to touch on. But let's start with what a level plan means. Does everybody know what that is in here? Level plan, just so y'all make sure and everybody on the, on the camera is also involved. Uh, with this, a level plan means that the coverage you sold them goes into effect immediately once that first check clears. So what you're going to find out about me is I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so I need to keep things simple. Okay. So when I keep things simple, let's say we're just using a $20,000 policy. So if that person bought a level $20,000 policy and they were to die a week later, how much coverage would their family get? $20,000. Pretty simple. Okay, so I told you, I like to keep things easy. Okay, so a level plan means that they're pretty healthy. They've answered all the questions you're gonna see on our application. We have the first section, the application is your disqualifier questions. Second section is what we call our modified, third section graded, if they answer no to all those questions. And all those questions with the exception of the very first question on the app are yes and no questions. If they answer everything no, they qualify for a level plan. Okay, we issue 100% of our plans at the point of sale. Now, anyone who sold my plan right now is saying, no, 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 you don't, Jack. You're, you're not telling us the truth because we have ex you know, issued, we have rejected, and we have referred to underwriting, okay? 
So how can you issue 100% of your plans if you have a referred underwriting? I'm gonna tell you one of the deep dark secrets of the insurance world. Refer to underwriting means there's something in their MIB report that we already know that they are not telling you, okay? So we're gonna ask you to re-ask the question. If they do not modify their answer and they continue to tell you what, you know, the same answer, it's gonna get referred to underwriting. When it gets referred to underwriting, we're gonna send them this very nice letter saying, thank you for your application. We discovered something in the underwriting process and I'm paraphrasing here. Um, so please send us five years of medical records at your own expense. The next person who does that will also be the first person who's ever done that, okay? So if you get a referred to underwriting, it's not going through. I'm just telling you right now, move on to one of your other carriers or one of your other companies that maybe you have an opportunity to make sense. Okay, so we know what the level plan is, pretty simple. All companies call these different, the next two. And by the way, most companies only offer two plans, um, but we do offer all three. So what we call a graded plan now becomes in the first year, so they have some health issues, not all that serious, but means we'll only give 30% coverage the first year. So if they bought that $20,000 plan, 30% coverage, if they die in that first year, we'll give them $6,000 worth of benefit. If they die in year two, that goes to 70% or $14,000, okay? If they were to die accidentally in years one or two, we will pay the full death benefit, okay? But they do have a limited benefit in years one and two. Okay. And the reason for this, as I said, they have some health issues. They might have COPD, for example. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's the modified? That's the graded plan with us. And again, this varies from company to company, so be real careful. Um, for instance, what we call graded, there's a company out there. I don't like to use anybody else's name. They have a, a show about wild kingdoms and things like that. Um, but whoever they might be, they call their graded plan um, what a return of premium is for us. So it, they all are a little bit different. So just be careful, make sure you get each company's definition correctly. So real simple, they go through, they answer yes to one of those graded questions. We're still happy to offer them a policy, but they have those limitations. The other one, the third one is what we call modified. And I already used the words return of premium. People say to me, Jack, why don't you just call it return of premium? Everybody calls it return of premium. What does that mean? It means that if somebody dies, I mean, what normally happens is the company will take the premium they've paid, they'll give them an extra 10%, and that's what they'll return to the beneficiary. So if they die in month three, they get X. If they die in month seven, they get Y. If they die in month 17, they get Z. And it get, becomes very complicated. What did I tell you all a few minutes ago? I'm not that smart. So I like to keep things simple. So how, do, how does ours work and why don't we call it return of premiums? If somebody dies in the first year, and let's just say they paid us one month premium, okay? And that $20,000 plan costs $100 a month. Like how I keep it simple. <laughs> so it costs $100 a month. They die in the first year. What are most companies gonna do? They're gonna give them $100 back plus 10% or $110. Here's where prosperity is different. We're going to take that $100, we're going to multiply it times 12. We're going to annualize that premium day one. And then we're still going to give them 10% on top of that. So we're going to give them back $1,320 to their beneficiaries. In year two, that goes to 231%. Why is that important? Because now you can tell the person without any question exactly what they'll get, where their family will get if they die anytime in year one or anytime in year two. Okay, because you can do the math right there. It's just 110. If it's year one, 231% year two. Make sense? Okay. A couple other things that are different with the way that we treat you as an agent and we treat our customers and our policies. Most companies out there, as you get older, they're going to lower the benefits. Okay, they're going to say, okay, you have your level plan, goes to age 80 or 85 or whatever it is, and you can get 35,000. But if they have health issues and they're above 75, they can only get $20,000 or they can't get any coverage at a certain point, okay? We are the only company out there that I know of that offers all three plans that we never change the age, the benefit amount, 
or the commission to you, the agent. Okay, so what does that mean? To simplify, if you sell a level plan to a 55 year old at $20,000, you can sell a modified plan to an 80 year old for the same $20,000 and get paid the same commission on it, except a lot higher because the rates are gonna be higher. So you're gonna make actually a lot more money on it. And it makes it easy for you because as you're going through, as I said to you, one of the things that you're gonna have to run into is that as you talk to people, sometimes as they are elderly, and you know, I fall right in the middle of that spectrum. I lied, I really am older than 42 when I was talking how long I was in the business. Um, sometimes we get forgetful. I, I forgot I had that heart attack six months ago. So you just went through and you started your warm up and you went through your whole part of your presentation and said, yep, I got the best product for you, okay? And you're 78 years old, and this company, you know, who has that Wild Kingdom show on TV, look, this is the best product out there for you. And they get to that heart question. I said, oh, geez, Jack, I forgot to mention to you, I was in the hospital six months ago for a heart attack. All of a sudden, that plan you just told them is the best plan no longer is even available because sometimes they lower the age limit on how, you know, what they're willing to do or they lower the face amount. With prosperity, as I said, I like to keep things simple and easy. We never change that, okay? The other thing we never do to you as an agent is charge you back for an early death claim. Most companies out there, if somebody dies in year one or year two, they are going to take back what? The commissions they've paid you. Some of them, all of them, every company is a little bit different on how that works. So they're gonna take those commissions back, which I don't think is fair. Okay, so what do we do? We never take those commissions back. The only thing we will ever do to you is two things. One, if you, and they don't know what anyone's advance rate is in the room or on the screen, so don't ask me, but let's say you're on a six month advance and the person dies after three months. We are gonna take the three months advance back that we never received the premium on. Is that fair? We didn't receive any premium. You know, we're going to take that three months back. The other thing that will happen to you, and I know this is going to shock some people, so you might want to grab onto your table a little bit. I don't want anybody falling over. As I mentioned earlier, customers are going to lie to you. Okay. And people say to me all the time, and I have my chief executive officer, or my chief operation officer, I should say, said to me one day, she said, Jack, why would a customer lie? We're going to re take the policy away. So, Here's what happens. God forbid, you know, you're out there today, Brandon, and you get that terrible diagnosis. You get that big C diagnosis and your doctor says you got six months to live and you have no life insurance. You now immediately go out and you call 19 life insurance companies, okay? And you start applying for life insurance and you get to that cancer question and you say no. Okay. If Brandon's doctor was wrong and he lives longer than that two years, he's going to go past what they call the contestability period. And by passing that contestability period, all that life insurance he applied for is now going to pay out when and if he should, well, not if, everybody's going to die at some point. Hopefully not for you a long, long time, Brandon. So hopefully, you know, you got another 40 years of paying premiums. Sorry about that, but it's better than the alternative. So. He's going to keep on getting that policy. But if he were to die and, you know, and the doctor was right after six months, what do I have to do as an insurance company? I'm going to look at that claim because it came in so new. I'm going to find out he lied to the agent. He knew he was sick. He didn't tell him. And we're going to do what we call rescind the coverage. Every company has a two-year rescission in their policy that I'm aware of. There might be some that don't. I've never seen one that doesn't, um, but maybe there's one out there somewhere that doesn't rescind after two years. So if we rescind, we have to refund 100% of the premium to their beneficiaries. And we even have to give them a couple percentage points of interest on the time it took us to look at that claim and send it back. So what's the risk for Brandon to lie to me? None. He has no risk in that. So that's why people are gonna to lie to you in this industry. 
And it's going to happen to you. I hate to tell you that, but every single person who stays in this industry for more than a couple of years has one of these situations where it comes up and they're like, oh, I can't believe that person, you know, did that to me. But they do. So don't let it bother you. It's going to happen. But that is the one time because that policy never existed at that point. So that is the one time we are going to take back uh, the commissions that you earned. Make sense? Okay. So I mentioned there's some really exciting new things that we have coming on. Starting less than two weeks now, October 16th, we are changing our entire application. For those who have sold our, our product before, you can sell our product. You can do a paper app. You can do an e-app. You can do a phone app. You can do smoke signals during daylight hours only if the winds are under 15 miles an hour. You can chisel it on a rock. We don't care. We're taking an application any way you want to send it to us. We're adding a new process that we think is absolutely going to eliminate probably 99% of the ways you currently do an application today. We are going to start using an SMS one-time passcode. So what does that mean? It means whether you're face-to-face -face with the person sitting across the, the room from them and you want to use your tablet or your laptop, you can still do that. You can still take an e-app that way, or you can use our new process. And our new process is going to be very simply. At the start of the presentation, you are going to send this person a six-digit code. They can get that either via text message or they can get it via email, whichever one they prefer. Okay, they will read that six-digit code back. You will enter it onto your laptop. You'll enter it on the telephone if you're doing it you know, across the country. Whatever way you're doing the application, you'll enter it. That will sign all of the early forms, your HIPAA form, all the things that we need at the beginning of the presentation. There's always two signature processes with our application, one early, one at the end, okay? So that will sign all of that. At the end, they will get a second six-digit code, okay? They will have an opportunity at this point to open up the application. We don't know if anybody will, but they'll have that opportunity. Review it, make sure everything is answered correctly, read you that six digit code, you'll put it in, you'll click finish. You no longer ever have to worry about missing any customer signature or your signatures. It will also sign all of your signatures. Why is this important? One, it makes things much easier. We started testing this yesterday. The people selling face-to-face -face are telling me they're saving eight to 10 minutes on every application. People over the telephone, Anybody who's ever done our voice app, what you do is you go through and you fill out the application. And when you fill out the application, we then call Aptical, our third-party vendor. Our third-party vendor then rereads the entire application to the person. So the people over the telephone are telling me this is saving them 25 to 30 minutes on every sale. Okay. So A, it's a lot more efficient. B, again... This is gonna shock some of you. We get complaints, people saying, I didn't apply for that insurance. I didn't sign that application. And if you're using your tablet out in the field and somebody scribbles on the tablet, can you really tell who signed it? You can't. Yeah, I mean, there's no way to, if you're doing it over the telephone, at least we have a recording. So we, we have a lot better chance. Although some of those recordings are pretty tough to try to figure out who actually was the one who was signing it. This way we will have a record that we know that we sent at 10.03 a.m. on the 4th of October to Charlie Smith at phone number 123456789, this code. He's the only one who could have received it. He's read it back, the agents entered it, and then we've done it a second time. So we're no longer worried about an, a customer saying, I never signed that. Now, we have some built-in securities, which hopefully none of you will ever find out about, that will protect us and the company and the customer and the rest of the agents uh, in case somebody does try to get a little creative with that, like have a second cell phone or something like that. Don't worry, we'll know if you use the same number more than twice. So um, we do have some built-in securities on that. So we are super excited about that. It will go live on the... Yes, sir. Yeah, Matt. What if they don't have texting? They don't have texting or email that you can continue to use our existing procedures. 
But honestly, in today's day and age, you know, who doesn't have one or the other? First of all, 90% of the leads you guys run are what? Internet-based, right? Yeah. Facebook. Don't they need to have one of those in order to have a Facebook lead? So, you know, it really is. But yes, there is going to be the, that situation where somebody says, I don't have either. You know, but the other huge thing, what we sell today, most of what we sell over the phone is they're, they're using a remote e-app to try to explain to somebody who's not very technologically proficient, which would be me, I can't even spell IT, um, would be to explain to them how to use DocuSign. Now, younger people and people buy mortgages and houses and all, they're used to DocuSign, but there's a lot of people out there have no idea how they can be talking on their phone and then also at the same time be opening up an application and being able to sign it and send it back. So you lose control of the call at that point. So this will eliminate all of all of those issues. The other major change that um, you guys will get the sneak preview on, this will be coming out in about 10 days. So don't anybody write this down, keep the secret. You can. Um, we offer a agent bonus. For those of you who don't know, our agent bonus is 10% paid quarterly. And to qualify, you need to do $25,000 in issued premium per quarter. Do 25,000, you qualify, get 2,500. There is no limit on that. Do 50,000, get 5,000, whatever it is. And we pay that every single quarter. For 2024, Dave, we are increasing that bonus by 50% potentially, okay? So after the first quarter, you qualify, you get your 10%. The second quarter, consecutive quarter, you qualify again. That 10% bonus will go to 12%. Do it the third quarter, it will go to 14%. And do it in the fourth consecutive quarter, your bonus will now go to 15% and it will stay there. So that 2,500 that you're getting in Q4 this year, you qualify every quarter next year, is 3,750 for doing the exact same thing because we're not changing the qualifying on that product as well, okay? Couple things about where prosperity is a great fit, smokers, okay? I said every question on our, well, actually this one is still a yes or no question. First question on the application is, have you smoked cigarettes in the last 12 months, okay? What does that mean? It means I don't care if you dip, if you chew, if you cannabis, if you vape, if you cigar, if you pipe. The question is very clear. Have you smoked cigarettes in the last 12 months? It is not a nicotine rate. It is a smoked cigarettes rate. If you have not smoked cigarettes in the last 12 months, you are a non-smoker with prosperity. Okay? The only question that I was wrong, it's the second question. We do have a height and weight chart on there. You do have to fill out the person's height and weight. That's the only non-yes or no question on the application. So that's a big one. Diabetics. We are extremely diabetic friendly, okay? It's funny, I'll go to conventions and there'll be 20 reps in, in the room and I'll hear somebody across the room ask the uh, Americo guy, hey, I got this diabetic. You know, he had diabetes before the age of 50. Will you cover him? And I just see the hand going up and saying, go talk to Jack over at Prosperity. We don't care when they were diagnosed with their diabetes. We don't care how much insulin. We don't care how they take the insulin. We don't ask any of those questions. The only thing we're looking for are severe complications of diabetes, i.e., are they on insulin and are they taking other drugs for other issues related to their diabetes? Because nine out of 10 of those people are only on those other drugs because they're not managing their diabetes correctly, okay? So if you're managing your diabetes correctly and you don't have severe complications, you're going through level, okay? If you do have complications, we're still gonna insure you. We're just not gonna insure you at a level rate. We're gonna insure you at a greater rate, okay? I think, might be modified. I don't know. We write so many of them at that level, I don't remember if it's graded or modified off the top of my head, I apologize. but. Yeah, so we're really excited about what we got going on. Yeah, we we think that this app change, and by the way, we will be using this app change on our prime term to 100 and our family freedom term before the end of this year as well. So every product will have the ability to use the uh, the one-time passcode. 
So it will make your life really simple. We think it will absolutely end pretty much the rest of it. Yeah, a question from the YouTube. Um, Jack mentioned ages 55 to 80. Well, didn't it used to be 50 to 80? Then you also mentioned five to 35,000. Isn't it 1,530? Great, great question. Um, we did send out a couple agent bulletins. We did change two things. Uh, whoever that person is, is very right on. We used to start at $1,500 and go to 35,000. We've raised the minimum to 5,000 for a couple of reasons. One, there's a number of states that have raised their minimum requirements to 5,000. Uh, and again, I like to keep things simple. And two, are we really helping somebody if we're selling them a $1,500 or $2,000 policy? And you can't even get cremated for that. So we feel that 5,000 is more of a realistic number to start people at. So we did raise the face amount from 1,500 to 5,000. We also did raise the age from 50 to 55. And the reason we did that, and there's a lot of companies out there, like I said, I'm not perfect for everybody. There's a lot of companies out there who will write somebody at 18, at 35, at 40, at 50, whatever the case might be. For whatever reason, and we tracked this for over two years, our lapse rates on people between the ages of 50 and 55 was more than double our average, okay? So what we found was a lot of young people were buying the plan and then they either figured out, wait a minute, I'm, I'm buying this $20,000 plan and I'm paying this and for the next 30 or 40 years, that doesn't make sense. I can go buy a 30 year term plan. You know, you can buy my 30 year term plan to somebody who's, uh, you know, 50 years old and give them $130,000 worth of coverage as opposed to, you know, 20 or $30,000 worth of the, uh, the final expense. But our lapse rates were way higher. So that's why we did it to protect your accounts and to be smart as, as a business. It really just doesn't make sense when, when you're losing you know, double the amount of policies in that age group. So great question, whoever asked that. Anything else on there? Re-explain the bonuses. Re-explain the bonuses. 25,000 per quarter to qualify in paid premium. I don't care how much you submit. Uh, we don't pay on submitted business. We pay on actually paid. We do not use a persistency number. We do not use a placement rate. So all you need to do is qualify by doing 25,000 per quarter. The one qualifier we do have is we do wait for it to go through the first 30 day free look. So the bonus is quarterly. So we're, we just finished Q3, which was July, August, September. We will wait till the end of October and then we'll pay that bonus the first week of November. We'll make sure the people that you sold in September don't return the policy during the 30 day free look period. Once you get that 25,000, it starts at 10% like it ha always has, but then goes to 12, 14 and 15% by writing and qualifying in consecutive quarters. Yeah. We're doing some sell uh, paid premium. Selling $20,000. That it, it depends on the age, but I will tell you our average premium that we sell as a company, our, av our average life insurance policy is $18,000 and change, and our average premium is $1,100 a year. So to get to $25,000, you're looking at selling roughly 21, 22 policies a quarter, so basically one and a half a week. Look at that for a guy not that smart did all that math in my head that fast. <laughs> what else can I answer for you? Come on, Dave gives me 30 minutes and I've only used 28 of them. That's my exam yesterday. Congratulations. <laughs> to get contract. Days. We are the fastest contracting company out there. Uh, there. We do what we call just-in-time appointments. So what we do is we process your contract. We wait to appoint you until you sell your first deal. And by the way, we pay all of those fees for you. There's five states that you have to be appointed in first, Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and I forget the other two off the top of my head. Um, but it takes us rough. Our goal is 48 hours, but many times we turn them around in the same day. Yeah, Matt. Um, so you said five thirty-five. So greater than five hundred thirty-five. Yep. We don't we don't change the 
the dollar amount, we don't change the age, and we don't change the commission. Okay. What does point mean? I'm greener than he. So after you get contracted, so Dave and his group will send you a prosperity contract link. You'll fill out that contract link. That gets you actually the ability to sell our products, but then the states require you to be appointed with every insurance company. Uh, again, we pay those fees. We appoint you. Um, some companies do, some companies don't, but we pay all those. And I will tell you, if you're selling over the telephone, check every box on the states because you want to get them all done up front. If you're selling face-to-face, -face, we prefer you just pick the ones that you're actually going to be selling in because, like I said, we do pay all the fees. <laughs> Questions? Final call? It's going once, going twice? No, I went over by eight seconds. Hey. <laughs> all right. Just no, I, really, Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you. That's exactly. it. Hey, look. I just want to show you. Come here. As well as 142 viewers. Yeah. Yeah. Five minute break, guys. So if you need to go use the bathroom uh, up at the front or the restrooms, we're going to start at uh, a little after uh, 1020. And then we'll keep going with the sales presentation.
Okay. Yeah. You got it. Thank you. Yep. You too. See you. See you, Jack. All right. <laughs> Have a good one. All right, guys. Let's keep going. Let's make sure we're live on YouTube. I think we should be. Let me uh, flip this thing up here, Dave. Turn that around. Dude. Yeah. So we can see where we're at. Yeah. Here we go. This on here, I shifted. Right. Yeah. Well, don't worry, Terry, but you got it. <laughs> okay. Washington. That is uh, west of here. I'm right in the middle of Memphis and Nashville. Yes, sir. That's the next county over from me going west. I'm 60 miles of the national. Okay. Okay. All right. Two mule. So we're, we're going to pick up back with reviewing the sales call. So just to bring you back up to speed, we're about approximately a minute and a half in. We've done the introduction. We've done a tad bit of rapport. Remember, this is the client that's sitting in dialysis, literally buying life insurance. You know, well, it's probably a good idea. And uh, we're getting in now to the why. Why did the client request this information? What are they looking to get out of this, right? So uh, let's hit the play button. Let me make sure my uh, audio is shared for the people at home. All right, we are ready. So let's pick back up and see what happens. I'm going to cycle back just a little bit. And uh, let's and burial costs. <clears throat> and they just want to have a plan in place to give them a peace of mind okay yeah so my question to you is what were your thoughts and concerns that um had you request this information today are you doing okay on your dialysis oh yeah there's nothing wrong with you, man. all right what was wrong with that question so you're on the right track here there, there's something we do, I think, to make the client feel better and to make us feel better when we're asking questions. It's like asking a question and following up immediately with something different. If I ask, you know, Terry, what were your thoughts, concerns that prompted you to send this in? Um, which football team do you like the best? You're probably going to answer the most recent question that was asked, not the actual question that would have helped us get the sale. So make sure when you're asking just generally the case, with any questioning is ask the question, just that one. Don't add another question to it, okay? So just say, what were your thoughts, concerns that prompted you to request this information? Then? Shut up, let them answer, okay? Because now he's saying, oh, you know why I'm my dialysis, I guess it's okay, I'm on dialysis, how good could it be, right? So now we've gotten away from the why, we're talking about something entirely different. Does that make sense, y'all? So stay on task, ask the why question. So get around. I drive the other day. I do whatever I need to do. I just had to shut down three days a week. And do your dialysis. I... Yeah. Then I'm up and running again. <laughs> I've got a girlfriend that's been doing it for years. I'm like, you go, girl. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, what do you have in place right now to cover the burden of your final expenses? Nothing. So what's what's the why? What was his why? Don't have it. Is that a problem? Yeah. Might be. Usually, almost always is. Normally, it's yeah. going to be. Yeah. 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 That doesn't mean you can't sell it without the why. It just lowers your chances dramatically. Does that make sense? It's better just to ask the why and get the why than to presume. Okay. Now, do you have family? Do you got kids? Or Now, she had asked us if you didn't mention that. So, what are you doing right now for existing coverage? She said nothing at all. She said nothing. Okay. So um, now she's asking questions about, do you have kids? Kind of see where she goes with this. Well, uh, got an old gas man hanging around for like 20 years. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> God forbid something happened to you today. You know, how would um, the family take care of the, this financial burden? They wouldn't. So there, now we're getting back to a, a good question. So. <laughs> They wouldn't. Yeah. That's what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't. They wouldn't. Leave me in the ditch, you know, that kind of stuff. 
<laughs> so this is good. We're getting to it, right? So we're kind of missed the why, circling back around. God forbid you die tomorrow. What's going to happen to you? They wouldn't take care of it, right? So we're, we're, we want to poke and prod our clients, right? Because we want to make sure, one second, we want to make sure that they feel the pain. I, I mean, remember what we talked about, Jack talked about it, you talked about it. I don't want my clients to die and miss out on opportunity to cover them, but because I didn't push enough in a, in a constructive way to get them to understand why today is the day to die, I don't want that for them. So we want to push a little bit. We want to poke and Terry? That wasn't just applicable to him because he's going to die. Honestly, she asked that in every... It's a every single sales call question, no matter if they're perfectly in shape or dying. Everywhere in between. Does that make sense? Okay. You want to add anything to that, Dave? No, I, this is just to understand we're, we're trying to back the hearse up. Yeah, okay? back the hearse up. That's what we're setting up for. We want to back it up to the front door. Cause, and, and that's why this is so important. Yeah, in other words, that, I like using that yeah, one. I, I forgot about that. Yeah, back the hearse up against the front we porch. We haven't used that. Now. We haven't had. We, we need yeah. the mower. The, the client has to see, like looking out there. There's the hearse. There's the Grim Reaper. Like they have to see death coming because it's human to just like pretend that happens to other people, yeah. and even to the very end, to just deny it. So that's why you're there, Matt. Why yeah. It depends. There's a sense. There's a sensitivity you'll develop. I think when you've got enough. And then you can proceed. You've got the why. You, you can drill him a little bit. I, I think he, he needs to be drilled a little bit more here because he didn't get it. But maybe I wouldn't have gone. I may not go any deeper if I already had the why. Yeah. Right. So it just depends. You'll develop that sensitivity as you talk to more people and kind of know when enough is enough. And you've gotten them. Right. Makes sense. And kind of going back to what we ran into yesterday. If they give you, is it is it blank? Yeah, you're good. If they it. give you. A good why, like they want peace of mind for their children, then we don't have to press as hard at that point, right? But if we're not getting a good why, we've got to ask more questions. Think of yourself as a doctor. You poke and you pride. That's all they do, right? That's what we're doing by asking questions. Let's continue. Okay. So that's why you want to have to, you want something in place there to help out. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I prefer, remember, she said, so if you die, what happens? Who takes care of it? Nobody is what he said. That's, that's a good response because it's an, there's an urgency there. But I want to ask, like, so what do you mean? Paint that picture of what if you die and you don't have coverage? How would your wife, you, you mentioned, handle this? I want him to tell me it's going to be bad. I don't want to tell him it's going to be bad. Yeah. I want him to admit this. This, this, this. There's a subtle difference between you lecturing to somebody, oh, it's very bad. You should get life insurance versus them saying, yeah, this will be pretty bad. You're right. And the flip answer that he gave, it just all wide open. Yeah. yeah. We need to ask more questions about his statement, yeah. basically, at this point. We've got to let him tell us how bad it's going to be for the family. That's the key. Not us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's their decision to buy, right? We can't force them to buy. We can encourage them. Mm. We can ask the right questions to lead them to the process of making that decision. That's really what we want to do. A, a good reference to this is, you know, we kind of played the part of detective yep. as well as like psychologist, right? And good detectives and psychologists share the same ability to ask good questions and good follow-up questions to get in depth, right? Uh, Columbo is a great uh, TV show to watch to see how good questioning looks. So, um, but you got to ask those questions and don't just take the surface level because it's just the surface. It's not the depth of the emotion that we need. All right. Now, um, who would you want as your beneficiary on this new policy? Your significant okay. other? All right. Who do you want as the new beneficiary on your new policy? Give me some reasons why this is a good idea to ask. Your new policy, right? Yeah. That's pretty – so we're selling past the sale. We're, we're assuming they're going to buy but within several minutes of starting. And they're answering it as such. They're not saying, well, if I buy, I'll – 
He's saying, yeah, I want my wife to be the beneficiary, right? Like uh, yesterday, my, my response was, who do you want this, your beneficiary to be on this new policy we're getting today? And if I get past that question without any friction, we keep, keep rolling. You know, that it's a trial close, in my opinion, right. just a little bit. We're wanting to throw it out there that we're doing it today. We're creating urgency. And if we don't get any rejection, we know that they're thinking now we're doing it today, right? We'll get an objection later on when we go talking about banking if they're not going to do it today. Right. But we want to set it up as everything we're doing, we're doing today. Now, here's a very important tactic to use, selling over the phone or a person. I never did as an agent when I was in the field selling final expense. They're, they answer, who do you want your beneficiary to be? Your wife. What's the best follow-up to that? What's their name? Yep. So let's say the wife's name is Jane. What I'm going to do, and this is where the power in this is, what I'm going to do in the rest of the presentation is say, mm -hmm. it's not your beneficiaries get this money. Jane's getting this money. Jane. I'm making a much more visceral, real connection with what this policy is and how it's going to benefit because I'm using the person they want to help. So make sure you're using the beneficiary's name. Just don't say, hey, your beneficiary could be this. And this is also why we ask this this early. That's why we moved it up in the script. Remember? It used we to sure be did. Old. Yeah. We never really did this until the end of yeah. about a couple of years ago. Yeah. Then somebody's like, oh, yeah, it makes sense to ask it earlier. <laughs> so you personalize the sale that much more. Because this is all about not the person insured. It's about the people they love. This is an act of love. Life insurance yes. is an act of love. And so who's that act going towards? Use their name. Makes Once you different. get their name, David, what would your next question be? I don't know. Why? Ah, why, of course, why? We want them to tell us why. <laughs> Are y'all seeing a trend yet? <laughs> right. And that's true. You know, why, why would you leave it to your one son versus your other son? You know, maybe there's one son that's terrible at managing money and the other one's more responsible. And these are like little things we can use later on in the sale to close the deal, you know? Yeah. If you buy this today or when you buy this today, your son's taken care of. You don't have to worry about your other son getting into this. It's all taken care of. Like these are all little things that add up and pile up to, yes, I need to buy and having that urge yes. to be doing so. All right. Let's keep going. Let's do that. What's her date of birth? Huh? Do you know her date of birth? Yeah, it's uh All right. Now, I'm just happy that, you know, um well, I'm actually glad to hear that this is a concern for you. You know, there's a it's actually really crazy to think how many people out there that don't care about their family and are willing to make this their family's problem, you know. So I that's a part of the script we inserted because it it it's like an us versus them. Like you want to be with the good guys, not the bad guys. Isn't it crazy there are people out there who are your age that it's there's so many of them I talked to that they, they, they don't get coverage. They don't believe in it. Why would they want to do this to their family? Isn't that crazy? It's getting them to agree to like, yeah, I care about my family. Why would I not want not be like Why would you? I not do that? Yeah. Yeah. So we like saying that near the end of this pre-qualification stage because it helps them register in their mind they want to be one of the good people that takes care of their family. Does that make sense, y'all? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Kind of crazy. All right, bud. Well, two more questions. First, since the company doesn't send me out to collect money like they did in the good old days. No. So, so now we're getting into banking and the budget question. You want to explain that, David, how it works? Yeah. Basically, with the banking, we want to find out early on. This is another thing we moved up. It used to be lower in the script. But we want to make sure that we're getting – we know they've got a bank, right? Because we're not going to do business if they don't. If they don't have a checking account, savings account, or a, a direct express card, a lot of folks have the direct express card. So we've got to make sure they've got that. Um, and once we get how they bank, our next question is going to be about budget because we're selling to the need, right? The need of a burial or a cremation or a gift, a legacy. 
but we also have to make sure it's affordable because we're going to get into the script later on where we're basically going to tell them, hey, if it's not affordable, you drop it in six months, it's really no good, right? So we want to make it, if we get these key information right here, first of all, if there's no banking, we're going to have to leave. We can't do business. Right. Or we have to, a technique I've done is the old drive them to the bank technique. If they want it bad enough, I will drive them to the bank. We will set up an account and we will draft only the life insurance out of that account is how I position that um, if they're worried about banks. But this is crucial because if we don't get these two pieces of information, we're going to waste a lot of time in the house and then we're still going to be leaving without helping them, right? Anything you'd like to add to that, Dave? Yeah, you, you mentioned something on uh, the critical factors of, of pre-qualifying. So we'll go over those real quickly. So the mentality of this script that I've designed and David and others have helped is that we don't want you to waste your precious time with a prospect. Mm -hmm. Y'all ha only have so many hours a day and you need to spend them finding the people that are highly likely to buy, qualified prospects. And what you uh, uh, simultaneously want to do is not spend as as little spend as little time as possible with unqualified what we call suspects. They suspected to buy, but they probably won't. Now, how do we determine if somebody's qualified or not? Well, there's four main factors. The one is need. Do they need this? The the yang to the yin of that is desire or urgency. Do they want it? There's a lot of people who need this, but they don't have any care in the world, right? So they got to have need and want. We've taken care of that, by the way, in what we've heard so far in our mm -hmm. presentation, right? They Maybe we could do better, arguably, but this is what we want to start off with. The next is bank. Do they have an account and will they allow us to draft it? And then do they have a budget? Can they afford it? Okay, you're going to hear the, the last two there. We used to have health as a pre-qualifier, mm -hmm. but the truth is if you got a pulse, it's likely there's some coverage out there, guaranteed issue, standard preferred with many of the carriers. So health comes after these main things. So if we have, when I'll, I'll get your question in a second, honey. If we have three of those four, let's say they, they need it, they want it. They got a bank account, but they're broke. Yeah. Ain't got no money. Is that a qualified prospect? No, you're not gonna sell them anything. And what I would suggest to you to do is, this is three minutes in. If, if, Jim, if we get five minutes in with Jimmy, and he doesn't have two pennies to rub together. He won't commit to 10 bucks a month. Hang the phone up, find a real prospect. That's when you leave. This business is stressful. It's an emotional roller coaster. It's sales, right? You know, get, get ready. Uh, I don't want you spending your valuable time trying to convince somebody who's unconvincible because they're not qualified. Does that make sense, everybody? You get, this, is the, this is the most important thing to manage in this business is your, is your brain headspace and part of that is spending time with people who want what you got and as little time as uh, of, with the time little time as possible those who don't have the ability to buy tony um there's like demographic information like your birthday your at yeah, we don't want that because the more this, so that we'll talk about this with leads later, but I'll hit on this a little bit. So for the people at home, what Tony is asking is like, what kind of information do we collect at the time of, of the lead generation, right? I'm of the persuasion that I want to collect just enough to get a base level of interest. But if I, if you ask too many questions in the lead, you get arguably, although I don't think this happens a lot of the time. You get a more qualified lead, but your volume of leads drops because people aren't just going to sit there. They're on Facebook scrolling, looking at cats and their family. They don't want to sit there and fill out a form that takes five minutes, right? No. Yeah, yeah. We want to know, are you interested in life? I can work with that. And Facebook's algorithm is going to put it in front of people likely to click on it, which typically are seniors. Okay? And then it's your job to qualify them and figure out if they're a buyer, right? So we'll talk more about that, but that's, yeah, that's very important. Any other questions? Yeah. If it's someone who we know that they won't qualify and we don't want to waste money, we can put them in the 
recognize the problem. So, what would be that's the way to basically end it? Thank you for your. Yeah, so, so again, for the people at home, you got somebody who is disqualified. How do you end it? I mean, I, I, would, I would have people I would do ride-alongs with, and I've determined they're unqualified. And we're, we're talking nice. I'm saying, well, it looks like you're, you know, you look like you're all set. You don't have the budget. I'm literally getting up from my seat, walking out the door. I mean, just leaving. Like, I just, yeah, yeah I'm like, hey, usually, usually they know. So you, it sounds like you're not interested at all in life insurance. No, okay, we'll go. I'm gonna leave you alone. I'm real busy. You have a nice day. Just end it. Yes. And, and so, so it's not like it's a surprise. And the thing is, what, what, what's weird about that is you would think, well, what if they actually would buy if we keep going? Well, they would stop you before you left the house. Like, wait a minute, I am interested. That never happens if you do this correctly, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's bad. No, it, it very rarely happens. So you'll do like, for example, bank account, you'll walk through the bank account. I don't believe in bank drafts. I'm not letting you bank draft, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, this is the only way we can do it. I don't care. I don't believe in it, blah, 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 blah. Well, then I can't help you. You said you need this. You said your daughter needed this. Will you not make a compromise? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, then I can't help you. I'm just going to leave you be. Have a nice day. If it's their budget, Boy, I don't even have ten dollars to put together. Well, you're eighty-five, and it ain't gonna cost ten bucks a month. You sure? You know? You yeah. sure you can't do fifty? To, no. Okay. Well, hey, look. You know, go to the funeral home plan. You have a nice day. It kind of self-solves itself. So it's not an awkward thing um, at all. Good. Normally, they know it already in their head. Okay, so just I'm kind of like David. I'll just. I just say, well, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to help you today. It doesn't look like, you know, you're interested in doing this, correct? And I'm packing my stuff up while I'm doing it. And that gives them the option to stop me. How many times have they stopped me? Not. Yeah. Hardly at all. <laughs> None. So you get on out. But we're always polite, you know? Right. Yeah, yeah I was going to. Not asking where I'm listening, maybe 75. Yeah. Maybe just run that block. Nine toes in the grave. Yeah. Yeah. So. So we teach new agent. Now there's a new agent and an experienced agent. Right? New agents should just follow the script. We're going to go over the budgeting process we use here in a minute. It'll make more sense. We sell the premium. I'll teach that technique in a second. And it'll make sense corresponding with your question. But look, if they can't afford the bare minimum of getting anything because they're so healthy and so old, then, then they, they don't qualify. We don't need to go to 10 bucks, right? Like you just say, I, I, don't, I, don't, push, I don't push them into a price. I want to know what they can reasonably afford because in this business, it's about what's, what stays is what pays you, right? So if they even give any kind of minor pushback, I'm like, look, let's go a little bit lower. But there may be cases where you can't. And that's just, it is what it is. And that'll make a little bit more sense in a second. Any other questions? Good questions. Yeah, hey, Luke. So let's say they like, still have any minor up. Yeah, to apply or anything but the, you feel like you're the only push back that you give them like you know what's here to just sell you a policy yeah. good question sure so what you're describing luke is a bit different that's that would be a smoke screen objection so that so for people at home luke asked well what if they push back on price but I haven't gotten to the why. Well, we don't talk about price early. There's a, this, what I'm teaching and what Wendy's doing and what we're trying to teach is there is a sequence and a logical order we follow. And the most important thing is, do they need and want this and desire it? That's why we spend in the beginning the time on what were your thoughts and concerns? What happens if you die and you don't have coverage? Because I wanna see if there's something there. Because if there's something there, they'll figure out a way to pay for it. Yes, right? they will. 
So, but if they ask something along the lines of like, I just want to know how much this costs. The overcome to that is saying, hey, great question. I'm going to get back to that. I promise. I need to ask you a few more questions first, then pick back up where you left off. You don't want to give them prices too early because then they don't have a desire. You've, you've let the cat out of the bag. Oh, it's 50. Well, that's too expensive. Well, they don't know it's too expensive, but now they'll just think of the $50 as you try to build value that becomes a little more difficult. So it's, it's a sequence and a timing thing. We save premium asking for a little bit later. And if it comes up earlier than we want, then we overcome it and tell them we promise we'll get back to them, which we will. But we have to ask them these questions, these why questions first. That's pivotal. Let's let's play this. Yeah, yeah, good question. Let's play this so that we can kind of learn the script of do they have an account, what kind it is, and the likelihood that they'll let us draft them. And then we'll talk how do we get the budget. Pablo Amino. Yeah. Kind of crazy. All right, bud. Well, two more questions. First, since the company doesn't send me out to collect money like they did in the good old days, okay, they do require everybody paying monthly to set up either a draft from their checking, savings, or direct express card. Now, which yeah. do you use? Direct express. So he's, so did you hear that? So two more questions. The first question is how we do payment. I don't come out like the good old days. Now, uh, you know, your mom might have had an insurance agent that literally came by the house. It's called a debit agent. It's a real thing before mm -hmm. bank drafts were a thing. That's the insurance man would come by weekly or monthly. So clients usually understand this. We use that in an excuse as to why we set up a bank draft. Okay. And so we come by the we don't come by like the old days, collect the premium. The bank, the, the companies require us. So I put the blame on the company. I'm not coming in to get your money. The bank, the, the company requires all everybody to set up an automatic recurring payment on the day that you get your check every month. Do you bank locally or do you use one of those cards like Direct Express? Okay. So the close is the question is: do you bank locally? Because that tells us is it Wells Fargo? Is it like a normal bank? Or do you use one of those cards like Direct Express? Because carriers sometimes accept Direct Express, which is a bankless, or it's a checklist checking account. Yeah. And you got to use the card, but some carriers don't take that if you're new. So you may be thinking, I'm going to put them with this carrier, but they don't take that card, right? So you may spend all this time showing them numbers, and then lo and behold, you can't even get them. Then you got to backpedal, and then you lose the deal. So we need to know what kind of account it is. And that's how we get it. So does that make kind of make sense to you, Brandon, there? Yeah. And you'll see in the field, you'll see most people have probably 80% of your clients, and it's regionally, it's different, have a bank account. Some have a card, like Direct Express is the most common. You'll see Chime cards, yeah. Net Spend, right? And you need to know which carriers, like Prosperity takes Direct Express. Real. Uh, they advance commission on that too, which is unusual yes it is and um a few other carriers take the debit cards the other kind if by the way when you're in the field or on the phone and you're selling get the bank account information not the debit card associated with the bank account always and most carriers will not give you your full commission advance if you just take the bank account debit card yeah. routing number and they all have it they've got voided checks so yeah. what you what you would do is you'd say okay with that card what routing number is that attached to? you know you're fishing again got to ask more questions so let me ask you guys let me get you thinking here you're sitting down with the client in person or over the phone they say they bank again we're kind of going way ahead but this is important i have my bank account but i don't know what the account number is <laughs> i don't know what the routing number is what do you do? Call the bank. Have them call. It's all the bank. What else? Get their checks, right? The checks, the, the, their checks should have. I don't have a check. I don't have, I don't use checks. You'll hear that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Online statements. You can Google routing numbers. You, you can, can always get routing. Just put in the bank's name and then the routing number of the state it's in. The state. You have to have the state because they change state to state. Ken, you're going to say? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can call some banks, but not all banks will give it over the phone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to have those kind of ideas and strategies because you could have the deal closed, but they're at dialysis and they have their checkbook with them. Right. So you need to make sure you go, how can you get it? Pull it up on your phone. You can get your account number that way in the cases. Okay. Okay. We got the direct express um, card. I, here's the deal. Uh huh. My money doesn't hit till Wednesday morning. Do I need to no. hold off right now and call back? Yeah. Another thing I'll point out to you guys um, the business of final expenses, buy now, pay later. You know, like the car lots, buy now, pay later. You can get your car today and then pay later. Our clients are set up to operate that way. They get one check a month, first, third, or second, third, or fourth Wednesday. That's it. So if I'm calling Jimmy and he gets paid on the second Wednesday, which I guess would be next week on the 11th, Mm -hmm. I can't probably take his money today because he ain't got none. He spent it all. Okay? That's the life of somebody on a fixed income. My advice is to get them approved and just set up the draft on the same date that the client gets their check, okay? Don't push and battle to get the money up front. Uh, it's just not gonna happen with our clientele. Yeah, you'll lose, yeah, you'll lose it. You'll get, you'll, you would have made it if you just put the premium paying yeah. up. Exactly. Yeah. We have a great, you remember Melissa? Yes. We have a great sales call that you guys can listen oh, to. Oh, good. She literally got 50 objections on the phone. Jeez. She kept going, kept going. It was just, it was just awesome. And the whole reason at the end that, that the client was pushing back is because Melissa was trying to get the premium today. Yeah. So as soon as she said, well, we can just set this up on your next check. She's like, okay, no more objections. So it's very common. Yeah. And the other thing with billing, this is important too. We prefer that you use carriers that do what's called social security deposit billing. Anybody know, anybody not heard of what that is? Okay. So social security. Okay. So social security comes on the first of the month, the third of the month, or the second, third, or fourth Wednesday, except if it's what? The weekend. A weekend. Or a holiday. Uncle Sam pays out early. Early. Yeah. So for example, uh, let's say, well, this last month, the first was on Sunday. Sunday. Okay. So Uncle Uncle Sam pays out two days later on Friday. But wait, if you don't use Social Security deposit billing, if you look at the language, it, it's draft on or after that date, unless it's a holiday or a weekend. So the clients had the whole weekend to blow their money on smokes and booze, as I like to say. And then you show up Monday to take the money. There's none there. Okay. So if you use carriers like Prosperity, uh, Trinity Life, which should be here soon, they're going to talk about the same thing. They do social security deposit billing. We take the money on the deposit date that the check hits the account. So that means we beat them to the ATM. A lot of people know exactly when that social security hits at two in the morning and they'll go pull it out at five in the morning. We beat them. So we take that money. And it sounds silly, but it will lift your overall what we call persistency rate which is the amount of your business that actually sticks because you, you, know, you don't get paid on what lapses, right? So you want to use carriers that use social security deposit billing. Most of our carriers are. It's, uh, it makes a huge difference in the quality of your business, okay? And it, you'll have clients who'll push back and say, well, I, don't want, I want to set this up on the fourth or the fifth. I get paid on the third. What you tell them is, hey, we're required to set this up on the deposit date, but it never comes earlier. It always comes later in the day after your money hits. Yeah, so we will never ever take it earlier, period. It's impossible, okay? That, that tip right there is what worth the not a lot. Set it, <laughs> if they get paid on the third, never set it up for the fourth. Yeah. Just don't do it. Yeah. It won't go through a lot of times. Okay. Questions on billing or anything? Okay. So now we're gonna get to selling the premium. And this is how we get to budget. I'm a big proponent that our clients should buy only what is affordable to them because our clients are low income. They're not good with money. Sorry. So if you push them into or persuade them into too much, six months pass by, a lot of things can happen. And that life insurance plan, because they're world-class procrastinators, may be first on the chopping block if you push too hard. So we'll see, we'll talk you through how this goes 
as we listen to when you do it. Absolutely not. Um, the life insurance companies understand like 100% of the people I work with are all on fixed incomes. So we can set it out 30 days. Um, they'll just uh, they'll have us set it up on the day that your social security check comes in. So the insurance. So this was he said, do I have to pay this today? I'm not getting paid till next Wednesday. And that was her answer, which again, okay, good relief. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Insurance companies correlate it with the social security office. So even if it's on a holiday or a weekend or what have you, it won't ever come out early. Okay. Okay. So did you say yours comes out on a Wednesday? Yeah, the fourth Wednesday of every month. Okay, the fourth Wednesday? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, you know what? I understand we all want life insurance, but I really want to make sure, too, um, that we can afford it. Okay. Because what's the point of having a policy if it's too expensive? Now, if it's too expensive, you're going to have to cancel it in six months, right? So that'd be just throwing your money away. So in this part of the script, we're trying to create a connection with the client. Hey, we understand you're on a fixed income. Hey, we understand you only got so much. You don't want to throw it away. And the last thing you want to do is spend too much because, like I said earlier, six months, something happens, and you got to let it go. What a waste of money. People really appreciate that. Remember, your clients are fixed income, one check, probably no savings. So when you're saying this, you're conveying a sense of trust. They will really appreciate. And it sets us up to incidentally ask for the big bucks. So it, it helps us go big, but it gets them also to tell us no if it's too expensive and not feel embarrassed because the primary thing is affordability. So we'll explain that as we go. Now, truly, you know, the best policy to have is going to be the one that when you die, you know, and that's going to be the one that's there when you pass, it's going to be the one that you've been able to comfortably afford. Okay. So that, that's a statement we actually use. So isn't the best policy to have the one that you can comfortably afford? Right? Again, getting them to understand, yeah, that's right. I don't want to spend too much. Again, it may fly in the face of regular sales. Like, why am I talking this person down yeah. from spending money? But our clientele is not good with money. And I mean that with all due respect. If they if they were good with money, we've never been there. They would have bought life insurance. We wouldn't ago. be talking to them now. So we want to make sure they understand this, that they soberly choose which plan is best for them. So they keep the thing because that's how we get paid. Okay. So while mm -hmm. I've seen programs priced as high as 800 or more, if I can qualify you for a program today, can you afford somewhere between 80 and $100 a month, or is that oh. way too much? Okay. So while I've seen pro policies as high as 800 a month, if I can qualify for a program today, can you afford between 80 and $100 a month? Now, what happens here? So the $800 price, why would we say that? because we're, we're anchoring price. So when we show something that's really scary, like it, it could be 400, it can be 800. I like using 400, it's a little more realistic. I, well, I've seen prices as high as $400 a month. If I could qualify for a print plan one of us for 80 to $100 a month, would that fit your budget? That makes 80 to $100 sound a lot better had we, uh, by mentioning the price anchor of 800 in this case. Does this make sense? This is really, really important. Now, I prefer, Tim, Tim is our telesales trainer, so I, I give my, my managers latitude in kind of altering the script to what they see working better, but I prefer to say, you know, say the anchor, but then say, if I can qualify for plan at somewhere between 150 and 200 a month, would that fit your budget? I like to start high, and anybody in sales will tell you it's easier to start low, or it's easier to start high than work low than it is to start low than high. In other words, I could say, hey, David, if I can qualify for a program, can you afford 20 bucks a month? Sure, man. I get the easy yes, but then when I run his numbers and David smokes and he's 85 <laughs> and it's 200 a month, he's going to be like, well, you're a scammer. Oh, I don't like you. I've lost some integrity. Okay. So I prefer you, and it's easier if they say no, if they, if they say no at 200, just say, hey, no problem. What if I can qualify for another program? And let's say instead of 150, 200, let's say it's 100 to 150. Would that fit your budget? And then we walk it down. I'll go as low as 10 to 20 bucks a month. Yep. I'm all about activity. I want the applications written, even if they're small. 
Well, and I didn't used to do this. And I'll be honest, the first day I went out in the field and actually told myself that I'm going to try this and got a $225 a month free. Yeah. So that showed me right then, and it's still on the books. That's the best thing. Uh, but it showed me if you don't ask, you will not receive. You can start high and then go low. Never start low and try to go up. It's not going to work. And don't just ask them, what can you afford? Yeah, don't ask that. Don't do that. As little as possible. $5. $5. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> can I get 50000 <laughs> Right. So with this is called selling the premium. I, I've used this for years and years. It works wonderfully well. Notice that, that anything I say sound pushy. Did I sound salesy? Because as soon as they say anything other than a yes, I'll clarify that in a minute. I say, no problem. Let's look a little lower. What if we can afford the next range down? So anything other than a yes. So if, if I ask David, if I can qualify for program and for somewhere between 150 to 200 months, would that fit your budget? And you say, oh, goodness. No, Dave, I, I don't have enough money. And let's say he says, maybe. Okay. Maybe. After I pay off the washer and dryer. Yeah. Right. Once I get my car out of the shop. Yeah. That is a no. Okay. <laughs> There's only one acceptable answer when you're asking for the premium and that's yes, I can afford it. Or yes. Like that you can hear the confidence in their voice. Right. But if they're like, yeah, I think I could. That, I'm not confident that that actually is going to fit. Cause he may be thinking, well, after a month or two, like he hasn't revealed something. Right. So anytime you hear anything other than a yes, the answer is, Hey, it sounds like that might be a little too expensive because nobody's going to argue with you if you're going to get it a better price, yeah. right? So just show them another. Well, could you 100% afford this if it's between 100 to 125 a month? And when they're nodding and like, yeah, I can do that. Boom, you got it. Yeah. You got the premium. Okay. Well, one other thing I'll add on this because this is this is like such a critical tactic to use that we spend we don't spend a ton of time talking about this, but this can make a huge difference in your profitability. There are people out there that will buy a policy from you and then because you arbitrarily, meaning randomly pick like the five, 10, 15, they just pick the middle one. They really needed and wanted 15 and 20. But because you didn't show it to them, the next guy that comes in sells them that five or that 10, that second policy. And you also run the risk of getting replaced because the agent may be sly and say, hey, let's just roll this all into one. I'll be your agent. Instead of just doing a five, let's do a 15 and cancel the other one, right? So I believe when you sell the premium, you're maxing out your capability to sell the most possible within the realm of the budget of the client without pushing them into something that is you know, too persuasive or aggressive. And the other thing too is there, there occasionally are the grand slams out there that will buy a ton of insurance. Um, case in point, I had a guy that I wrote a 220 Foresters deal on in 2012. I called him up a year later and he had bought two more $200 a month plans. And because I didn't even ask for the big ones, I missed them. I missed out on, you know, at least $5,000 plus in commission just because I didn't ask, you know. And had he said no, I would have been okay, you know. But and that most of your clients will. But if you don't ask and go, don't go big. You're going to miss out on these clients that are just huge and really pad your pockets well. And somebody else will sell the, the next couple of policies. Ken? I think you should do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Versus get you $40,000. Premium versus. Anybody here been in car sales? So in car sales, like you don't sell MSRP, you don't sell sticker, you sell the monthly, monthly payment, payment, right? Because that's how people budget. It's like, can I afford this on a monthly basis? Sticker doesn't matter. Same thing with life insurance. Like, can I afford X amount? And, and we ask that, not the face amount, because meaning the amount of coverage, because that's ultimately what makes a difference. Not the amount of coverage, but the price for the coverage. And I want that budget to fit. Uh, I want that price to fit their budget. No matter what the face amount is, I can justify why. Why can I get a thirty thousand? This is only twenty thousand. I can sell them into that, which is what you want to do because it's likely as a broker, 
you know, if you're selling them a 20,000 and, and they want 30, but they don't have the budget, they're not going to find it anywhere else because yeah. you're giving them a pretty good rate. Does that make sense, everybody? So that's where I make my sales pitch about, but I don't sell them in, well, why don't you put it up to 200 instead of 125? Stupid. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of lapses that way because some people just, they just won't. They'll say yes because they just want to get rid of you or really good at talking people into stuff, but they got to keep that thing. This isn't a vacuum sale. You know, like you got to keep this thing and that's what pays you. Make sense? So let's, I'm, I'm going to listen to this. There's a few problems with this, the budget here that um, Wendy's asking. And I want to go over it and kind of get you guys' thoughts on this. So let me get up there. Okay. So while I've seen programs priced as high as 800 or more, if I can qualify you for a program today, can you afford somewhere between 80 and $100 a month? Or is that oh. way too much? Right. What happened there? What was wrong with that? Luke? Yeah. Yeah. Why would you ask that? Yeah. 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 Good yeah. point. And I don't know if Tim has programmed this into his script, but I don't like it because it is. Okay. He probably has a reason why, and that's fine. I know for face-to-face -face agents. For Yeah. For face-to-face, -face, let's not do it. It's not yeah. going to work. I just, I, 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 I'm like, well, it's, They'll tell me, this, can you afford somewhere between 150 to 200? Yeah, that's kind of what you're doing, which, you know, it's not the end of the world if they if you invite them to walk the price down, because I want I don't care what the price is going to be. And I don't think you should either. You should just care about selling them something if the need yeah. is there. Right. So I'm, I'm kind of like split with this tactic, but I prefer not to ask it uh, because it begs the question It kind of baits, not baits them, but sets them up to say no. Does that make sense? Yeah. And of course, I like to ask higher. Great. So let's keep going here. Well, that's exactly about what I was figuring anyway. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Do y'all understand working? what he said? I'll translate. <laughs> he said, that's about exactly what I expected. Yeah. What's the first thing you think of when you give a price and they say yes right away? Then, then go high enough. Mm -hmm. So this may be a situation, and again, it's not bad, it's, it's not great. This may be a situation where maybe if he asked for 150 to 200, he would have said no. Mm -hmm. And then Wendy asked 100 to 125, yeah, that's about what I expected. Maybe you could have gotten it to 125 instead of 80. Yep. Now you're like, well, no big deal, David, that's a $25 premium, that's $300 in commission. What if you did that every week? Yeah. That's $1,200 in commission a month. That's fourteen thousand four hundred a year. A year by one question, and that's being conservative. Little things like this can make a big difference. So, th this is why I like it the other way: starting high, working lower, right? Because, you know, it's like ugh, we at the close. We'll talk the close later. We have a good, better, and best close, three-part mm -hmm. close, and we'll show it within this budget range. If they pick the best one, I'm always like, man, I could have probably gotten a little more. Yeah, you know. Possible assumption on on the, on the uh, sellers uh, question, like all right, all right, guys, on the house. Any way in heck you can afford one hundred dollars? So I'm going to go into that sweet spot. Yeah. So so the question is on bias. That's really what this is. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to clear your mind, wash it away of bias. So I, I was rolling up on probably the wealthiest neighborhood in Chattanooga a couple of years ago, rolling up into a mansion. I'm like, shit, <laughs> well, I'm not selling here. final expense here. I talked my, I, I saw, I saw the BMW. I saw the Cadillac Escalade. I said, I'm not doing anything here. And I turned around driving myself home. And I was like, and then the, then the angel on my shoulder was like, get your ass back over there. Yeah. There. So, so I go back and turn around and roll up. Uh, knock on the door, lady answers, and she's like, I got a doctor's appointment. I still told you to call and, and you know, confirm oh, the appointment. Yeah. I was like, I'm sorry, ma'am. How about I come tomorrow? Okay. So then I came back tomorrow, and she yelled at me at the door again before letting me in this time. And then over the course of like two more appointments, I sold like twenty-five dollars or $30,000 in commission off of final expense. This lady was like loaded. And her health is so bad, and she was convinced she needed life insurance that so we loaded her up with what she could qualify for. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so if think about that, if I let the stupid brain get in my way of selling, I wouldn't have had 20 or 30 grand. And that's the one time your brain will shut off when you most need it. <laughs> so, so that's the thing. You cannot judge your clients. No. You cannot. The guy I sold the $200 Forester Spring to, the little shack in Whitwell, Tennessee, you know, just a dump. And he was retired from TVA, had another government pension. You would have never known it looking at his, at his joint. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the thing. And it's just, you got to always remember, go in there with a clear mind. Don't think, oh, because they're on dialysis, they can't afford this or it's this. They may, they're, they're the people who need to buy as much as possible as far as yes. I'm concerned. You know, just run the appointment. Don't overthink this stuff because you'll start to talk yourself out of it. And on, on that flip side, I've got a client has been on the book four and a half years now. Every time I go to see him, because when I come back to that county, I stop by and see my folks. When I sold him four and a half years ago, part of the north wall of his house was missing. Do you think it's been replaced yet? No. And I actually brought it up to him. While we were sitting there talking, he wanted to do, and I remember it, $262.82 is what his was. And I said, man, can you really do that? You don't even have a wall. He said, he said there's some things more important than a wall. And I shut up right then, started writing the application. But that's a flip side. I was prejudging, right? It's not my place to do that. It's not. And it's not y'all's. This is time memorial. I mean, uh, uh, Zig Ziglar, there's a great story of Zig Ziglar. He goes into a shack. They don't have running water, right? It's mom, dad, and a bunch of kids. And he's selling pots and pans. Y'all know who Zig Ziglar is, right? You know, old school sales. And he's feeling real bad because he's about to lay these pans out. They love the pans too. And he knows how much it costs. And he starts packing up before he even shows the price. And they start getting pissed. <laughs> like if mama wants to get pans, she's going to get pans she's before we pans. get, you know, running water in a toilet. And, and that's when he learned the lesson of, you know, people have their value system and we may not agree with it, but it's not our, our case. You know, we just have to show what we have. They place value in it. If it's more than something we would think is more valuable, well, that's our opinion, not, not their kind of Yes. Yeah. Just takes practice. You just, you, you know it when you're doing it and recognizing it and just stopping it. All right. Yeah, yeah. You, just ask the question. Yeah, it, it, go ahead, Matt, yeah. Listen, yeah. And that's the thing we, we, uh, you just, we, uh, what it all comes down to is just run the script, just do the present. Mm -hmm. Don't make a judgment midstream. I mean, somebody can start up. I remember talking to one lady and she was, she, yeah, that's what she said. I knocked on her door and she's like, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm here about the cards you sent in about life insurance. She said, hold on. And she went to put on her overcoat. Yeah. And she said, sit right down there on the porch. She was real pissed. And I could do nothing but knock on her door. And I said, okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, sit down. And she said, where's your license? And I said, well, here's my license. And here's my business card. She says, you know what your problem is? I said, what? She says, you're, you're a salesman and a man. <laughs> oh, boy. And I'm like, well, you know. I can't help one of them. That's what I am. You know? <laughs> and then, I'm at, you know, and, and the moment there, Luke, it's like, I'm going to get out of here. This ain't happening. But you got to keep going. So as I kept going and I learned more about her, guess what? She's taken care of her Alzheimer's red mother. You ever taken care of somebody in their final years? It, it breaks you. My, my mother-in-law is a saint. And she took care of her, her husband's mother who was not a saint. Well, she was a saint. But when you have Alzheimer's, it's hard. Not and it about broke that woman. And so I caught her probably at a terrible time. I was the proverbial dog being kicked. Right. And as we talked, I ended up selling our forester's plan for like a hundred bucks a month. But if you ask me in the moment when, when she yelled at me, probably never saw it. So a good rule of thumb is you, you got to just keep going.
I think it might be a little easier over the phone than face to face because you have all these like visual cues that tell you all oh, there's no wall. Yeah. You can't afford anything. Yeah. But just run the appointment. Train yourself to just set your brain aside and do what you're supposed to do script wise. It's just the best rule of thumb. Okay. Questions? How much time we got here? Ten minutes. Okay. Ten minutes. Let's keep going here. Perfect. So you're saying if, with this range, you can definitely afford that each month. Yeah. All right. Great. Now, just give me a moment to run some numbers for you so I can see what I can do. <clears throat> Pardon me. My allergies are horrible right now. Okay. Um, so now I know where you stand on a budget. Now, it is important to understand how my program works to cover your final expenses and why it's much better than other apps. So what we do now, um, we've collected their need, want, health, not health, that's coming later, but bank and budget. And now we're going to explain the plans. Okay, like how whole life insurance works briefly so that the client understands what are the main benefits. Okay. Um, and it's a simplified explanation. A good teacher, which you in a sense are as a salesperson, knows how to make the complex simple, or at least understanding as being simple. All right. So the key thing is you don't want to go down the rabbit hole of cash values or, you know, what the, you know, the, the financial strength of the company is down to each line item. You know, like your client doesn't care about that stuff. They want to know what does it cover? How does it work? And how does that relate to my core problem, taking care of my beneficiary, right? So let's listen and see if Wendy did this. Options out there. Um, first of all, your coverage will never cancel due to age or health. Okay, you're simply just going to pay the premium and then you're always going to be covered, no matter if you pass at 75 or 115. Okay, now this yeah. is great because unlike some term plans, you know, that cancel, um, that'd be like insurance, um, your plan with me will never cancel. Pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we like comparing what we do to term. So term terminates. That's in short how I, and that's how I use it. Like, so you've probably seen AARP, Globe Life, right? So they do what's called term. And the best way you remember what term does is term terminates. You get to 80, it's gone. What if you look past 80? Ain't got nothing, right? So what we do lasts your whole life, called whole life insurance, right? So you see how I'm using these very simple terms, right? I try to keep this as simple as possible to hit on the essence of what it is we're selling peace of mind protection, right? And then comparing and contrasting, our rates never go up, which term sometimes does, right? If you get to the end or like AARP and Globe, as you learn these, these increase every five years, our premiums are stable, they stay the same. So we make those comparisons and contra uh, uh, comparisons because we don't want them hanging up the phone thinking, you know, that Globe was cheaper, Yeah, the AARP was cheaper. So we're overcoming that objection of let me shop it around. Right, we're showing them how our plan's superior. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Okay. So second, your price is guaranteed to never increase. You simply pay the same premium each month without ever having to go through a price increase. Okay. All right. And then as long as you pay, your coverage starts right away. You can never be canceled. All right. Now, yeah. is everything I've described making sense so far? Yes. Okay. All right. So I have your date of birth. Are you out on a farm? No. Okay. No. Is the dialysis clinic. <laughs> um, so what she's doing now is running quotes. Okay. She should normally, I don't know if she's going to do this, but what happens when they're on dialysis for anybody that writes business? We know it's a guaranteed issue. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's very few carriers. Does Trinity take dialysis? Love? No, 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 <laughs> no way. No, they don't, don't even try. <laughs> so we know we we some agents will just not ask the health questions because they heard dialysis from the beginning. That might happen here, but yeah. what we want to do in this section is start to ask health questions. Okay, so if, if you're an agent of ours, or if you go onto the training site that I mentioned earlier, davidbefore.com forward slash iss, we have a pre-qualifying worksheet, and it's a series of health questions that you want to ask that you can take and then look at our cheat sheet, which is also on that site where our agents have it as well. And then we can identify which carriers are gonna work best. 
Okay. So we want to collect that information so we know which option is going to be most suitable for our clients. But if it, it's, it's like, hey, I'm on dial, I'm literally at the dialysis clinic. I mean, we know what the best options are. It's going to be gear condition. So she may skip this as we go through this. Uh, if she does, hopefully that explains why. Okay. And we're going to do a direct express card. And sometimes the fill the void here, this is a good time to ask questions, maybe a little rapport building, right? You may hear that at times, Matt. Probably attempt a rapport build that just didn't just go anywhere. What, <laughs> just to see what she got. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise they're sitting there and, and we, we like using, there's two quoters that we like using. There's insurancetoolkits.com. It will quote and underwrite. And then there's also bestplanpro.com, which also quotes and underwrites. So with these, this is where it, it will go quiet if you're over the phone. So this kind of rapport building fills the void. But what she's doing right now is plugging in the information about the client. She would be plugging in the health information. And then insurance toolkits or best plan pro pops out. The result being here are your carriers and here's your options. Okay. The first one you said. Insurancetoolkits.com. Yes. Yeah. Not, most of my folks really love that too. They. Yep. Got CRM. They sell leads too that are. Yeah. Not half bad. No, they're not. Okay. They're not. And we have dialysis. All right. And how long um, have you been on dialysis? Since 2018. Oh my, all right, you're doing good. Yeah. Okay, okay. So um, the company that we're gonna go with, this is called AIG. So now we're in the closing stage. So she has picked the company, like I said, it's pretty straightforward, it's gonna be guaranteed issue. There's really two main carriers, Great Western and AIG is what we use. And so when we explain, you wanna you want explain that David, kind of how we explain the carriers? Um, as far as ex explain what, yeah, you like at this point of the script. Okay. Yeah. We're basically going to let them know that it's just like I told you before, your price is never going to increase. You're um, not going to be canceled due to age or health. And then with AIG, we've got a two year waiting plan, right? So they've got to wait. So I would tell them at this point, now with AIG, what you qualify for, uh, you've got a waiting period with it. It's two years. If you die of natural causes within the first two years, it's going to pay back return of premium, which is basically everything you've paid into the policy, plus 10% interest. Now, with the guaranteed issue carrier, there is an accidental already in there. So I always want to hit on the accident, right? And I might even joke and say, hey, you ain't planning on dying in two years, are you? No, I'm not. Okay, well, great. But if you did die and it was by accident, it's going to pay out the full amount. Um, and then, of course, you know, with the ones we do, we have level. We have first day full coverage, graded, and guaranteed issue. First day full coverage, exactly like it sounds. They make the first payment into it. They are 100% covered. Graded is going to have a stipulation um, as far as it'll pay a certain amount in year one, a certain amount in year two, full benefit in after two years. AIG, return of premium plus 10% or Great Western after two years. It's a full-fledged policy also. So we want to talk about the goods. We got to bring up the bad too, but I highlight the goods because that's what we've got to work with. Anything else you want to add? Uh, well, we're we're going to pick this up uh, after the lunch break. So we're going to call up uh, Alvin with uh, Trinity and Family Benefit. So an, another carrier we love to use at uh, the dig agency and he's going to come up and talk about our final expense product with them and then at the conclusion at, at the top of the hour we're going to take an hour-long break go grab your lunches you can hang out we're going to be here and then we'll pick back up again at one continue going through the sales call do some appointment setting door knocking cover leads kind of wrap everything up then so uh, a round of applause for alvin
Trinity Life. Thank you. Come on, give him the. Okay. Yeah. okay. Come here, Al. Let me pee. I'm going prone. Hey. hey. <laughs> okay. Buttons. All right. Yeah, but back. I'm going to fuck this in. Can I slide over here somewhere? Yeah. Oh, you need a power cord? Yeah. I'll you want to use mine? Just put it here. Okay. Good word. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, and I've got the connector there. So I'll address this while Alvin's getting set up. Somebody in the chat here said, when accepting the first month premium by check at completion of the app, phase out, I, I don't ever, I don't think it ever was phased in. <laughs> I mean, we really don't require, it never really was required to take a, an app up front. I'm sorry, a check up front with the app. And I don't recommend it because with, I mean, if you can get it, great, but you don't want to push the item because that can be the sticking point to making the sale. So, so yeah. Alvin, how you doing? All right. You're doing great yourself, David. Doing fine. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. And, and I always uh, want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present sure. to your, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And um, also, I want to thank all of you for your time and attention today. Some of you know me. Uh, for, and for those of you who have heard me present in the past, uh, you know that I too started my career as an independent agent, just like yourselves. So I know for a fact, the more comfortable you are with a particular company, the more you're gonna wanna do business uh, with that company. And I really enjoyed having the opportunity, David, to sit in on some of that sales training because it brought back so many great memories uh, for me uh, when I was an agent. And just a little food for thought on that, is I would strongly encourage you to take the words of wisdom of David and what he's training you because my experience as well has been practice his words, practice what he has taught until they become your words. Practice his ideas until they become your ideas. And I'll guarantee you, you will be more successful over time doing those, doing those things. I promise you that. Um, as David had mentioned, uh, my name is Alvin Bengosh. I am Vice President of Marketing at Trinity Life and family benefit life insurance companies. Uh, what we do is we specialize in smaller face, simplified issue, term life, whole life. Uh, we have a family of fixed traditional annuities that are known to be a little shorter term, more liquid than most fixed annuities being offered today. But we're probably best known for our final expense product. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail about that here today. But one thing that I've learned over time in presenting to groups like this, it's sometimes best if I start off with what are some reasons why you as agent would want to do business with our companies? Because there's a lot of good companies out there, right? So to share with you some of those reasons why other agents choose to do business with us is one of those is what I call the ease of doing business. And what I refer to when I say the ease of doing business is who's going to issue your policies with the least amount of hassle, pay you a fair commission, but more important than ever, and in my 26 years of this industry, more important than ever is doing business with companies who have tools in place to help you keep your policies in force. So that way you make more money over time. With final expense, we have three different ways to submit an application. Uh, we have the old fashioned paper application that uses a hand signature. Uh, we have a pure telephonic application from start to finish that uses voice signatures. And then we have an e-application option that gives you the agent the choice of either DocuSign or voice recording the signature on an e-app as well. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about uh, those three different options that you can use for you and your clients here in a little bit. But one of the most important things I think is, is regardless which application option you use, I've always designed our system so that if your client is honest with you at the time of application, you know exactly how that policy is gonna get issued. We do a telephone interview of some format with all three of those application options. And in my opinion, it's very important for you to know right there at that time of application, how that policy is gonna get issued. So that's the, one of the goals is point of sale approval. 
The reason why we want you to have point of sale approval is because if you think about it, you and us as a company are much better off ne next week if you're writing a new application with us and a new client, right? Instead of having to go back to that first client saying, oh, I'm sorry, uh, got to do something different. Because I know myself being an agent, you might not be able to get back in front of those clients, correct? In addition, we do these phone interviews not only to help you with the point of sale approval, but two of the reasons are, one being so many medications these days are dual purpose. Why are you prescribed that medication? So that gives us the ability to be able to ask your client why they're on the phone to say, well, why were you prescribed gabapent? Okay. What you'll find that does with your placing your clients with Trinity Life and Family Benefit is it's going to increase your placement ratio. What do I mean by placement ratio? It's the number of applications compared to the number of policies issued. Obviously, you want a high placement ratio, right? Because you got to make use of your time, leads are expensive, things of that nature. So what you'll find with us by being able to ask your client, why were you prescribed that medication? It allows us to issue a lot higher percentage of your applications rather than co uh, some companies who don't ask your client. Then they just have to hard program their computer to just flat decline all those medications. So that's one advantage of that phone interview. The other advantage of the phone interview is it protects you, the agent. Uh, it, it helps protect you both financially and um, from a legal standpoint. The interesting thing about final expense, and I've been doing this as a final expenses carrier for 22 years now, we don't have these types of issues with any of our other products, term life, whole life, annuities. But when it comes to final expense, and I've never figured this one out, it seems like any time something gets questioned, a final expense consumer, it's never their fault. They're going to blame it on anybody and everybody else. And, and maybe that's why they're at this stage of their life buying these types of policies. I don't know. But they often tell us, well, I told the agent this, that, or the other. The agent said this, that, or the other. And it's like, well, you know what? I don't know what you told, what the conversation was, but here's what you told us. Okay. From, from another standpoint, uh, we get inquiries from the families, we get inquiries from attorneys, we get inquiries from departments of insurance. And I promise you, when we give them a copy of that phone interview, and it's that applicant's voice applying for life insurance, you hardly ever hear from them again. From a financial standpoint, it happens all the time. Yesterday was a great example. I arrived here at the hotel. I got an email from Policy Services. This client's called complaining. Once all of his money back, he never applied for life insurance. Well, put up a telephone interview. Yeah, he did. Let him remind him that he completed a telephone interview and no, we will not be returning any premiums. That's an example of how it helps you save and protect money. If we would have to give a client their money back, guess what happens to the agent's commission? You got to charge it back as well, right? So that's two very good reasons why we do, the, do those phone interviews. Third reason that agents love to do business with Trendy Life and Family Benefit is our premiums. Our premiums are some of the most competitive in final expense. The reason why I emphasize this needs to be so important for you and your, and your success as an agent is competitive premiums are not only going to make it easier to sell, it's going to make it a heck of a lot harder for another agent to come in and replace you in three months. Because if this client's seeing you today, I guarantee you there's going to be another agent knocking on the door in three or four months. And if, and if you're selling a higher price premium, it makes it pretty easy for that agent to replace your policy, right? Then you get a charge back of unearned advanced commissions. Okay, you lost money. Okay, so that's the reasons why competitively priced premiums, which leads to the fourth reason why agents do business with us higher persistency. You have to have high persistency to be successful in the insurance business goes back to the old saying, the business that stays is what pays. Your persistency at Trinity Life and Family Benefit will be higher than most other final expense companies for two reasons. 
One we just talked about, the premiums are harder for another agent to replace you, right? The second one is, is agents often tell me, they say, you know, Alvin, other companies say that they have it, but for some reason, they just don't seem to do as good a job as Trinity Life and Family Benefit. And what I'm referring to here is social security benefit billing for the bank accounts on the first and third of the month, okay? Uh, not for sure of some of your backgrounds, how long you maybe been in the industry, so I'll just explain here a little bit. The social security and disability income only pay five times a month. First of the month, third of the month, second, third, and fourth Wednesdays of the month, okay? Wednesdays are wonderful. Banks are open. The, the only Wednesday I can come up with is if, the four, if, if Christmas falls on the fourth Wednesday of the month. That's the only time I can come up with the Wednesdays, okay? First and third of the month are absolutely horrible. They fall on Saturday, Sundays, or what I call the party weekends, New Year's, Fourth of July, Labor Day. Okay, take a look at this last Labor Day, third of the month, probably the biggest Social Security payday of the month. It was on Sunday. The government, in their infinite wisdom, if the first or third falls on a weekend or holiday, as most of you probably know, they put money into that client's account on the Friday before the weekend. With Trinity Life and Family Benefit at the time of application, you just simply tell us, is your client's premium payment to be Social Security related, yes or no? If you say yes, wonderful. Guess what? We drafted that account the day the money hit the bank before the client had the opportunity to spend it. Unfortunately, other companies had to wait until Tuesday the 5th when the banks were open. See the problem? Final expense clients, they know when they get paid. Not all of them, but a good percentage of them would walk down to an ATM during those four days while the banks were closed, pulled out everything but five bucks in cash, pay some bills, use the balances, they're walking around money for alcohol, lottery tickets, bingo cards, or whatever they, whatever they want to spend their money on. Agent gets a notification a couple of days later, insufficient funds. You reach out to your client doing exactly what you're supposed to do. They say, sorry, Terry, I'm not going to have money until next month. You go see them next month. <laughs> Terry, I can't afford two months. Policy falls off the books. You lost money. Our agents don't have that issue near as often because our system is designed to help beat your client to the bank. So that's two reasons why you'll have higher persistency uh, with our companies. Another great reason agents like to do business with us is we allow up to a 45-day requested future issue date. Most companies are only 30 days. So, Brandon, let's say you're visiting with a client tomorrow, and they say, okay, Brian, Brandon, I get my Social Security paid on the, on the second Wednesday of every month. But you know what? That's here in five that's, that's like a, well, a week from today. I can't budget my money or it's already spoken for. Can, can we push it off till November? Second week in Wednesday in November? Most companies are going to say no, because that's more than 30 days from tomorrow when you're seeing the client, right? Trinity Life Family Benefit, not a problem. Write them up. It's within 45 days. Thanksgiving time. I don't know about you, but when I was when I was in the field, people would often tell me, come see me after the holidays. I don't want to mess with it until then. Trinity Life Family Benefit, not a problem. Write them up. January 1st, January 3rd are always within 45 days of Thanksgiving. Okay. So just remember that 45 day requested effective date, it will help you make some sales. Another reason agents do business with us is you have direct access to contracting, commissions, underwriting, marketing. You have access to me. David will vouch for that. Ryan will vouch for that. You pick up the phone. If you have an issue, give me a call. Okay. When you call our home office in Tulsa, Oklahoma during business hours, believe it or not, you actually get a person these days. You're not pushing one for the boardroom or two for the bathroom. Because at, at Trinity and Family Benefit, we do things that may be a little bit different than some of the other companies. And, and I don't know if that goes back to myself being an agent and even the president and founder of our company, Greg Zahn. He too started his career as an independent agent. But I think that's kind of the culture of our company. And, and maybe that's why we've 
been successful doing final expense for over 20 years when dozens of other companies have gotten in and out of the business because our philosophy and our view is you are our client. And, and the policy owner is your client. I think today too many other co too many companies kind of see it, in my opinion, backwards. They think the policy owner is their client, and sometimes they only see the agent in a sense as a necessary evil they have to pay a commission to in order to get to that policy owner. But that's not the way it is at Trinity Life and Family Benefit. So I think by our philosophy and view is no, you are our clients. I think that's what helps us have that mentality and ability to build better products at better premiums and provide you with a lot better service than what you're getting with a lot of other companies these days. And that leads me to the another reason is service after the sale. We have always strived to make service after the sale as easy as it is service at the time of application and policy issuance. Uh, a great example of that. If you have a client who maybe switched bank accounts or something happened, they need to make a change, whatever it might be. Most often you can fix that with a simple email to policy services or a three-way telephone call with you and your client. We've designed it to make it easy for you on conservation because if you have to spend all of your time on conservation, when are you going to be out making new sales? So that's the reason why is, is we want you doing what you do best. That is making presentations, getting in front of new clients, because our philosophy is the more money you make, then the more successful our companies will be as well. We also um, reward our producers based on quantity and quality of business. Uh, I'm going to go into that in a, in a little bit more detail here, kind of towards the end. I'll talk about lead bonus and trips and things of that nature. Uh, but I do want to spend just a few minutes here uh, on the main product that I'm, I'm uh, wanting to visit with you about. And that is our Golden Eagle final expense. Okay, uh, Trinity Life and Family Benefit, our Golden Eagle final expense can be issued one of two ways. We either have what we call like the simplified issue, and that's the day one death benefit or we have a graded death benefit. But what's nice about that is, is the, the way that the application, the questions on the application are lined up and, and the medications, you know exactly again how that policy should get issued, simplified or graded, even before you do that phone interview if your client is honest with you. The simplified issue day one death benefit, it is for ages 50 to 85, death benefits 2,500, to 25,000. And then the graded death benefit is ages 50 to 80, face amounts 2,000 to 10,000. And for those of you who are contracted with us, you have access to all of that in your portals and agent guides, things of that nature. For, you, for those of you who have yet to contract, it's all gonna be in your new agent kit, makes it real easy. Plus we have training videos on our websites uh, to help get you up and running as well. The, I do want to make a, one comment here, though, like on that graded death benefit, that's the one um, where um, they were mentioned earlier, like on a guaranteed issue, graded death benefit, it's going to pay different amounts at different times. That's the way graded death benefit is with, with companies. Ours is not a guaranteed issue. They still have to be able to answer some health questions to qualify for the graded. But how the death benefit works is, is if your client passes away in the first 12 months on a graded death benefit, it's going to pay a factor. And that factor is going to be based upon male, female, tobacco use, and issue age. But you simply just take that factor that's shown in the agent guide times the ultimate death benefit. Or our rate calculator on our website will calculate it for you. Uh, other companies' uh, rate calculators will show you what our graded death benefit is as well. Um, so that's if they die in the first 12 months, okay? Then if they pass away in months 12 through 24, it's going to be a minimum of 50% of the death benefit, older ages are a little higher, but months 25 and beyond will pay the full death benefit, okay? How many of you in here sell final expense? Well, okay, good, good. You'll find that most companies' final expense have some type of a rider 
uh, writer, what I call to maybe help the sales sizzle. And at Trinity and Family Benefit, our Golden Eagle final expense policy has, a, has an accelerated living benefit rider. And in my opinion, all riders are good, but some are maybe a little bit better than others. And what I base that on, and what I mean by that, is it a rider that looks and sounds good, or is it a rider that your client's actually going to use? Our Golden Eagle, the accelerated living benefit rider, can be accelerated in one of two ways. One, it can be accelerated if they're diagnosed with a terminal illness at 12 months or less, or some states like Illinois, 24 months. But that's an example, in my opinion, of one that maybe looks and sounds good, but it's, I don't, in my 20 some years, I think we probably had three or four people actually accelerate their final expense for a terminal illness because it just doesn't make sense. The second way, though, that your client can accelerate that death benefit is if their doctor certifies that they're going to remain in a qualified nursing home for the balance of their life. It's the reason, for those of you selling final expense, what's the number one reason people buy final expense? Pay for their funeral, right? What do you think the chance of, you, of your clients, not all of them, but what do you think the chance of some of them are gonna end up in the nursing home before they die? How many of those are gonna be able to write a check to pay for their long-term care insurance for the funeral, to the nursing home every month? And how many of them have long-term care insurance? Right? Here, here, as some of you probably know, if they can't pay their nursing home, they're gonna end up on Medicaid, right? Medicaid in most states only allow consumers or to individuals to have about $2,000 in liquid assets in total, including cash value of life insurance policies. Plus most states only allow them to have $30 a month to pay for incidentals. So what do you think happens to their life insurance policies? A lot of them are gonna fall off, right? Well, Trinity Life and Family Benefit, this accelerated living benefit rider that's built in, if their, if their doctor certifies that they're gonna remain in a qualified nursing home for the balance of their life, they can accelerate that death benefit and then go and use the, that money to prepay their funeral, which is why they bought the policy to begin with, right? And most states, Medicaid allows prepaid funerals. And the thing I love about this rider, it's no additional premium. It's automatically included in every final expense policy we issue. Matter of fact, the policy form won't even print without it. So what I love about it is if they never use it, no harm, no foul. It didn't cost them anything, right? If they do choose to use it and can qualify down the road, that is then when they would actually pay for it, okay? And how they go about paying for it as an example, let's say it was a $10,000 death benefit. As you all know, insurance companies, we make money on interest earnings, right? So if we're paying this $10,000 about one year in advance actuarially, we don't have that $10,000 to invest anymore, do we? So we're going to subtract 7.4% of the death benefit. So $10,000, 7.4%, $740, right? Everybody, if my math's correct, right? Then their doctor is going to charge us for a copy of the medical records and filling out our form. So we charge a flat $250 administrative fee. But on that $10,000 example, it takes $740, $250, it's $990. That would be subtracted off the $10,000 death benefit. So the policy owner would now receive a check for $9,010. They can use that money to go prepay their funeral, which again is why they bought that policy to begin with. So what that rider is designed to do is it's designed to actually give your clients the money when they need it the most. Sometimes that's not always uh, at that time of death. Earlier, you heard me talking about the, the three different ways um, to submit an application. We, and we use, and, and they, 
uh, involve a, a phone interview, at least of some format, depending upon which application you choose to use with, with that uh, applicant. Uh, for telephone interviews, we use a company called Management Research Services, or MRS is kind of what they're more known as. For those of you who've uh, written Final Expense, you probably already worked with them in the past because they do it for quite a few telef uh, telephone interviews, work with quite a few Final Expense companies. Um, but we talked about we have that paper application. Uh, the paper application, that would need to be done face-to-face -face, uh, with you and your client because they're actually signing their name uh, on that application. The second option you have is a pure telephonic application from start to finish. It's just all done over a telephone, voice recorded, the signatures, everything. So because of that, you can do it face-to-face -face or telesales. And then our third option that you have to choose from is an e-app. Uh, and it too is going to come with a short phone interview. But what's nice about that one is, is you have the option of either DocuSign or voice signature. Uh, and again, that can be either done face-to-face -face or a telesale option. Your agent guide actually gives you a step-by-step -step of each of these three different options. Uh, plus, in our agent portal, we have about a 35-minute training video where I go over into a lot of details of each of, each of these options. Um, what you'll find on the uh, paper application is uh, at the end of that telephone interview, uh, you simply just scrub your application, have them sign it, so just then just simply submit it via fax uh, or upload it through your agent portal. Uh, again, the telephonic application, you're going to find it's a little bit longer because what happens there is when you call in, a telephone interviewer is data entering the application for you. Okay, And what we do at the beginning is we get the information uh, from you about you and your client. We verify that information. We ask the health questions, we ask the dual use medications, we then get you that point of sale approval, we verify the premium, and then we get from you the agent, the beneficiary replacement, bank account information, voice record the signatures. The e-app kind of works in a similar fashion, uh, except you actually go to the agent portal yourself and data enter in that part of the application. Screen pops up, you'd call to do that same uh, phone interview number, but it's a shortened phone interview. You get that we ask about the dual use medications. We ask about, um, you know, to get you that point of sale approval. Um, then once they're approved, you're given the option. Uh, if you are face to face with the client, uh, most agents, they are just refreshing their computer at that time and point, data entering the bank account replacement beneficiary information and docu signing it because you're there to help them. If you're not face to face, I usually encourage the agent just finish the application since you're already on the phone with the client because then we can voice record the signatures. Uh, it sometimes can be difficult to have to explain to a 75 year old on the flip phone uh, how to use DocuSign if you're not face to face. Um, so again, we give you the different options to be able to pick and choose what you want for uh, you and your client. One product, I another uh, one I wanna just mention here just real briefly. Um, and the reason why I want to mention this is because I see final expense agents using this product more and more all the time with our companies. And that is more of a traditional whole life. It's what we call the first whole life policy. Final expense agents, you use that in three areas. Number one, price competition. You've already heard many times our final expense premiums are a lot more competitive. This first whole life policy is a little harder to qualify for, so they got to be in better health. But the premiums are 20 to 25% lower premium. I'll put it up against any company any day of the week. Number two, you have it for larger face amounts. Our final expense was capped at 25,000. This product is face amounts all the way up to 5 million. You also have it for younger people. Final expense with us starts at age 50. This product starts at age zero. So you got it for children, grandchildren, younger spouses. You can price it as a single pay, a 10 pay, a life pay. No phone interview uh, with this product. Um, currently, it's using a paper app. We will get it on an electronic platform in, in 2024. Um, but that is a great product that once you get up and running with our final expense, I suggest you take a look at that. If you have questions, obviously give me a call. I'll even give you examples of how I used to use the non-forfeiture values to help me make a lot of sales when I was an agent in the field um, with that product. I mentioned earlier on um, that we do reward Agents based on quantity and quality of business. 
Um, a couple of the ways that we're going to reward your quantity of business is one, we have a lead yeah. bonus program that rewards agents for giving us a good chunk of their life insurance business and, and how it works. Charles, let's say you issue 5,000 of annual premium in a month with us. So it's based on issue date, not application date. But let's say you issued 5,000 with us in the, uh, here in the month of October. The first week in December, you would get an email from us thanking you for your business and a lead voucher for, for uh, 250 bucks. Or if it was 10,000, it'd be 500, 15,000, uh, 750, et cetera. There's no cap on this lead bonus. But you would simply just place a lead order with the company of your choice, give them our lead voucher. That lead company then invoices us and we write them a check that to help supplement your advertising and lead costs. Uh, we don't sell Medicare advan or Medicare type products, but yet we pay for a lot of leads because you're cross-selling. You know, that's what I love about this lead bonus program. It helps you get into front of more clients so that way you make more money. Second way we reward quantity is our trips are known for three things. Our agent sales incentive trips are either going to be easier to qualify for or higher caliber than other final expense companies. I promise you, as long as I'm planning the trips, it's going to be one, if not both of those. Um, but then the third thing that and again, I think this goes back to being an agent. We're the only company I know of that does not 1099 you on the agent incentive trip. So depending on your tax bracket, that can save you a few thousand dollars of taxes because the company covers that tax for you. We don't 1099 you on it. Give you an idea of these trips. Easier to qualify for higher caliber, okay? Uh, in June, uh, the agents, we went to Portugal uh, for seven days, six nights. Entry level was only 70,000 for you and your guests. The trip you're qualifying for right now, seven days, six nights in Spain. Entry level is only 70,000 for you and your guests. So that's why I say it's either easier to qualify for or higher caliber than other companies. Quantity or quality of business, uh, it's awarded, rewarded in our renewal commission is higher than most other final expense carriers. But again, where agents make their money in the final expense business is with that higher persistency with a lot less headaches over time. Uh, I wanna thank you all again for your time and attention. Uh, thank you, David. I think it's lunchtime right at noon. Hungry. And um, for those of you who have written with us, thank you for giving us that opportunity. Uh, for those of you who have yet to write business with our companies, my suggestion is uh, just write us a half dozen apps for yourself. That way you can decide about being an easy company uh, to do business with. Uh, I will be around here for a little bit longer. If you have any questions, uh, just please let me know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Paul is grab that for me. Oh, yes. All right. So, walk off. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Hot mic. I want that. Yeah. All right, so uh, lunchtime. So uh, take an hour. There's a bunch of places you can go for lunch around here. You can hang out. I'm just going to hang out. We're going to restart at one o'clock. And just to kind of give you a rundown of what we're going to cover, we're going to cover the closing part of the presentation, go into how Wendy's closing, what she's doing right, any sort of objections. We're going to talk about handling objections at the close. We're also going to spend some time talking about lead vendors, which lead vendors are great for telesales face-to-face, -face, what we've seen personally with our agents working well. Um, we'll also talk about appointment setting and door knocking, and then we're also going to have American Home Life come up and talk about their final expense products as well. So um, yeah, go ahead and take your lunch. I hope you've enjoyed everything so far. And for those of you out there in virtual YouTube world, we'll be back in an hour. So uh, thank you.
Yeah. Right, you guys on YouTube, we're gonna start about one minute. So we'll start in about uh, one or two minutes, y'all. So just sit tight. Somebody's got it playing. Is it? Is it yours? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's okay. Value patent? Yeah. Okay. okay. You okay. need it? Nope. Just okay. saw it up there. I was like, ooh. Yeah. Hmm. Excuse me. All right, it is one o'clock on the dot, so we're gonna continue and move forward, press forward. So just as a reminder, uh, let's thank our sponsors today. Yes. I wanna thank Prosperity, Trinity Life, American Home Life, and then also uh, Tips, Tricks, and Closers, TTC, ttcleads.com uh, for sponsoring this event. Um, we're gonna spend the second half of our day here really concluding the sales presentation, going over the close, how we teach agents to set up a proper close to optimize your chances of success, how to overcome objections as well. Uh, then we're going to move into a conversation about appointment setting and door knocking. We want to hit on that, especially for those of you here live in person, because it sounds like a good bit of you are going to be selling or, or selling in person. So we want to make sure we cover that and how to do that effectively. We've got some live calls to listen to as well as, as there. And then we'll also have um, Kyle in the back is going to talk American Home Life in about an hour from now. And then we'll squeeze in some time at the end for leads. I'm sure you guys probably have questions about leads. We'll be happy to answer them and tell you what's working, what's not working. So you guys at least go in the right direction with it when it comes to leads. A lot of bad things you can do with leads. And then we'll conclude probably about 3 to 3.30 is kind of what I'm roughly expecting. We'll go longer if you guys have questions. But we want to leave the end for Q&A. So, of course, as you have questions, as we continue, please ask. Happy to just raise your hand and answer them like we have been. Uh, but we'll save some time at the end. If there's something you wanted to ask, you can definitely ask it of us, and, and we're happy to help you. On final expense, anything insurance sales as well. Some people have Medicare questions. Happy to help there, too, as well. Okay, so we're going to go back to the close here. So just to refresh your memory, this is Mr. Jimmy. He's sitting at the dialysis clinic, uh, and Wendy is trying to close her on a, uh, him on a much-needed plan. So uh, we're at the end here. So let's kind of listen to see how this goes. Oh, whoops. Let me uh, turn that from two speed to one speed. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, it actually is. It's funny where we're at. We're just seven minutes into this and she's already she's already closing it. So it's pretty impressive. But let me turn on the audio for the people at home. So they can hear this. And uh, let's pick up again right now. It's called AIG. Okay, these guys have been around for a long time, and this is called a guaranteed issue. Okay, so a GI means if you die within the first two years of the plan, you now, as far as what to cover with when you're mentioning the carrier, your client doesn't really care about that much about the carrier, they just want to know the basics because what sells the policy is not the carrier, it's you, the agent. Okay, so they're buying you first, and then the recommendation that comes from the trusted advisor. So we don't have to go into this minutia and detail about the carrier. All that really matters is who they are, where they're located, and how long they've been in business. That's really all I ever mentioned. Okay? They don't even really care about the AM best ratings. Like That's something that's more of a concern amongst us, potentially. But our clients don't really know, much less care. I think I've been asked three times out of 1,500 sales, what's the AM best of this one? Right? They just don't know. Or don't care. Uh, so I like to mention, Wendy didn't mention this, but I would say, you know, so the company we're looking at today is called AIG. They've been in business since, and I'm making this up now, 1900. They're based out of New York, New York. So I want to mention just those basic factoids. I just think that adds a level of validity. To that. Okay. Any, anything you want to add on to that? I agree. Just do with the, the three things you want to tell them about. Yeah. And you also want to make sure you tell them why you're selecting the company for them. So we'll hear in here in a second if, if Wendy does this, but Jimmy deserves to be told why 
Wendy is selecting AIG for the client. So for example, if I were Wendy in this moment, I would say I'm selecting AIG for you because you're on dialysis. You're not in very good shape. Just to be honest with you, most companies would decline you, but AIG flat out accepts you. They're one of the few that does it. And what I've done there is I've positioned my product as being much more attractive to the client because I've explained to them why it's important, right? So don't ever forget to mention that piece as to why you want them to, or why you're telling them to buy this particular product. Anything you want to add? No, just always. Uh, one thing I will throw in at the end, I'll say, and you know, with your um, age and your health, this company is going to be the best bang for your buck. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's continue. You get back your premiums plus 10% coverage. Okay. Now, this is great because your health ailments are very hard to cover. All right. Many companies will not even cover these. Um, and the money you get back is better than putting it in the bank. Okay. We don't make 10% in the bank. Now, over the long term, so this is one thing, I, I don't know, for those of you who sell, I, I don't, did, did you have difficulty ever in the beginning selling a two-year waiting period product? Did you ever feel like? Um, if you can learn to sell that, you can sell anything yeah. is what I was taught. So tell, tell the audience here, what is the process to positioning a two-year wait? So understanding like the client's not covered for natural death for two years. Like I feel bad, even if that's all the client can qualify for, telling the person you got to live for another two years. So how can you position this, David, to where it's a bit more acceptable to the client and they feel good and confident about buying it and that it's a good deal for them? Well, the way I, I would go about it, I would tell them, first of all, the carrier, the three things about them. And I would let them know that, hey, this is the best place for you to put your money. And let me explain to you why. Because, And then I'd say, do you know anywhere that I can get 10% interest off of a single investment right now. And they're going to say no. And then I will say, the good thing about this policy is that you're going to get back, your beneficiary will get back everything you've put in for your premiums plus 10% interest. Now that's unheard of, right? And so I, I'm going to pick the highlights of it to talk about. Now, I could talk about it another way and say, you're not fully covered. But why would I want to do that? You know, so we have to know how the policy structured and figure out the key talking points. Because I don't know about y'all's bank, but my bank's running like percent and a half right now. So. 10% looks better. And a lot of times I'll get the objection. I just don't want a two-year wait. That's okay, Miss Jones. Can you tell me any other place you can put your money and be guaranteed to make money off of it? And most time they'll say no. So I just, I do like Wendy's kind of doing here. I go for the 10% and I just tell them again at the end, I'll say, this is the best plan for you. And honestly, probably the only plan for you. And I'm just honest. Yeah, the key thing I, I want to tell you guys here and, and virtually, you need to sell yourself on why selling guaranteed issues is a good idea because it really is the only option. And if you think, well, if you feel bad about it, and you really, if, you, if you're a broker, you can't really sell anything else anyway, mm -hmm. right? So if all they can get is a two-year wait, that is the best option. And it really does a service to them because if they live past the two years, they're fully covered. Yeah. And if they die before the two years, they get all their money back. Plus, in most cases, 10% interest. So it's not like they're losing anything. And if they wait to put this off, this purchase, well, then they got to start that two years at that later point, which is the other problem, right? So, so long story short, and, and this is more of a reflection of myself. I had a hard time explaining this to people and feeling good about it. This is how I kind of justified it. it truly is the only option yeah. if you're a broker, as I think all of us should be um, in those circumstances like this. And that should give you a little more confidence. And one other thing I'd like to throw in there, <laughs> sell yourself at this point too, because I'm going to let them know it's the best plan for them. And I'm also going to tell them, hey, Miss Jones, and you get me. What's better than that? Okay. And I'm ready for her to say anything's better than that. <laughs> okay. So be ready for that. 
but sell yourself at this point. Let them know that I'm going to be the one personally taking care of all of your needs because I don't think we put enough emphasis sometimes on how important um, them trusting us is, right? Them knowing that we're going to take care of them. As you make those statements, make sure you're ready to drive to visitations, to funerals, because if they call me and let me know they died and I can get there, I'm going to be there because I'm going to back up everything I told them five or 10 years ago. I'm still going to do it for them. So make sure you're throwing in yourself at that point too, because they can't get Terry anywhere else. All right, let's keep going here. This is the best program for you, okay, because once you're fully covered after that two years, no one can take that coverage away from you, no matter what your health, your age. Okay, does that make sense so far? Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good. All right, now let me just open this up here and get our thing here. All right, so what do we got here um, with AIG? Now they're gonna offer um, an $8,000 policy, so you can get $8,000 so at this point, we've sold them on the product or we've explained how it works, the benefits. She did a little temperature check. Has everything sounded good so far, right? So at this point, we pivot now to offering what we do, we call the classic good, better, best clothes. This is where you show three prices at three different amounts. And then you ask the client, which one works best for you? That's a presumed close, right? I'm not saying, would you like to buy one? Which one works best? We assume we're getting the clothes, right? Again. Don't ask them a yes, no question when a yes, yes question is better. Do you want to buy? No, there's always the answer. Which one do you want to buy? You're going to get a lot more yeses out of that. Now, as far as the structure of the good, better, best, I want to go over this a little bit. So we had a budget range that the client gave of 80 to 100. Remember that from earlier? So the low side, the good, is going to be 80. The high side, this middle size, is going to be 100. A month. We need to set a third best, the, the highest one, one interval above. Because sometimes, like we said earlier, you'll give up 80 to 100. They'll say yes to that. But maybe you, after you explained it, they felt more confident, they'll spend a little bit more. So it's always worth doing a stretch goal that's outside of that first budget. So we're going to show an 80, 100, and 120. All right. And what I like to do if I'm in person is get a clean sheet of paper. Imagine if it's something like the back side of this, and I'm just going to put the face amount, the coverage amount, 10, 15, 20, and I'm going to put them in big, bold numbers. And then below that, I'm going to put a teeny, small $80 a month, then 100 and 120. Now, that sounds cheesy. This is called the big little check. Um, this is used by uh, Ben Feldman, who was a very famous uh, life insurance agent. He would show these like people who ran big companies, these estate planning deals. He would show a big check that that's what this, you know, the government's going to take for this tiny check of 30000 a year, right? And so it worked. So I like to visually show you're going to get this big check for this small amount of premium, all right? And you want it on a clean sheet of paper because you don't want their attention to be distracted elsewhere. Okay. Now, what do you do if you're over the phone? So if you're over the phone, um, you want them to say, grab a piece of paper and a pen and write this down. I'm going to tell you to write following down. So write down one zero 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 zero. Below that, put one five zero zero zero. Now I'm saying each number out loud because sometimes over the phone, you may give like 50,000 and I think it's 15,000. Or the price is 50 a month, but it was really, there's 15. They think it's 15, but it was really 50. And now you got to walk that back. So I like to say each number individually. And then once I get the 10, 15, 20 down, then, okay, so go back across from the 10, put in eight, zero. All right, so across from the 15,000, put in one, zero, zero. Everybody get the idea? And I'm making them write that down so they can see it and think about it. If I just, you know, tell them all this stuff, they won't remember half of it. So they got to write it down so they can look at something as they go through the motions of deciding which is best. Does that make sense, everybody? Any questions on that? Okay. 
dollars of coverage, and that comes out to one hundred and sixty dollars, or one hundred dollars and sixty cents. Sorry, <laughs> not one hundred and sixty. Okay. And how much does that cover? That's going to be for eight thousand. Okay. Mhm. Mm yeah, now I just shopped all the top companies. Um, AIG is the least expensive guaranteed company, which is one of the top companies, actually. Um, so there is nothing else. Anybody else, all the other companies I have, um, they all decline. What you do wrong? Well, she just gave one price. Yeah, she didn't give three options. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she'll probably get. She pro, she ends up getting it. Yeah, I'll I'm just sure let the cat out of that. Yeah. But what if she could have gotten one twenty instead of one hundred? Yeah. Again, nothing. Nothing she's doing or what we're suggesting is high pressure. Yeah. Tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, we're just showing the more options you show up to a point, the more opportunity you are in maxing out your sale. Because there is probably one out of ten, maybe two out of ten of your presentations, they'll pick the best option if you just mm -hmm. show it to them. But they never would have known it existed if you didn't show it. Does that make sense? So if you're just throwing one number out there, you might be undercutting yourself to an extent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and that's why I like two or three options. Uh, three options is great because I don't feel like I'm pushed. I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, buy this. I'm saying, hey, you have freedom of choice, buy what fits you best. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to argue with that as much. It's like, okay, I'm saying yes to one of these, which one should it be? Right. As opposed to saying, well, should I say yes to the only option I'm given? And there's a, there's a lot of people, this is why we do the sell the premium close. There's a lot of people that I have come across selling. You've probably seen too, where some agent showed a high price and they just said no, but the agent could have you know, they instead did. of showing 100, could have shown an 80 or 60 or 40, but they were just greedy. greedy. Yeah. And they just lost everything. Yeah. Right. So that's why I like three options versus just one, yeah. just in case they give pushback. You know, again, I want an app written. I don't really care. The money takes care of itself in this business if you do right by your clients. So just get them whatever they want. You know, that's what I say. You want to add anything there? No, I, other than, um, the reason we're putting that other option out there, that third option, do you think they tell us the truth all the time? Do you think they'd really tell us how much money they could spend? So don't yeah. not do that because that gives them a possibility. I've used the, the good, better, best, and I get up, say my best is a, say I do a 10, 12, and a 15,000. And they look at that and they're like, well, how much is 20 then? So it gives you an opportunity, okay? It gives them an opportunity, but it also gives you an opportunity. If they see that and like that and can do more, that's the one time they're going to ask you. They're not going to ask you other times, but if they want more, they're going to say, okay, what's 20000 look like? So leave that option there by doing the good, better, best. It'll, it'll help you more than hurt you. Once you have, you're on dialysis. Okay, yeah. so that's why we had to go to a guaranteed issue. You knew that already? Yeah. Okay. Let me just pull that policy up. Where did my AIG go? All right, and then what is your mailing address? I feel like everything is moving slow today. I don't know. So she just goes right to the app. Notice, you know, she he, she just said, hey, this is why. Um, I forgot. What did he say before that? I didn't let catch me, it. Let me go. Wait, let's listen to it again. Let's, let's listen. To yeah, it. I want to hear what. Here it comes. Okay, there's the test. YouTube, y'all getting it too? I'm gonna wake up. I know you had that plan. Wake us up. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. That's what the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's everybody. It's, it's everybody's fault. And it still got you. <laughs> no, it must not have got you. Let's keep going. We're doing it live here, folks. Sorry. Right. Company, which is one of the top companies, actually. Um, 
So there is nothing else. Anybody else, all the other companies I have, um, they all decline once you have, you're on dialysis. Okay, yeah. so that's why we had to go to a guaranteed issue. You knew that already. Yeah, he yeah. says, so So, how much coverage is it again? He, she didn't say, he didn't say, no, I don't want it. He was qualifier clarifying. And what she's doing well is just running with the app. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the key thing is, the key thing I want you to understand is she's moving right into the application. There's no time wasted. Are you sure you really want this? It doesn't sound like you do. Like, he'll speak up and say if he doesn't want it or if there's a problem. Do you guys understand that? It's, it's, it's assumed. She's assuming he's going to take it. Well, I'd like to take, to take a gander on what she's doing right here. Because okay. I've seen people do it often. I think she's just going to keep going until he says no. Basically, yes, and that's what you should do at this point. That's what I'm thinking. She's pushing on through till he says no, because unless I missed it, I didn't even hear her ask for the clothes. No, I didn't no. hear. I didn't hear him ask for the clothes. He, so yeah. she's assuming the sale and just pushing forward with the application right now. Question, dodge questions just by going up. Yeah. Yes, she. Well, can. she hasn't dodged anything. No. Yeah. Stop it and get getting off right. track. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. There's there's this pinnacle that happens, I think, right at the close where the there's that remorse potential. Mm -hmm. I really want to do this. And, and it, that's why salespeople get paid so much, because if you are trained well on this, there's just this momentum that happens where you're already filling the app out. So like, I guess, right? You're right on that precipice of buying or not. And people will start to just fall through with it. OK, doesn't mean there's going to be there may be pushback. There's still a good bit yeah, here. We'll, we'll listen to it a little bit um, and kind of see how it goes here. But um, so far, I mean, technically, this is what we should do. Mm -hmm. Just just move on until there's an objection and then overcome. At my site, it's like a security challenge. OK, I passed it. <laughs> I'll tell you, I have to hit that yet. Wait just jump, a moment. Jump forward a little okay, bit here. Stop at a. This one, this too, if something happened to you, like if you were, you passed away accidentally in the first two years, okay, you, your benefits will receive 100% of the face amount of the policy, okay? So it will cover them, you know, starting day one. Now, if death occurs from natural causes, you know, death, the death benefit will pay out 110% of the actual premium unless there's any outstanding loan amounts. Okay. Um, suicide, there won't be, well, it, oh yeah, it'll still pay out all the premiums that you paid in, um, minus any outstanding yeah. loans. Okay. Uh, chronic illness, so the accelerated death benefit rider diagnosed with a serious, oh, it's on there. Okay. So you guys going to get, save this. I'm just going to assume. There's like about eight minutes there that's just reading the app, and I don't want to get into personal information. The one issue that happened, and I want you guys, your guys' thoughts on this. Um, she closed it, but he didn't have his card with him. So first of all, is that closed? No, no, ain't closed. Ain't closed, so you got that card number in your hand, and it's in the app, okay? So what do you do if you run across a client if you're selling over the phone? Where this happens i mean the only thing you can do is call back right yeah. and it's just one of those things with telesales we teach agents the first call is the last call it really is mm -hmm. as soon as that phone hung up it's it's almost a guaranteed chance they go into witness protection program you never hear from them again yeah yep. face to face a little bit different you know you can roll up on their house knock their door get in a lot better a lot more frequently but with telesales you got to do everything possible to exhaust the opportunity that's at hand. So in this case, I don't know where he is in his dialysis session. I mean, if he had, you know, I don't know if I don't, it's hard to get out of the dialysis bed. Well, there you are. Hooked up, yeah. So yeah, but you really have to be creative to get the get the job done, you know, and, and get the money if you can. Go ahead, go ahead, Brandon. Now, I never ever recommend a two call close. Period. Under no circumstances should you ever ever call back ever a lead to close them. However, <laughs> there are those extremely rare times when you might have to. Possibly. He could be lying too. 
Yeah. yeah. That's the thing that we'd like to think all of our clients are just, you know, pure as a driven snow. Yeah. But they ain't. Well, well who, who was calling them liars? Was that you, Alvin? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or that was that was Jack. That's, that's... Al, did you say buyers are liars? <laughs> <laughs> You really, you don't, you don't, it's, you just can't. And, and thank you, Alvin, for making that up. That's a lot. We didn't hear any objections here, but the thing to understand with objections is you never can trust that the first thing they object to. I need to think about it. What do you need to think about? Right. It usually takes a couple of back and forth before you can uncover what that truly means. Okay. And a lot of the time, sometimes you don't even hear it like the bank account stuff, you know, like, it's a trust issue. And most of the time in telesales, I would say it's a trust issue. Yeah. You know, and, um, but the key is not to take what they say is truth. It's not, it's most of the time it's a lie. Mm-hmm. And when we get into door knocking appointment setting, we'll kind of flesh out that concept a little bit more because that's where you'll hear a lot of it on the front end. And you got to, you got to train yourself not to react and believe what you hear. And it's, it's abnormal because I don't know about you, but I always generally trust what people say. Yeah. You can't trust anything. That's, yeah. <laughs> Especially on the front end. You got to throw that out the window. Yeah. Right. Any, any questions on the close here? Anything you want me to go over? Uh, yeah, you. Yes. Jeez. Uh, yeah. True. Yeah. Yeah. Loans. What loans? I, th- I thought this is insurance. Yeah. 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 Right. So you bring up a good point. So what don't you say in a call? You say you say just enough to get the point across as long as it's honest, but you sell to the need that they've described and what their desires. If the goal is peace of mind and protecting your loved ones, then Ms. Mr. Jones, this plan is the best plan to take care of your peace of mind and your loved ones when you die. Right. And every kind of benefit and description is going to be around that. Now, I don't know if there was some kind of disclaimer she was reading and she was required to say that. I, I don't know. I almost think that might have been. Yeah. I'm because I've sure. never heard that before. I've, like, Me bones. either. I've yeah. never heard it said like that. You could easily say, but that doesn't apply right now. Yeah, I just don't say it at all. Yeah. I've, I've never had an pro- agent say that's become a, that was a problem for him. So it's like first room. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Luke? Say, like, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, who's at home right now? I mean, yeah, you really, yeah, three way it is. Three way call. There you go. No. No. There's no solid, solid as sand, you know? I mean, like, it's, yeah. Y'all remember we're talking about telesales. Face to face, we're right the opposite, okay? I'd try to call him back. Not not expecting much, though. No. You know? Right. Don't carry it all, right? So we can't get out of the answer up against the wall. Yeah. They could how bad they want it. They could be. <laughs> no, I yeah, I yeah. I, I just don't know if it's true. That's the thing. I you know, I don't this is that mind trying to say, oh, well, there are honest people in life, and they don't some people are well, you don't know. Yeah. So you so you can only say that after you've honestly exhausted every other solution, calling somebody, you know, or, or you know, whatever, right? But don't default to that as okay. I'll call you back. Like that's a recipe for failure. Yes, where where you stop? That depends. I mean, you know, I might. You know, the three way thing is a good idea, like you suggested. Um, I might call their bluff. Come on, you don't have your card on you. Yeah, I'll wait. Why don't you send the nurse out? Give the nurse your keys. I'll wait. I mean, at some point, like at some point, if that's why I say creatively, like I wouldn't have thought of that in the moment, but I just did. But at some point, it's like, come on, do you really want this? Yeah. Like, let's not waste each other's time. You know, and then it may come to that, you know, but it's like, let's do it. We're here. Let's get it done with. 
but you could call me back. Why don't you just call me back? Well, every time I've done that, yeah, hundred out of hundred times, this. nobody does. Yeah, and they just they're trying to get me off the phone. So that's why we got to do this now. I think I would tell them if they told me to call them back, I'd say, okay, I've been doing this long enough to know. Yeah. That means you're not going to answer when I call <laughs> yeah, you back. Right. Would you? Yeah, I would. I do say that because I've done this long enough to know that's what they're doing to me. And I want to call their bluff and just see at that point. And I, and then I'd probably say, you mean tell me you went to town with no money? Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah, see? I mean, you know, come on, give me a break. But they could have. But at, the more you do this, you're going to find out and I understand we're supposed to believe everybody. And I'm, other than insurance, I'm a firm believer in that. But here, they will tell you whatever it takes to get you to leave them alone at that point. And we have to understand that, that they're doing this not just to me, but to Dave, to Al, to Kyle, to everybody. It doesn't matter. So, Take it with a grain of salt and keep on going. This is the hardest thing for me to accept. I mean, I've just, you want to trust everybody in what they say. You want to be like a you know, half glass full kind of person. But then when you sell to the public, what you realize is, you know, they've got stuff in their head that prevents them from committing and they got other, you know, and they don't want to be, you know, it's just, it's just how it is. That's why you have to be direct and you have to just not take no not take no for an answer, at least initially, when you know most of the stuff that you're hearing is, and I, I've, I mean, we've all done it. I've gone to car lots and lied my face off. You know, I'm not interested in a truck. Yeah. You know, of course I am. That's why I'm here. That's why I came. You know, and, and buying stuff taught me that, like the games that we play, we all play it. You know, our, our clients do too, especially. I so. always like the old furniture store when you walk in and they ask, hey, can I help you? No, I'm just looking. No, I'm coming to buy a couch, but I'm scared to tell you that. So yeah. think about it that way. We do it ourselves, too, from time to time. Any last questions here on the close? Y'all feel like this is helpful? Getting some value out of this? Y'all get okay. value? Yeah, Brian. Yes. <laughs> Well, to be fair, we're just asking what kind of account they have. I've got I've got the direct express. It's at home though. But you're on the right track. The yeah. script is written to prevent all this from coming up now. Right. right. If we stick to the script, we're gonna eliminate 90% of these objections. I can handle 10, but I don't want to handle a hundred at the close. I'll take 10% of the objections though. So we're trying to whittle them down as we go through and that way make it more seamless and go ahead and get it done. And then we're done once we get it done. Yeah, we'll overcome objections before they manifest. That's mm -hmm. really the goal of our script. We want to make this as simple as possible, not have to fight tooth and nail for every sale. Like that's going to just grind your gears mentally after a while. It's emotionally damaging potential. So we like it. We like to keep it simple. Is this person qualified or not based off the questions I ask? And if they are great, we'll keep going with knowing we're probably going to sell them nine out of 10 times. And then, you know, if they're not, then we can leave and be done confidently, confidently leave and not have exhausted ourselves on a little odds of opportunity. Oh, yeah, Luke. Yeah. Oh, this call? Oh, yeah. What's his why? Wow. What's his why? Why does he want this? Dialysis. No, we don't even know. What we don't even know. I mean, the, no. dialysis. Sound, oh, he's on dialysis. Yes, yeah. I think that's you know how many what people we, don't have coverage who are on dialysis. Probably more yeah. than have it. Well, I think that's what we took as a why for some reason. Possibly, yeah, I don't know. Did. We didn't get a good why right here. And yeah. Nothing against Wendy. I want to throw yeah, that yeah. out there. No. Wendy's great, but we didn't get a why. But you see how you see how, and and I again, we didn't listen to the close here. She may have ended up closing it, but like, there's no, we don't know why he wants it. All he said is they won't pay if he dies. Right? He'll end up in a ditch somewhere. In a ditch. 
but that's not the why. Like he may not care. He's dead. You know, I mean, who cares? Would you know if you were in a ditch? No, you don't. Point? You're dead. So, so if you miss that why, this opens up the gamut of people who will come up with all sorts of excuses to say no. So, so see how it kind of comes back in a sense, right? Because I mean, I don't know why he wants it. it sounds, you know, is just because you have bad health doesn't mean you want life insurance. You'd think it would, but it doesn't always. Yeah. So. All right. You want to talk about leads? We can talk about leads. Time, yeah. We got time. Okay. okay what's time go. we got here? We got twenty-five minutes. Okay. Cool. Okay. Leads. So leads are the lifeblood of your business, whether you sell in person or over the phone. And in a sense, what is appealing about final expense is that it is one of the best insurance products that has a huge marketplace and the ability to scale a lead generation campaign in a multitude of ways. So part of this business is not learning not just what to sell or how to sell or which carriers to sell, but how to develop a system to keep you in front of people. Because even if you're just a good salesperson or just moderate, as long as you work hard and you've got leads coming in consistently, you probably will do okay as long as your work ethic is there, right? But you could be the greatest salesperson in the world. And if you don't have enough leads, you're toast before you even start. I had an agent once early on in my career. <clears throat> he was closing he, came, he called me, he said, Dave, I'm, I'm struggling. I don't know what's going on. I said, okay, let's, what's your activity looking like? How many leads are you getting? I get 10 a week. Okay. How many presentations are you doing? Five. Well, that's good. 50%, pretty high. Face-to-face -face agent. How many closing? Three. You closing three out of five presents. So his numbers and activity and sales were great, but he just wasn't doing enough work in the sense of getting enough leads. Does that make sense, everybody? So, so one of the things we want to leave with here too is what direction can you go to work with leads? And it's going to differ between telesales and face-to-face. -face. You want to talk about the face-to-face -face options yeah. and what's your best, and then yeah. I'll talk telesales? Okay. Yes, I will. Um, first of all, we'll start with direct mail. If you've watched any videos out there, you've heard direct mail is king, right? Um, and to me, it is, honestly. But it's where we take a mailer, you pay a company to mail out for you. Um, we've got a couple different vendors that we use, um, Lead Concepts and Need a Lead. And we will mail out to a certain zip code. Then we get our leads back in, we go out and work them. Now, the advantages, in my opinion, of direct mail, it takes my drive time down. I'm not running 50 miles this way, 40 miles back this way, 30 miles this way. Normally, with direct mail, you're going to be in an area. Now, I may have to drive to that area, but once I get there, I'm normally hitting people, boom, 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 boom. And when you look at leads, you've got to look at this. It's a numbers game, right? So how many people can I get in front of the quickest in my day? That's the way I look at my day. I want to maximize the amount of people I see. And I can't do that necessarily if I'm spread out driving three, 400 miles a day, right? So direct mail will fit that category better than some of the other options. It's going to be more focused. Um, depending on the vendors, they have different options. You either have where you mail 1,000 out and you pay a flat rate for it. You get what you get back at that point. So And response rates or return rates are, are something big in direct mail. You know, when I'm, I'm talking to my agents, I want most of them to be at a 1.3% or better on their response rate. Now, you ask me, how do I come up with that number? I take the cost of the mail out. I divide it by the amount of leads that came in, and that gives me my price per lead, okay? So I told you we had two different options.
We can mail out a thousand, see what we get. And then we have one vendor that will do a fixed price per lead. So that means you order 25 leads every week. They do the mailing to produce those leads for you. Now, there's always a clause, right? If they get more in, you buy those. But we're in the lead business, right? So that's not a problem. You know, if they overgenerate, that's a good thing for us. Um, one of the worst problems you can have in this business is lack of leads. If you don't have someone to go talk to, someone to go find out about their need, how well are we going to do? Not very good. So we look at that. We've got to have a flow. Now, direct mail is going to take a little while to come in. Here in the state of Tennessee, expect three to five weeks. Other states are similar. Some are a little quicker. But in our area where we're at today, I would say three weeks minimum to five weeks minimum. And that's paying every week before you get a lead, right? Takes an investment in leads. You have to believe in yourself and invest in leads. Um, so what I tell folks coming in is to drop a thousand to start with and let's see what the numbers come back. Because at the end of the day, my job is to make your ROI, which is return on investment, the best it can be, right? So we have to figure out some things up front, a little trial and error. Um, that's why we have other options than just one. If we had one size fits all, that's too big for me or that's too small for me. It doesn't fit me. It may fit you, but it doesn't fit me. So the key is to figure out in our area what's going to work best. So we've got the direct mail. Um, the part that I do like about it is it takes a little bit of work on the client's part. And you notice I said client, not prospect, right? I'm assumptive, always. They send it in, they're my client in my mind. They're not a prospect. But they have to actually fill it out. They have to put it in an envelope. They have to walk to the mailbox and they have to put it back in the mailbox for the carrier, the postal carrier to come pick it up. That requires some action. I think if you do that much, much action, you would think you'd remember doing that, wouldn't you? Some of them don't. They say they don't. They say they don't. <laughs> Smoke screen, but... That's that's why that's that's my part on direct mail. Why I like it. Um, now, we've got other types of leads too, though. We've got social media leads, media leads. We've got Facebook leads. Um, we have a few vendors that we recommend for them. Now, that's where they're going to fill out a request for information on Facebook. Basically, it's probably like a landing page or something it takes them to. Luke would know way more about it than I do or, or Ryan would, but it doesn't matter. The lead gets to us, whatever they have to do. But in my opinion, does it take more effort to fill it out, put it in an envelope, walk to the mailbox, or click pre-fill my data? That's up to you. That's not, and I used to look at that and I would think, okay, that means direct mail is better for everybody then, right? No, that's not the answer. Direct mail is better for some. Digital Facebook leads are better for some. It just depends. I'll use my area of Tennessee. Um, and Dave and I are going to try. We're going to try to generate some more there. But we've had trouble generating Facebook leads in my area. In case you can't tell by my accent, we're a little rural. We drive tractors. We don't drive trucks. 
<laughs> um, so that that cuts down. I don't have large populations. I work a 12 to 14 county radius, and I'm only got a population of 160,000 between 14 counties. Okay, that makes it tough to generate the Facebooks. Direct mail has been what I've stuck with because it works for me. I can mail these counties. I know about what I'm going to get back from each county as I do it. Um, now, with the Facebook, because it doesn't take as long to fill out, does that mean there's less intent? No, it does not. I used to think that maybe it did. Again, we're talking about this right here. Most dangerous thing on your body besides your mouth is your brain. <laughs> I'll promise you, I get in trouble all the time. Oh, <laughs> just ask my wife. She'll tell you. But so we've got to figure out what's best for us. Um, there's a cost difference in them. Direct mail is normally going to be more expensive. If you notice, direct mail has gone up twice this year because our postal service decided they'd go up on mail twice already this year. So it's an ever rising cost on mail and it's gonna continue to do that. Now, does that make me not wanna buy it? No, it does not. If I have to pay $70 a lead, that's fine as long as I'm profitable at the end of the day. That's a choice that we have to make individually on what's going to work best for us. And the only way I know to do it is trial and error. If you only try one of them, how can you say it's better than the other? You know, that's the way I look at it. But with the Facebooks, we need to live in well-populated areas a lot of times for that to work. Um, and I don't know if you're going to touch on the Alpha Leads program. Okay, I'm going to let you take care of that then. But we're work. I'll just give you a little opening for Mr. Dave here. We're working on a way for folks that like to self-gen. Have y'all ever heard of self-generating leads? Like this big, awesome thing that's going on now? It takes a lot of time out of us. Do we make money generating leads? Or do we make money talking to people? There comes a point where you have to decide, I need to just pay somebody to do this. That's the way I started the business. Let me just pay for somebody to do this. I need to be in front of people. Um, the Facebook, it does seem the only difference as far as longevity in the two leads. I can go back to direct mail from three or four years ago and act like it's brand new and they don't know any difference. Facebook, I do see the longevity. Would you agree with Lower that? Lower shelf life. Shorter, yeah. Yeah. shorter. We've got a shorter shelf life on the digital leads than we do the mail leads. But like I said, it depends on what you want to do, how you want to do it. The one thing I do want to let you know in closing is that we've taken all this off of y'all's plate. OK, we don't want you to think about it. We have vendors that we recommend, and that is who we're going to purchase our leads from. How did we recommend vendors? By wasting money. Just to be frank with you, how much you wasted? Yeah, I don't even want to talk about what I've <laughs> wasted. Uh, but that's how we came to the conclusion that we have. Now, does that mean we're not open? To other vendors? No, but we've got to try them. We're going to stick with what we know works first because you go out and spend $1,200 on leads and you don't get a single sale, you're going to be a little upset, aren't you? I don't blame you. I would be too. I'd say, David, get your butt up and go back out there and work some more. What did you not do right? But if you get leads that are just totally not vetted at all, it is very easy to spend $2,000 and get nothing. I've had cases where I've ordered 100 leads and never gotten a lead. Never got my money back. 
Okay. So it has happened. That was years ago and it was horrible. But come to find out, I was kind of scammed by a lead company. You would think they wouldn't do that, right? No, it happens. Uh, so we have vetted these companies that we work with. We are in contact with these companies. I think um, Alvin made a really good point when he talked about you want to know who you do business with personally. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. You will notice that the companies we do business with come to these events. <laughs> They're here to meet you. Lead vendors that we recommend will be at these events. They want to meet you. That's the kind of business relationship we want to have when we're partnering with a lead generating source. Um, because the more they know about us and what we like or don't like, the better suited they can make their product for us. So I always want to let everyone know, don't go out and go commando and just start buying leads. Talk to someone who knows. Talk to us. Let us guide you in that. Because I see so many agents drop three to $5,000 real quick and make a bad decision by doing that. And that's other places, not here. Right. But I've seen that happen and it'll totally wash them out of the business, folks. If you've only got so much to invest and you invest it and don't get a return, then you have no more to invest, right? So we're stuck. So irregardless of which lead type you choose, my main thing would be talk to us about it. Let us give you the pros and cons of all. Nothing's perfect. And then you make that decision and let's use trial and error to see what is best for each one of y'all. Yes, sir. Good point, and I did not point that out. The question for y'all, yes. The question that's given is basically, are these leads exclusive? Are they just mine? Yes, they are. That's why we vetted these vendors. That's why we trust these vendors. A lot of people resell leads, okay? That's just the way it is. Um, Insurance companies are built on reselling their leads to their agents. You ever been there? I have. It's not very fun when you go to the house and five other people that work for the same company as you do have already been to that house. And you're like, wait a minute, you told me this is fresh and exclusive now. Wait a minute. So it happens. But we want to stick with what we know works. And then if, if, uh, if new competitors come into the game, I'm not against trying them, but I'm not against telling you to go spend a bunch. I am against telling you to go spend a bunch of money before we know. Um, do, is there any more question on the direct mail? Okay. That's really all I yeah, got on I'll, that. I'll add a few words here. When it comes to the lead business, um, it's it's a real pernicious problem. Uh, there are three letter IMOs of which I won't mention because they'll cease and desist me that sell data, but masquerade them. You know what I'm talking about. Masquerade them as leads and they'll acquire them for pennies on the dollar and then sell them for $10, $11 each. They're making millions of dollars every week before you even have a chance to sell the, the lead that you bought. And they've been recycled. They're aged. I've heard it for years. And it's a, it's a damn shame because they're taking your money, profiting, passing off what they're selling to you as quality which in this complete crap. And these are the biggest IMOs that are in our space. And that's why it's really imperative. And then the smart ones, it's funny, the smart ones in these organizations, they white label, they don't mention who they're really a part of. They tell their agents, don't use that crap, use this instead. The ones that wanna stick around. And so you never hear this though when you're getting recruited in. You're hearing how great it is and how cheap everything. You're hearing everything you want to hear. So I say all this, whether you know, you're know you looking to join our agency or you are or you're not, 
I care about your longevity because part of this business is survival. How are you going to survive this business? Because it's tough in the first couple of years. It really is. But once you get past it, the money's great if you just stick with it. But surviving is part is, is in part not wasting money on garbage, yeah. especially in the leads department, because there's a lot of scams out there. Okay. Now, to speak briefly on telesales, telesales, we don't use direct mail because the acquisition cost is so high. I would rather have agents either A, buy some sort of quality lead from a vendor that we recommend, ttcleads.com, great for face-to-face. -face. We, we use them a lot for telesales. That's, who, that's our go-to carrier. We like them a lot. And then the other option, which we have, and this is shameful or shameless plugging here, um, we've developed an internal lead system called Alpha Leads. And essentially, it's what David was setting up here. It's you get leads at cost, so there's no markup. They're fresh and exclusive. They're never resold for a management uh, monthly fee. You don't have to worry about learning Facebook and managing the process, the frustrations that come with it. You just pay the management fee. You pay your deposits towards the leads. And then whatever the cost is, is what you get them for. The leads up, end up being a lot higher quality. We call higher intent. They know what it's about. We hire professional actors that talks about things in a clear way. So there's no confusion. It's not like a giveaway lead. Like there's all these gimmicks that lead vendors use. And it's really revolutionized our telesales department, especially. Um, we have more agents now selling more successfully over the phone than at any other point in our agency. And a large part of it is setting up this particular lead management program called Alpha Leads. So you can, if you, if you go on your own, if you're not a part of our agency, you can self-generate. That can work. Uh, you know, Ryan and Luke do it back there. Um, it takes time. It's, it's a lot of effort, especially on the front end. My experience is nine out of 10 people give up because it's just combining that with selling is just, it's just very overwhelming, but that what method can work if you stick with it long enough. But I, i tend to believe the vast majority of people are, are just better served by selling first, worrying about how well am I selling? How many calls am I making versus managing a Facebook marketing campaign? The other option that we don't do, and then I would just say keep keep your eye open or be careful, are what's called live transfers. Ugh. So a live transfer is where somebody calls you, right? Who who hasn't had the dream of sitting in your underwear at home, <laughs> the calls coming in, and you're just effortlessly making sales. I mean, it sounds great, right? Um, be careful with live transfers. Um, there's a there's a big impetus in this, a big a big pressure in this business on TCPA violations, right? And what will happen is these call centers that originate live transfers are usually third world countries, mm -hmm. Pakistan, Philippines, and they aren't under the federal jurisdiction that we are. And they will call leads or not, lead, not necessarily leads, but cold call data that hasn't been TCPA qualified, you know, do not call us basically. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll even share the information with each other. Like in Pakistan, my understanding is the, the call center business is owned by family and they'll share the leads back and forth and they have a heyday of it they make great money but you can't control the quality of the data they're using they claim that it's it's quality but there's no verification unless you're there on the ground seeing what they're doing which most of us aren't and what ends up happening invariably is people get sued by these uh, professional litigators they'll come after you for every call that you've made i have a friend down in florida who runs a business who was sued for 50 grand mm -hmm. I, ha I hired an agent, didn't listen to me. He bought a live transfer leads on Fiverr, which is just a cheap uh, you know, hiring website for stuff. He got his first lead, sued him for 40 grand because of like five or six you know, alleged DNC do not call violations. So my, my advice is to stay away from live transfers because the risk is so high. The cool thing with alpha leads and even good self-generation leads, 20 to 30% will self a point or self set a, an appointment on your calendar. Now, half of them won't show up, but having 10 people to 15 people to call that will, that's nice out of every hundred leads. And I think that's a little bit safe. That's a lot more safer and probably equivalent results versus, you know, the dangers with live transfers. The last option, we don't do these. We've looked at doing these, our TV leads. Um, the only reason we don't do TV leads is our high price point. You're looking at upper 60s to 80s, depending on the time of the year. 
like coming in the Medicare season, they're probably going to go through the roof because Humana, all the big time call centers are plugging a lot of money into TV leads. So the, the, they get very expensive. And uh, it's just difficult. It's just difficult to convince an agent to spend, you know, 10, you know, $800 for 10 leads. Whereas if they did the alpha leads like with us, they could probably get 80 leads, 80 to 100, a bunch of presets, you know. So I, I tend to recommend agents getting started. Uh, buy leads from a quality vendor. If you're full time selling over the phone, 100 leads a week is where you want to be. It's a volume game. It's not a you know low volume, high quality type of lead at all. It's just okay quality, but you make for up for it in, in, in quantity. Um, and then get into self gen if you're really confident in yourself, or better yet, hire somebody to do it for you. And then to just really focus on selling. Any questions on any of that? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, we forgot to mention seminar leads. Um, how about I come back and talk about seminar marketing? Because we've got uh, Kyle coming up here to talk AHL. Did you have a question, Tony? To anybody else real quick? Yeah, go ahead. 30. 20 to 30? 20 to 30. Yeah, 20 to 30 is good. You may go crazy like me when I used to do 80 direct mail a week. I, it took me years to scale up to that point to have the confidence and the work ethic to do that. But 30 usually is enough for most people. That'll be sufficient. Yeah, for sure. And I've actually run TV leads. I worked with a company where oh, yeah. we had some come in. Man, they were like, I don't know if it was just my experience with them, but I'd much rather be going to a regular direct mail because the TV leads, if you didn't get there within 24 hours after they watched that little infomercial or commercial, you they didn't have any, at least it appeared to me, they didn't have any reason to talk to you at that point, uh, which you think would be opposite. But again, what are we talking about? Our minds, they can steer us the wrong way because I thought that's got to be the best thing since sliced bread. You know, really, yeah. I can sit here and get TV leads or even the live transfers. I've tried them. Uh -uh, stay away. Just, I, You know, the other thing too, and this is just a general rule of thumb in this business. Be wary of those who tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> yes. This, this is not an easy business. It takes a lot of time. The failure rate's nine out of 10, right? It's tough. And you're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to show up at their door if you're door not, if you're a face to face agent. You're going to have to call them. Try not to fall into the allure of what sounds easy because it's likely there's strings attached and there's going to yes. be some catches. And, it's ultimately going to hurt you. So just, just some, just some word, words of advice. Okay. So Kyle from American Home Life is going to come down and do a little talk on the final expense products they offer. Uh, let's welcome Kyle. How are you doing? Let me pin you so they can hear you on YouTube. Yeah. So they can hear me on YouTube. Well, that's good. That's all right. That's all right. I'll set it right here. Yep. It's this out. No way you guys got down. Well, thank you, David and David, for having me today. I'm excited to be here in front of this group. Um, you know, we work with a lot of different agencies and David's group is top, top notch. I can tell you from experience, um, their training, you know, what they're offering to you, it really is top notch and they're not, they're not blowing smoke here. These guys are the real, the, they're the real deal. Um, so introduce myself. My name is Kyle Ingenthrone. I'm with American Home Life Insurance Company. We're based out of Topeka, Kansas. Um, in my background, I was a PNC. I owned a farmer's insurance agency. I tell you that because, you know, farmers is captive. They're not the cheapest product on the market. Um, and so I, I understand the struggle of selling higher price products. Um, but I also understand how to sell value. Um, the, you're not, the, as a broker, you have the option to sell the insured the best product for their situation. And I think that's, that's awesome. 
American Home Life has been around since 1909. We're a mutual insurance company, which means we're owned by the policyholders. We are not a subsidiary of anybody else. We're fully independent. Um, and the benefit to that um, is we get to operate in the best interests of our policyholders, and we don't have to weigh decisions on you know, the short-term interest of our shareholders. So we really, you know, we're a conservative. Our financials are A and best, A, a plus rated. Um, our A and best rating is B plus plus, which means we're, we have a stable outlook. Um, and again, we've been around for over a hundred years, very stable insurance company. Um, we're just under 300 million in assets. Um, and that gives you that, um, you know, small company feel when you call, uh, our home office in Topeka, there's no answering machine. There's no, um, prompts to click, you know, someone's going to pick up the phone. Most likely it's going to be Annette and she's super nice. <laughs> You'll enjoy her. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the products. Oh, I should also mention, um, we've been in the final expense market since 1994. So we're not new to this. This is what we do. Um, it's 90% of our annual premium that comes in, new business premium. Um, and we've been in the telesales market since 2007. So we were one of the first insurance companies to get into the telesales market. Um, so we know a lot about it and, you know, we recently added, and I'm going to talk about the products in just a minute, uh, but we just, we recently added a more brokerage telesales, uh, style, um, final expense product, and we built it to complement the product that we've had since 1994. We're in 35 States. So we're going to cover all of the Midwest. Um, the only state in the middle that we're not in is Kentucky. Um, we're not in uh, states on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and basically New York and everything northeast of that. Um, but we're in 35 states. We are looking at expanding in four states, which is Kentucky and those three states on the West Coast. Um, so we have a, a, a broad range of area where you can sell them. The products are the GuideStar final expense product is our, um, that's our core American home life product that we've had since 1994. In uh, June of 2022, we introduced the Patriot series product. <clears throat> In front of you is an overview of the two products and it kind of gives you a little bit of detail um, that I'll go through on each of them. So right now we have five plans. Three are day one level coverage. So I feel like we have the most level coverage options of any insurance company in the market. What does that do for you as an agent? That gives you five bites at the apple where other companies you might get two or three, and we three of which are day one level coverage. It's a huge deal for, for your clients. We're also adding a fourth level tier to our, uh, final ex our uh, GuideStar final expense. That product is gonna have a few more health questions, um, but it's gonna be something that you can use when you get into a competitive, price competitive situation. So if you've sold this before, you understand that sometimes you're not the first one, you're not the first agent to call them and they may have a quote from somebody else and they're out shopping to see you know, if they can get a lower rate somewhere else. In scenarios like that, that's when this tier would come into play. Um, and we're hopeful that product will be available in quarter one of 2024. So coming up pretty soon. Um, the product's age ranges are zero to 89. So I think that's a huge benefit. You can write um, you know, newborns all the way up to age 89 between the two products. And um, there's a, on the guide star. So the way it works is the guide star is a little bit more expensive. It's what I would consider the bells and whistles um, product. So it comes with, um, you know, it comes with, they both come with an accelerated uh, death benefit rider uh, and terminal illness rider, but the guide star is a hundred percent. The Patriot series is 50%. And the GuideStar also comes with uh, the nursing home rider. So you're able to accelerate that benefit if you're um, you know, put into a nursing home you know, prior to, to death. 
uh, their compensation on the guide star, it's a little bit, the premium is a little bit higher. It comes with those added benefits, um, but it also comes with a uh, very competitive incentive for the agents. Um, and the, those start at, we've got a quarterly bonus that starts at $15,000 um, in quarter of annual premium. We've got a $10,000 annual bonus for just 87,500 of annual premium. Um, and then we also have, we used to do the big conventions, um, you know, agent conventions, and we did them, you know, all over the place, Hawaii, Florida. Um, but we got away from that about 10 years ago um, to get more benefit, I think, to the agent. And so we bought a property in Amelia Island, Florida. It's beautiful. It's three bedrooms, three bathrooms. You can take your spouse, you can take your kids, you can take your friends. Um, and you can pick and choose when that works best for you. So you're not stuck on the date that we've set for the agent convention. Um, and we've had a lot of success with that. I think agents really like the fact that um, you can schedule it on your own time. And that trip starts at just $50,000 of annual premium. So you write $50,000 with the GuideStar product and annual premium, uh, you're gonna get two flights, uh, two tickets to Florida, and then there, there's a cash bonus that comes with that as you grow in annual premium. So a lot of big incentives um, with the GuideStar product. They are on two different apps. So the GuideStar is on our proprietary app. It's all on one page, um, which some people like, some people dislike. I really like it. It's easy for you to go back and forth um, throughout the app. And our Patriot series is uh, administered by Aetna. So if, has anybody in here used any of the Aetna products before? So you know that that e-app is super simple. Uh, it's really easy to use, super user-friendly. Um, I think it's one of the best e-apps on the market. Uh, so that's it's built on uh, Aetna. It's administered by Aetna. It's underwritten by Aetna. So if you're familiar with the underwriting that, that Aetna does, um, it's going to be very similar to their the products that they have. Both products are instant decision. Um, and you're going to get a red, a green, or a yellow. Red meaning they're declined. Green means that um, they've been approved. And then yellow means that it's referred to underwriting. And there's benefits to both products. That's why, again, I say they complement each other really well. They work well together um, on the Guide Star product, if you get a yellow, you're going to call and you're going to talk to a, a person at our office. One of our underwriters, um, you know, they've all been there for 10 plus years and they're, they're going to go through it with you. They're going to help you um, and, and they're going to answer the phone right when you call to help you with that problem uh, with the underwriting. Now on with the Patriot series, they have a brand new thing um, that just came out called reflexive questioning. That means when you get a yellow, instead of calling underwriting, you click a button, it'll drop down additional questions, and then you can get an instant decision right there without reaching out to underwriting. So why is this important for you? It's all about that timing. You know, Dave and Dave were talking about it. It's you want to get that decision right there when you're on the phone with the insured so that you have the option to make that sale. Calling them back is difficult. So you want to make sure that you get that information right there when you've got them on the phone or you're sitting at their house and we're not trying to come back, um, you know, to try to talk to them again. The underwriting, uh, the, the authorization on our GuideStar e-app is at the very beginning of the app. The benefit of that is you're going to get an underwriting decision at the very beginning. So if you need to pivot to another product, you've got that decision, you didn't go through the whole app, and now you've got to start that over um, with the client. Uh, the other benefit is on the GuideStar app, if you started on that uh, application, it's going to give you results for all five plans. So not only is it going to give you the GuideStar, it's going to give you results for the Patriot series as well. So you'll know right then at the beginning of your GuideStar app, if you need to pivot over and fill out the Patriot series app. So that again, is you know it's a huge benefit to have that right there at the beginning of the app. We also 
we have a voice authorization. So we've got the text authorization. Both products have the text authorization, um, but they both have a voice authorization. And on the GuideStar voice authorization, they're able to give you a code that would you could put into the Patriot series application. So if you do the voice authorization with our office in Topeka, it's good for the GuideStar product. And they'll also give you a code that you can use for the Patriot series product. So you can finish your sale. You know what the price is. You know that the underwriting has been approved. You can go ahead and finish your sale. And then you can later go back to the Patriot series app fill it out. You've already got the code for your authorization. You can finish the app and you don't need the client to stay around for that. So again, it's that ease of use, ease of business. You know, you're right there. You're in front of the customer. You want to make sure you get that sale um, while you're there. Some of the underwriting niches, um, maintenance drugs, nitro, Narcan fills. So those drugs, they have to be refilled every 60 or 90 days. I can't remember which one it is. Um, but with the GuideStar product, it's going to show when they do a script check, it's going to show that they're, they're buying those drugs, but they're not using them. They're maintenance drugs. They have them in case they need to use them. <clears throat> On the GuideStar product, will give you the benefit of the doubt. So they're considered maintenance drugs, and you can still get level day one level coverage um, with our GuideStar product. We also, GuideStar also... Um, has an option for level coverage with inhalers for asthma um, and diabetic neuropathy. On the Guide Star or on the Patriot series, two year look back for cancer, one year look back for heart issues. Um, you've got level coverage options for COPD, lupus, Parkinson's, um, some mental disorders. And then you've also got uh, no height weight chart. And then you've got the option to write with diabetic complications. So on the Guide Star, you can write it with diabetic neuropathy, but they can't have complications. And I think on the call earlier, there, somebody was in dialysis and so you know diabetic complications. Um, some diabetic complications, probably not on dialysis, um, but you could write a return of premium, the modified product on Patriot Series if they have that. So again, all products together, you're getting this wide age range. You're getting a wide face amount range. You're getting premium options. You're getting rider options. All of that combined together, you're getting results for all five of those on one application. So again, you're getting a lot of bites at the apple with your one application. Telesales friendly. Um, you know, I think Al talked about uh, true social security billing. That's super important. We have that. Um, you know, the first first and third, second, third, fourth Wednesdays, we have that. If it lands on a Sunday, we're gonna draft the Friday before. So you make sure that you're not missing drafts um, because those dates fell on the weekend. We've got underwriting guides um, and uh, drug guides for both products, they're out there. We also have this thing, it's really cool. Um, it's just a, a, a link a web link and you can put it on your phone. So I just have it right here on my phone. When I click it, it's gonna give me everything that I need right there. So if you're sitting in front of a client or you're not sure where you put your drug guide, you can click on that link. I have it saved on my computer. I've got it saved on my phone and I can say, okay, I wanna know about gabapentin on the GuideStar product. I'm not sure how that falls. Super easy, you click on it, go to your guide, look for gabapentin, it's right there. So you've got the Patriot series, the Guide Star, and then we've got some combined uh, underwriting guides so that you can compare them together. So if you're not sure which way to go, you can look at the, com the combined guide. You know, what is diabetic neuropathy? You know, where is that going to fall? That, the, the guide's going to tell you they're going to get declined on Patriot series. So you need to move forward with the Guide Star product. We also have, uh, you know, we talked about the e-apps. If you haven't used them, you want to go through training. We've got training videos on YouTube, on our American Home Life uh, YouTube page, full walkthroughs for both uh, applications. So, you know, you can get familiar with it before you, you know, go in front of a client to write, to write one. And then, uh, you know, accessible marketing department. Again, we're a small company. 
the marketing department is me and Tom LaBelle, who's our vice president of marketing. You know, David and David know us, they call us, and we're very accessible. Um, so please reach out if you need help. Um, and then they both, both products have the accidental death benefit rider for an additional charge. Rates. So the way these products work together is the Patriot series is going to be less, less upfront premium. And, and they've got two options for level coverage. So the preferred Patriot series is going to be your best price for the client if they are approved for that. GuideStar is going to be a little bit more expensive. The standard tier on the Patriot series, again, day one level coverage, um, but it's going to be a little bit more expensive than the GuideStar. Um, but across the board, there, the Patriot series is going to be competitive with everybody else in the market. Um, the GuideStar is going to be 5 to $9 a month higher. Um, and then when we come out with our level plus product next year and we should have the lowest lowest price product on the market so a lot of options there we talked about all the incentives the underwriting guides how the e-apps work i can show you here this is kind of what it looks like on our guide star app it's probably hard to see um, but there's your red yellow green and it, and it tells you right there at the beginning of the app which way you need to go. We talked about the real-time real decision. Um, there's also an option on the Patriot series um, that you can, in the, in the app, you can click on it. If you're, if you're applying preferred um, and you had a yellow, you click yes on it and it'll give you the options for, for standard and the return of premium product. And that's basically it. American home life in a nutshell. Any questions? The accidental death. Oh. The accidental death on both products is an extra charge. Those rate sheets are online. Um, they're available for both products. How close are you all? Uh, probably 2024, sometime in 2024. I don't think quarter one, um, but sometime in 2024. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to take a uh, five minute break. So use the restroom, freshen up, and then we'll spend the next hour after that wrapping up. We're going to talk appointment setting, door knocking, and then we'll answer your questions after we're done there. So uh, we'll see you in about five.
go. All right, yeah. hotline. <laughs> All right. So we're going to wrap this baby up by talking about appointment setting and door knocking. So this is specific really for the face-to-face -face agent. But what you're going to find is even if you want to sell over the phone, there's a lot of fundamentals in how to effectively call and set appointments up over the phone or door knock that mimic what we try to accomplish in the first 30 seconds on the phone call. So let me ask you guys to remember from earlier today, we talked about the opening of the call. What are some things that you remember are like fundamentally important when you're opening the call up that you do wanna do and what you don't wanna do? Throw them out if you can remember. Take control. Tell them why you're calling. No, well, beginning of the call, not, not um, ver some verification. Okay, perfect, perfect. What else? All right, don't ask questions too soon, right? Because then they may say, no, she's not click, right? Okay, so a lot of these fundamentals, most of them are going to apply when we're setting appointments or door knocking, okay? In fact, David, you're welcome to jump in on this, but me personally, door knocking and appointment setting is pretty much the same script. You're gonna hear a lot of similarities. The close is a little bit different. You're setting an appointment on one, you're trying to get in the door on the other, okay? So we're going to just jump in and listen to a door knock or an appointment. I don't know what it's going to be. And then I'll, I'll relay kind of the script and what's going on as it relates to some of the fundamentals we talked about earlier just now. Okay. So let's make sure that we're on YouTube. Okay. So let's book or let's listen to this one. Here we go. Hello. Hey, Barbara. Yes. Hey, Barbara, this is Joe. I'm just getting back to you and Rob here for the postcard that you had filled out in the mail and sent back to us. Uh, it looks like you'd put your ages as 77 and 91. This was for the state regulated program for funeral and final expenses. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yep, perfect. All right, what do we not like? What are some things you have not liked what you've heard so far? Do you remember filling that out? Barbara, hey Barbara, remember filling this out? No, no, right? So we're asking questions, we don't wanna do that. What's the right way to do that? Hello, hey Barbara, this is Joe getting back to you about that information you requested on the new state regulated final expense program. You listed your age as 70 and your spouse is 85. The reason I'm calling, so notice I haven't asked any questions. I've just assumed it was Barbara and just got right into the script. Make sense? One other thing I would say, and, and Joe's an agent of ours, and you know we're critiquing because we care about improving, right? This isn't a critical thing, but I want to see a little bit more enthusiasm. That's there's two. I'll speak on this. There's two. There's two camps on this. Some some are just like deadpan, like, "Hey, I'm just doing my job. I'm getting back to you." Real deadpan in the voice. But I kind of like a little bit of energy on the phone just to capture their attention. Um, play to your personality type. I mean, I, I guess I can be deadpan, but I, I'd like to be a little more lively on the phone, okay? That doesn't mean don't be sham wow guy. I mean, you don't have to be cheesy, but have a little energy, you know, get these people's attention, right? Makes sense? Do you want anything to that? No, just, I, I agree to have a little better tonality, you know, just, yeah. you want to be upbeat because we want a positive response. And what, what happens, and this is the last thing he said, do you remember doing that? You're handing over control to her. She said yes, but nine out of 10 times they'd be like, no, even though they may remember it because it gets them off the phone. You don't want to get off the phone too soon because obviously we're trying to book an appointment here, okay? So let's see how Joe continues. So bear with me here. Great. So my job, again, my name is Joe and my job is real simple. They just send me out to you guys just to help go through eligibility, help you see what you can qualify for. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes to go through everything. And they actually have me in the area tomorrow helping a whole bunch of families with this. And I'm just trying to find out what time is best for you guys. It looks like I could do. What time is best for you guys? Why not? Yeah.
sentence. Yeah, so the better option would be to have me out in your area tomorrow to deliver this information. How about I come by over at 10 or does two work better? What am I doing? I'm giving them specific choices that they can say yes to. Versus if you say, oh, I want to, what time is good for you tomorrow? No times, your sales first, right? And plus, it's hard to go through your whole day. Like, I got to get up, I got to, you know, take the dog out, then I got to do it a dialysis, got to do that. Then I got to go to the other dog. You know, so it's like, I'm just too busy. So pull out two times and just give them a 10 or two, okay? Or whatever two times on your calendar are available. Just makes them, makes the decision process of, should I let this dude or do that in my house a lot easier? when you give them two specific times. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what else here? You want to add anything to that? No, no, that's what I was hitting on. We didn't, we want to give them a question, remember where either answer is good for us, right? If we're asking them, yes for 10 is good, yes for two is good. What time, no time. <laughs> That, that's what you'll get. Or like it's in the morning or afternoon. Yeah, you could go that route. I don't like that. I don't either. <laughs> I, don't, I, want, I want to know when I'm supposed to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon. Yeah, that's the, that's the saying, like, well, company, and again. I will try to talk more on there. And I just tell them, hey, I'm the one that received your postcard through the mail about the new state regulated final expense benefits. I'm going to be in your area tomorrow. Does 10 or two work best? And we'll go over all of it then. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover the object. We have very simple but effective objection rebuttal sequence that pretty much is foolproof for no matter whatever they say, but especially the most common objections. We'll go over that after this. Earlier in the afternoon around 12.15 or a little later at like 4 p.m., which one would be best for you guys? Well, my husband has doctor's appointments tomorrow. Uh, All, right, what, what, All right. What do you say to that? My husband's got doctor's appointments. What's the response, anybody? I don't like that. Or would 6.30 be better? I, if, if they're busy, this is an objection we hear. I, my ex is busy or my husband, whatever. I'm busy. No problem. How about I come by at 4.15 or does 6.30 work better? Give them alternate times. They're only making that decision within those two choices you gave them, right? They don't know you work all night if you have to to get a sale. Hope you do. So book, show them some other times. Go a little bit later, okay? But cut them off before they start rambling on about their husband's nine and they got all these problems and the baby screaming in the background. I don't know if y'all heard that earlier. Like, that's just not a good time. The more time that you let them ramble on and talk, the more they're going to talk themselves out of the point. So when you hear them say something like that, hey, no problem, just speak right in. How about I come by later at 4.15 or 6.30? better. All right. Because you want to cut them off before they keep going. And before they convince themselves it's not And going. then they're going to, yeah, because they're going to convince themselves that they don't have time to see you. You can say, hey, no problem. I get it. I work all day tomorrow. It's 4.15 or 6.30 tomorrow evening work best. If it doesn't work, how about we do seven or does eight work? Just, Just trying different times. Keep trying. Rule of thumb, don't go too far in advance, okay? We want to, we want to see them that night or the next day. Yeah. Because you go to putting it off next week, they forgot all about you, and they don't know that you're coming by anymore. And we don't really want to call them and let them know we're coming. Yeah, so if I'm sitting down on Wednesday, <laughs> like tonight, I'm booking for Thursday only. Yes. I will not book someone for Friday. If somebody says, hey, I'm busy today, and I legitimately try to say, hey, uh, we'll just, I'll just call you back on another day. Have a good day. Bye. Get off the phone. Because they'll be like, oh, I'll call you. I don't know what happens, right? So just get off the phone with them, then just door knock them. Yeah. Right? Cool. All right. Um, are the doctor's appointments, are they in the morning or the afternoon? Well, he has a late morning appointment, but. Um, so in this case, I wouldn't even ask that question, just offer later times. 
because you just did a late morning and then an early afternoon. So you might as well try 4, 15, or 6. Again, you want to condense a lot of the excess that can happen in a conversation so you don't lose their attention or their interest, right? It's going to be there for a couple hours, so I don't know when we'll get out. Okay. What so if we did phone. something later around like 5, 15 p.m.? Would you guys for sure be home by then? Uh, I don't. What's wrong with that? It's a yes, no question. Yeah. We only want yeses. What, uh, so it would be different if you said, okay, then I'll come by at 5.15. If you told them what you're doing, that's different. But what he said is, would 5.15 work for you in so many words? Everybody catch that? Yeah. And the answer is always what? No. No. <laughs> yeah. When you ask for a no, you get a no. And that's what you're doing by default with that type of question. Look, get... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, listen. Yeah, you'll hear more of it. It's it worse. Stuff. We're both dragging by that. Uh oh. Let me download this real quick. Yeah, so what happens here while this is downloading, I'll have to do this real quick. Um, she starts taking control, the thing that we fear, right? And who gave them the opportunity to do that? Right. What if we did something later around like 5 15 p.m.? Would you guys for sure be home by then? Uh, I, don't, I don't like that late stuff. We're both dragging by then. And my mind doesn't work too well. Oh, um, got it. Now tell me something. I mean, I already, we already have funeral arrangements made as far as our, our uh, a payment toward. Um, so now she's she's making a declarative statement and she's about to ask him a question. Now we've got all this stuff taken care of. We don't need this. So now it's turning into a sales call. The purpose of setting an appointment on the phone is to do what? Yeah. Set an appointment. It's not to sell the product. It's not to make and become friends. It's to get you in the home. Because as a face-to-face -face agent, where your advantage lies is in front of the prospect at the kitchen table. Okay. That's why conversion rates for face-to-face -face agents are double, if not triple, telesales. Because with telesales, you got to do the whole thing over the phone. There's trust issues that are just inherent. You can overcome them with good training, of course. But the face-to-face -face, face -face agent shines in front of the prospect. And if we start selling the product, people start to not want it. So, so you got to be careful with this stuff. This is why, you know, when she starts asking a question like this, and let's, let's listen to this, and I'll tell you kind of what I would say. What do you call it? Yeah, a funeral. Yeah, well, not a funeral itself. We're not really going to have a funeral. So I guess it really doesn't make that much difference, right? So I don't need this. What's the objection rebuttal to I don't need this? So this this brings us to our 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 objection rebuttal AS the ask method. So here's how it stands. That's the acronym. We A answered the objection. We S sell why we're coming anyway, and then we C close ASC. Okay, works for anything. So if I don't need it, and that's what I that's what I hear, I'm going to say, hey, no problem. All I need is five minutes for me to show you what this is about and what you do with it's up to you. Why don't I come by at six fifteen or does eight? So what did I do there? I answered the objection. I said, no problem. I didn't say, no, you're wrong. That pre-need plan's bad because ABCX. I'm not in a sales situation and I don't want to be combative on the phone to the person I just met. So I'm just going to acknowledge them. Hey, that's cool. No problem. All I need is five minutes to show you how this works and whatever you do with it's up to you. That is saying, hey, this is quick. It's casual. No big deal. All I need is five minutes and what you do with it's up to you. There's no obligation. So you can't argue about time can't argue about like it's a big deal. It's, it's no big deal. And I'm going to say that with my tonality, right? But the last piece, the third piece, the close is where all y'all are going to screw up the most. Mm -hmm. You're going to say the first two in some form or fashion, but you won't close because you have to take back control after their question, that, that objection. And the close is simple. You just restate the times. How about 10 o'clock or does two work better? Whatever times they gave you. Every single time on an objection, it's answer, sell why you're coming anyway, and then close. Close. Always be closed. You have to close. Because if you just say, hey, no problem. All I need is five minutes. What you do is it's up to you. They're still in control. You haven't 
taken leadership and shown them what they want to do, what you want to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. When we review sales calls, this is the biggest mistake that agents make. And this is why this call, I'm not going to subject you to it, is 10 minutes long. And, and yeah, yeah. It gets it's worse. It, it gets worse. There's more and more. It turns into a telescope. <laughs> he does book it, apparently. Um, but I haven't listened to the whole thing because it's too long. What you want to do is, is you should be on, on and off the phone in a matter of a couple minutes, tops. Because you're not going in the conversation or sales mode. You're booking the appointment. No problem. What you do with it's up to you. How about I come by at 10 or 2? So let's go over some other objections. Throw out some other objections, y'all. Tell me what you hear, and I'll tell, we'll see how this applies. What's a common objection? I don't remember doing it. Hey, no problem. All I need is five minutes to show the information you filled out on Facebook, what you do with it's up to you. I'm going to come by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? I want to look at company X. Where you come? That's fine. All I need is five minutes to show you how my company works and what you do with this and the other is totally up to you. Why don't I come by at three or six? Work better? Sit. Yeah, I get it. That's why I just need five minutes to show you how it works and what you do with it's up to you. No big deal. How about 10 o'clock or does two work? Yeah, and I'm going to show you how this whole thing works in five minutes. What you do with it's up to you. How about two or ten? But you just keep doing that. I know it sounds stupid, yeah, but it works. And you have to have the conviction in your tone. That's the other thing. Is you just it it, it, it sounds weird with us kind of like it doesn't sound like a normal conversation. Sounds like a you have to believe it, right? It has to come through your voice. Because what is it about objections? They're bullshit. Yeah. Right. What they're saying is not true. So you trying to talk about well, you know. You need you actually need this life insurance because whatever, like they say they say I already got life insurance. It's not real. It's not real. It's not, they may not have it. They may have it, but it might be something entirely different. It's just there's too little information to know. So that's why we use this kind of boilerplate objection. It's really easy to remember. It works for most objections really well. So I would advise all y'all to use it. Anything that? No, that uh, we basically just keep continuing to go back to the same thing. Why don't I come by at six o'clock or does eight? Not any, well, how about 10 o'clock or how about eight in the morning? How about in the morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's different. If I've if I've exhausted trying to get all those times that they're out out of the, the the they're not at home, and they and I've gone through that process, then at that point I'm like, okay, sounds like you're busy. I'll call you back in a couple of days. Have a great vacation. Bye. And I just got the phone, but I'm not going to stick around long enough to say, well, let's call you. I got your number on my phone, you know, because that's I want to get off that phone. And okay. me me personally, if I've called them to set an appointment and they're busy like that. I'll tell them I'm going to call them. My call is knock, knock, knock. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go to the door. Yeah. Yes, if, I, if I'm in that area, I'm knocking the next day, and they're going to be really surprised. They won't remember who you are. They won't know me. They won't know me. You know, me how, you know how many spam calls seniors get? It's like one every hour. Yeah. Yeah. I just walk up and do my door knock, and... Now, now the thing, the thing too, how people act on the phone versus in person is entirely different, right? Yes. When you show up in, in person and you look them square in the eye, a lot of that like talk and toughness goes away. Yeah. And most people are, are much more accommodating in person. Yeah. I've, I've had them cuss me out on the phone and hang up and give them about three days and go door knock them. And everybody in the house wants a policy and they all love me. I don't know what changed. I don't think they even knew I was the one they cursed out. No, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. It's, it's funny. But they get so many calls. Yeah. Yeah. And I had I had a lady once, this reminds me, it's not exactly the same, but it's just, it goes to show you again, that brain getting in the way. I had a lady who I had a preset appointment with. I had a ride along that day okay. and we sat down and, and she was a little combative with me. And, and, and then I asked for her prescriptions and she said, Mr. DuFord, 
get out of my house right now. I don't want you in my house anymore. I said, man, I'm just trying to do my job, trying to help you out and get past. I don't care. Get out of my house. She got pissed. So okay, we'll leave. And I said, come on, people, let's go. Let's get out. So then she sent back another card like mm-hmm. six months later. She threw me out of her house. Okay. I roll up. She doesn't remember any of it. Right. I sit down and we talk and do this and do that. And I didn't write her up. But as I was leaving, she was like, do I, do I know you? Have I talked to you before? I'm like, oh, yeah, you threw me out of your house, you know? <laughs> but the funny thing is, the, the last thing, I, I knew a guy that went with her to church, and he cut her yard, and she, she stopped paying him to cut his yard, or cut her yard. And I was like, you know, this lady, she threw me out of the house, like a real good guy, referred me a bunch of people. And he's like, oh, yeah, man, she's, she drinks vodka starting at 10 in the morning. And that's why. I was like, okay, well, now I know. See, the stuff that you never hear, this is one of those opportunities. It's like, wow. Anyways, okay. <laughs> Let's listen to another. Uh... Yeah. Hey, you, was, you was messing up her project. Yeah. All right, so this is a door knock. Let me, let me fast forward a little bit here. Catching the bus. That you and your wife sent in? Oh, hold up. Hi, yes. this is Walter. All right, so when you door knock, you got to sound like the police. Why would you answer the door for a salesperson? You would for a cop. So you want to knock like this. Get their attention. First of all, our clients halfway can't hear anyway. Second of all, the TV's blaring somewhere in the house, so they're probably not going to hear that. Okay. Third of all, what about the uh, the, the camera phone or the 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 ring the, the ring, ring doorbell or the doorbell? Half of those don't even work. Yeah. Okay. So you got to knock on the door with conviction. This makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Why not too much like the salesperson? Like the cops, yeah, to get your attention, Brandon. Yeah, <laughs> what, 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 what I've heard agents they'll knock like this no joke. This, uh, yeah, that's not gonna. Work. I'm like, I heard somebody at my door, I'm like, is, is that a bird? You know, it's like, there's no person knocking on my door, and I ignored him. Yeah. And then, you know, they knocked again. I was like, oh, so knock, I knock like nine to 11 times at the door. I count to 1010 if they don't answer, and then I do it again. And then I count to 1,010, do it again. And at that point, I'm like, Mildred, you there? Mildred? Yeah. And I'll start yelling their name out in case they're hiding behind the door like, this is weird dude knocking on my door like this, you know? So um, the other thing I would recommend you do when you're standing at a, a door, look in the eye hole, okay? If it's, if it's light, there's nobody in front of it. As soon as it goes dark, somebody's big old head and eyeballs looking out of it. And that's when I wave at him. Hey, what's going on? Mm-hmm. All right. Another thing, as you get out, the, as you leave the car and, and you're at a house, wave at the blinds, even if they're closed, because there could be Mildred peeking through, wondering who you are. And if you wave, they're like, ah, he caught me. You're much more obligated to answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, and I like when I'm at the door, I like to step back a little bit. I'm six foot, sort of big. So I don't want to be intimidated, especially little lady answers, right? So I'll step back a little bit, step down the stoop or the stairs a little bit and uh, to like answer the, any questions on the preliminary stuff? You want to add anything to that? Um, If there's more than one door, yeah, look for the one most used, right? And even if you don't get them at that one, Go to every other door and by ba- and bang on it, knock yep. on it, whatever you want to call it. Um, if there's a window up there close to the door, I'll get on that window sill and double it up like that. Boom, boom, boom. And I stop at three because that's a cop knock, right? Three, boom, boom, boom. Um, so yeah, we want to get their attention because honestly, I've seen people sitting there, me beating on the door. And they're watching TV, and I can see them, and and I can see them, and then I always do like like Dave said, "Hey Mildred, 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 boom, 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 Mildred." I want to get her to come out, you know. So, and peeping out the blinds, they do it all the time. 
wave. If there's neighbors in the yard, wave to them. You don't want to look like a threat. I'd right, rather right. look like someone True. who waves to everybody yeah. than a threat. That's a good point. The other thing is most people don't use their front door. No. Nope. They use their side door. Okay. So go to the carport door or wherever on the side and try all the doors. Again, I, I've seen people who have a big old entertainment center in front of that in front, front door. of the door. Yeah. And you can tell like there's spider webs and leaves all in front of the front door. Yeah. Like nobody goes to the front door, you know? Yeah. So, so make sure you try the side door. That's kind of the preferred place. If they have a soliciting. What's that? We're not soliciting. They sent the card back. I'm just responding to the information they request. Yep. I used to have a um, a recording of a door knock where I remembered I was in Rome, Georgia, and there was a big old no soliciting sign on the tree. And I just walked past it, knocking the door, and and uh, she was real nice. And she was sick with the flu, so I didn't see her that day. She was. That wasn't a objection. A big one. She was. She was pretty sick. And uh, didn't say anything about the sign. So those are for like the... Um, you know, the religious stuff and the, That's you know, right. magazine sales people, sales people, you know, right. hitchhikers, right? Yeah. Meth heads, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> I had, a, I had, a, I one time was running an appointment in Athens uh, over in East Tennessee and uh, it was a preset appointment and I was rolling up to it and there was a giant, you know, like those orcs from Lord of the Rings, there's a giant orc head on a stick, like in the front yard. I'm like, this is my preset point. I'm like, should I run this appointment? And I was like, that brain's thinking too much. But I ran right up there and did it. And uh, and I, I closed the deal. It was like 130 months, wow. Great Western deal. And I said, what about that head out there on the, on the pike? She's like, oh, we, we use that to scare away the meth heads. It doesn't work, though. They still come up here. So anyways, hmm. an interesting business. All right, let's listen to the door knock. Hi, yes. this is Walter. Yes. Hi, I'm calling, or I'm sorry, I'm answering the reply for this information on uh, the final expense coverage that you and your wife sent in. Oh, okay. So my job is basically to go over it with you. Uh, I don't have the time right now. I'm kind of working. You okay. All right. What's he doing wrong? Y'all should know this by now. Luke, too many questions, too many pauses, right? Pausing and questions lose control. Yeah. I'm not, wrong script. I'm calling you today. I mean, for for probably first guy's door knock. That's one of my guys, yeah. It was that. I can tell by the voice. That's oh, Peter. It's Peter. Yeah, that's Peter. Peter. That's Peter. And he was very new at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I I picked up on the voice. Yeah. So so he's now he's like you're Walter, right? You asked that question. Mm -hmm. uh, you sent this back. It's pause. That's assuming you know you're gonna when you pause and they're face to face. They're like, gonna talk. They're gonna talk. Yeah, but now now he's like, I'm busy, right? I think that's what he said. So let's see what happens. Hey, what's a, what's a good time for you and your wife? It's uh, best if you both. No. Not what's the best time. It's a good time? Yeah, I'm busy right now. What do you say to that? Should I sit out? Yeah, here's a little thing to say on the clothes. You want to sit out on the porch or should I come in? So this, remember that two or 10 on the phone calls, this is where the door knock script's different. You want to sit out here or should I come in? You want to sit at your couch or the kitchen table? That presumes I'm coming in. The, the decision now is about where am I sitting, not whether or not I'm doing the appointment. So the decision's about something minor, but we've assumed that I'm coming in. Does that make sense? You're going to get in more doors that way. Another thing I like to do or teach agents to do is – be presumptive with your body language. So all I need is five minutes. What you do with it up to you. You want to sit out here or should I, should I take my shoes off right in? And I'm, I'm wiping my feet on the mat as if I'm about to come in. Right. It sounds, it sounds again, I'm, you know, my mom taught me to be, you know, not to presume, Yeah. but it helps because you're coming in, you're being, you're being civil. Should you take your shoes off? Some people don't like people wearing shoes inside the house. So that also works. So we, we interchange back and forth. And should I take my shoes off before I come in? Or do you want to sit out on the porch? Or should I come in? Or is it better to sit at the couch or the kitchen table? Because we've taken the decision away of are we going to do the appointment or not? And that's critical because you have to get in the door to sell this thing. That's a face-to-face -face agent. So if y'all didn't catch that, we're taking the emphasis off of doing the appointment, right? And we're putting it on where we're sitting. 
Okay. That's big because it totally flips everything once you do that. Because they're not thinking now about an appointment. They're thinking about where we're sitting. And we don't care where they say yes to. It's good for us, right? So let's, let's listen to the rest of this real quick here. Wrap it up. Both are here. Uh, probably in the evening time, probably. Okay, so like four. So if I were rebooking this, this is after I have tried saying all I need is five minutes. What you do with it's up to you. You want to sit out here or come in? No, really, I'm super busy. And then I would say, okay, how about we do it's, uh, you know, at what time is it now? It's uh, three o'clock Eastern or Central. Let's, why don't I come back at five or to seven tonight? Work. So when I'm door knocking, try to book same day. Yeah. Okay. If you book out again, more than a, a day out, they're just going to no show you. Okay. So book it that same day. Yep. If that doesn't work, then start first thing in the morning tomorrow. Okay, if five or seven doesn't work, why don't I come by at eight o'clock or just 10 work then? And just stay on that until they say yes to something. Okay, any questions on that? See what else happens here. Like five or later? Probably about, probably about six or so probably. Okay, any day of the week that works better for you? Probably, yes. Okay. No, nah, there's no, the only day of the week that works is today or is tomorrow. Today. Now. Don't give them that option. Yeah. All right. Because they'll say, oh, it's Wednesday, right? Yeah. Next week, Friday. That's yeah. the soonest I'm free. Yeah. Right. And then Two they'll make sure not to go come Monday. Yeah. That's when I'm ready. What, what's, what would be the, any day of the week at six? Probably like, um, maybe like Wednesday or Thursday, probably. Wednesday or Thursday at yeah, six. Yeah. Okay. All right, Walter. Okay. All Let's right. Put uh, information I sent about the, uh, the yeah the, the final expense coverage for uh, Pennsylvania state residents. A couple other things to wrap this up. When you're at the door, you want to be visual. Hey, Mr. Jones, my name's Dave Duford. I'm gonna look him in the eye, right? I'm gonna reach out for a handshake. Whether they leave me hanging or not is fine. But you got the handshake's just sign of respect, right? And then the reason I'm here. Is, and I draw their attention to the card or the Facebook ad. And I say, the reason I'm here is because you sent this card back and I point to their signature, okay? And then, um, or if it's a Facebook lead, I'll say, I'll point to like their favorite hobby or their identifying factor. Like you said, your favorite hobby was fishing. And then I take, I don't ever let them have the card because then they're like, what is this thing about state regulated? Free? You know, tax free, you know, the free, not the tax free. You know, then we're in the conversation I have. So I show it to them to show enough that they did this. And then I casually take it away as I say. So the reason I'm here, it's my job to deliver the information. What you do with it's up to you. It just takes five minutes. How about we sit out here or should I come in at the kitchen table? Wiping my feet, kind of looking down like I'm about to come in. Okay. And believe it or not, he sold Walter. He did sell I helped okay, him. Good. I helped him. All right. Do it. But right. Let me tell you how he sold Walter. Walter did not set an appointment very well. It was about three weeks later he door knocked him again in yeah. the evening, called him at home, and he got it done that way. But yeah, it wasn't going to happen off of this. He was a little more home. Yeah, he was getting he was getting better. Yes, sir. Exactly. All right. Any questions? Door knocking, appointment setting. Thing we, you guys want us to cover with that. Yeah, you can cold door knock. It's just terrible. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, I would have never done this business. I, I, I wanted leads. I wanted people that requested information. And I could say, hey, you sent this in. That's why I'm here. Like, psychologically, it's the only way to get me to do the business. So there are people like I, I've got an old school agent friend. He's probably 80 now. And he's all he ever did was door knock cold. And he, he does, does OK when he goes and works. But um, it's just hard to it's hard to recruit to cold knock strategy. Can't get a hold of these people, call in, try to set an appointment. So, with lead in hand, their postcard in hand, it's a cold knock on the screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We, now, cold knock is defined for myself as they didn't request information. I'm just approaching a random door. A warm knock is what you take the lead card to or the Facebook ad or whatever you're using and say, hey, you sent this in. I'm here because it's my job to deliver this. Right. I call it an invitation. Yeah. They know they know someone's going to call them. Or they've, they've only sent like ten of these in over the last twenty years, anyway. You know, so it's not the you're not the first agent that showed up. No.
one thing I'd like to point out why you're out. Let's say you are out door knocking and nobody's at home. What would we do? Would we get back in our car and go to the next one? Or since we're already in the neighborhood and we've been seen, would it not be a good idea to knock on the house to the left and to the right? Let them know why we're in the area. So I'll give you a scenario of what I did. Okay, they're not, Miss Jones is not home. So I know this lady over here next door is home. I go knock on her door. I say, hey, ma'am, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's David Heath. I know you saw me over there knocking on Miss Jones's door. I sent out letters to everybody in this area about the new state regulated final expense programs here in Tennessee. I didn't get one return back from you. See, if you're doing direct mail, we are mailing that whole area, right? So I'm going to see if I can get the conversation with her at that point. And I'll even be as, as bold sometimes if they give me much flack, I ain't got nothing to lose, right? I'll say, well, hey, what do you have to cover your final expenses? And just ask them. Now, I've also heard, what is the old one that used to be? Um, Oh, the benefit coordinator. Have you heard that one where they'll just go out and cold door knock and say, I'm the benefit coordinator for this area. I've never gone that route. But if I'm around a lead, I want to announce to the other individuals in close proximity who I am and why I'm there. And do I need to talk to you also? I didn't get a response back from you. Yes, sir. I don't. Oh, delivery okay. notices. Let's, let's get into that. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, delivery notices. So you can buy, if you put in delivery notices, final expense into Google, you can get these four by six sticky notes that look like a delivery notice from UPS or whatever. And it, it says something on there like important special delivery, last attempt, call this number. It's very vague. And what happens when they call is, you know, they're home. They saw the sticky note. And when you get that call, you stop what you're doing, turn around and go door knock. Them. Drive right back. Drive right back. Now, for those of you at home and anywhere else, there are certain states where this is frowned upon or maybe even illegal. I, Utah, I knew a guy that got fined for four grand. This is like 10 years ago. I've used them extensively. I don't know if you have. I've assumed you have. have. Oh, yes. I've never gotten in trouble for it. So, And they did request this information, and I am delivering it would be my argument. Yes. So um, it, it does work. Because then you know you're going back to a house that somebody is there. That's yes. not just empty. And I found some on Amazon that say, sorry, I missed you at the top. And then it has final attempt. Oh, that's good. So I kind of like that one a little better than what I used to use. So check that one out, too. I just found it about a month ago. But it's pretty sweet. I wanted to add in, we were going to talk about seminar marketing. You yes. want to give like a brief two minute overview of it? Yeah. How it works? Basically, um, we've got to get into contact with facilities that have our kind of people, right? If we're going to do the seminar marketing, we need to find our areas and then we need to speak with the activities director first. That is very important. Why is that important? The role of an activities director is to put events on the calendar. What are we wanting? We're wanting on their calendar. Um, and we have started a new, uh, a new part of, of my program where we are doing seminar marketing. Now, I'm training individuals how to do it. We've got a lot of great stuff on our, our website about it, even some live presentations of Dave doing it. Uh, we've got a script for it. But basically, it helps us generate leads, not at no cost, but at very low, low cost. And uh, like we were talking earlier, we're targeting our demographic greatly because no one there does not need what we've got to offer. And I'm a firm believer in it, and I tell them that. But that's another opportunity that we've got is the seminar marketing, and it can really get good. Um, 
I know I had one group. I always asked too, who owns this facility? Because, and then I asked the activities director, how many more do they own? Right. How many of these other activity directors do you know? Well, so, so some of the buildings are privately owned, but managed by HUD. Managed right? by. And we'll show you how to find them all. Yep. Um, the thing on seminar marketing, the way I look at it is it's, it is a springboard into buying leads. Mm -hmm. It could also be a good additional source of leads. Um, it's a great way to start the business if you are low on capital for leads, because it doesn't cost a ton of money to walk, to hold a seminar. Uh, you can, you get a $25 gift card to give yeah. away to kind of boost attendance, but you don't have to bring like a spread of sandwiches or cheese trays or any of that stuff. I used to bring a couple dozen donuts, donuts. water, and then get yeah. a gift card to give away. But the cool thing about it is uh, we say seminar, like this is a seminar today. But this is really like a 10 minute, 15 minute talk yeah. on the pros and cons of so really the pros of how our plans work versus the cons of not doing what we're teaching you to do. And, uh, it, you know, the people you get, you talk to them in mass just like this. And when they come talk to you, they're already they already know, like and trust you to a certain extent. The sale is pretty easy. Um, you know, I would average one to two sales per seminar, which may not sound like a lot. But if I make a thousand dollars in commission for a little bit of time and 25, 50 bucks. That's not bad if I did that twice a week, right? Yeah. So it's a great way to start in this business at a lower expense to then build that money and bankroll it into purchasing leads. So we definitely support that. We have a full system on teaching that. I've done it personally. David's done it personally. So it's, it's very good. It, uh, and it, it helps you, especially if you're doing it in your area. It gets your name out in the public, first of all. You know, we... We're always, my goal when I go out, no matter if I'm running leads, if I don't have none with me, is I'm going to generate some leads off of what I already have. Now, how am I going to do that? By asking for referrals, by stopping and talking to people walking down the road, by pulling in a guy's yard because he's sitting out there in a lawn chair. I'm going to do it many different ways. <laughs> Seminar marketing, I I think of it as a group presentation. That's all it is. But it is one of the easiest ways to get your feet wet, build some confidence, but to gain trust also in your community because now you're a respected advisor, right? Because you're doing that. So I think it's a really good springboard. Um, and I think everyone should implement it. You know, if you're doing face-to-face, -face, for sure. Any questions on seminar marketing? Door knocking, appointment setting, anything you guys want to hit on? All right, we could clarify. So we're going to open this up to any questions of any kind. It can be about our agency. It can be about the telesales or the face-to-face -face process, carrier questions, et cetera. Um, pretty much open-ended. I post this up on YouTube, so if anybody's watching has questions, they'll post them in. But we'd like to start with you guys. Have any questions you guys want to cover? Yeah. Yeah. So the CRMs, like for example, we're coming out with an internal CRM, and you have the ability to get a stand a standalone phone associated with your CRM. So you, you can get, I think you can get multiple lines on the CRM, but um, yeah, you, you don't have to use your personal phone at all if you don't want to, to make dials. So, Ken? Yeah, brand new CRM. Yeah. So CRM is just a system to manage your data, your clients, your leads, your prospects, and to put reminders on, maybe it's two months out from a birthday and you want to call a client and say, hey, you're about to get older. You want to buy insurance and lock in a lower price. That's a great reason why to call someone, right? And then you can also track your stats, like what's your conversion rate? What's your average case size, right? So it helps you manage your clientele and your business a little bit more efficiently. I would say with the face-to-face -face agent, it's, it's important to have some kind of management system, but it's less, it's not as, it's more important as a telesales agent to have it because you're going to be working tripled, the quadrupled, the leads, you got to have some sort of apparatus to call 
and have a follow-up mechanism and scheme in place. So if you're going to sell over the phone, you got to have some CRM. We have it. We'll teach you how to use it. There's lots of good options out there. The, the face-to-face agent can afford a simpler one. Uh, yes. There's some simple ones just to track basic information. Well, questions? We've answered them all. They all are easy. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to block some schedule time out. Here, here's the way I look at it. If you want to start doing some final expense and buying some leads, go out in the evening. Yeah. The evening time is normally, I don't know what that was, <laughs> but it was not me. <laughs> um, got a laugh out of everybody, though, didn't we? Um, but no, the evening time for me, door knocking, is more productive, honestly. You would think it'd be the other way around, but things have changed, it seems like. I catch more people from... 4.30 in the afternoon till 9 o'clock at night. So I would say block off, use some time, and stick to it. Don't say, okay, I'm not going to do this because I've got to do this. When you block something off, if you're serious about it, you'll block it off and you'll stick to it. But anything in life, and this is not just for this situation, block off time to do it and do it. But I would do it in the evenings because – I don't think with your brick and mortar, you're doing a ton of business at night. I may be mistaken, but I think for your schedule, that might be the better avenue. Matt, what do you? What's your primary product you lead with? Medicare. Okay. I mean, I would cross sell. I'd cross sell. Yeah. So, what's the challenge you're having then? Well, my interest. Yeah. Yeah. You sound you sound too busy and too and what you're and that's the problem with doing a lot of products is it's just like it's hard doing one thing really well. You know, it's hard enough. And if you're gonna cross sell, I would pick one or two carriers, get a guaranteed issue carrier and one like one of our carriers that we had in today. And then on appointments, once you're wrapped up with Medicare, say, oh, by the way, we're doing final expense or life insurance. Let me tell you how it works. You know, just you're there already. Help them and, and or call them and say, hey, this is your Medicare agent. We'd like to spend 10 minutes with you, show you how these new final expense programs work and help you out and just set an appointment. I like that idea. I yeah. would call through my entire book. Yeah, call your book. Is what I do. I'd start there. I'd call through my book. I'd just tell them, hey, I'm doing something new now. It'd take me about 10 minutes to go over it with you. Set an appointment with them and, and start out that way because you could probably mix that in better with your schedule right now. And then if worst case, set some of those appointments at night and go see them in the evening. You can control them better that way. It's new to them. It's 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 new from yesterday. You don't if you don't want to say new, don't. You know, I, I have a calling about the state regulated program. It's state approved. It can be that too. Yeah, state approved yeah. program. Some of them will say state approved. Probably. Yes. And now no. You can just now why do we say that? Because some people are like cringe, like state approved. That sounds like you know, weasel words. It, if you, it's because it's different than saying life insurance. Yeah. If you're direct about what it is that you're doing, unfortunately, people will shut you down. Yeah. I'm here to sell you a life insurance plan is a great way to fail the business. Yeah. I'm here to deliver information about life insurance is a great way to fail the business. So we use words that are not descript and accurate. Well, they're accurate, but they're, they're accurate. They're just not direct <laughs> to, to 
to entice the person to listen a little bit longer. And that's why we say new. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Because honestly, if you think about it, if it's state regulated every year, it's new, right? Okay. Follow my train of thought here, but new perks their ears up. Yeah. They're like, Oh, something I don't know about. Yeah. Just so, don't say life insurance. Don't say, phone. don't say at the, the door or on the phone. Just don't not in the beginning questions. So have we enjoyed this event? Do you guys like the information today? Relevant, valuable? Did you learn anything? I hope so. You better have. Did. That's what we want to make sure right. that you learned. All right. Well, thank you very much. So here's what happens. Uh, here's what we're going to do. First of all, everybody who is in attendance here, you're going to get your money refunded back that you paid for the event. Like we promised, it's a free event. So thank you for showing up. We'll refund your tickets just as our way of saying thank you and as our holding our promises. Um, we're also going to do a drawing. So, David, if you could grab the name tags for everybody who's here, we're going to do a drawing. We have four gifts to give away. Uh, the first one being uh, Advanced Agent Marketing, their Zoosurance lead one. package. We actually have work. an agent using these leads that wrote $10,000 in commissions last week. Thank and it's something you. like 25, 30 leads to start with, plus some scripting and stuff. We're giving that away. We're also going to give away uh, Agent more. Autopilot you Facebook you course package. That, right? uh, that typically goes for $1,200, teaches you how to use Facebook, okay. how to market for final you expense. Like me, you don't care. We're going to give away three months of a CRM, Agent Autopilot CRM for free, typically 200 bucks a month. And then Scale My Social, we're giving away a free video branding uh, uh, filming opportunity for your own Facebook-generated leads. Um, also... Everybody here is going to get an email next couple of days. It's going to have a discount to tips, tricks, and closers, ttcleads.com. You can get 10% off on every order. You can use it as much as you want. We're also, if you want to try out Best Plan Pro, that is one of the quoting underwriting softwares we have. If you give them a review, good, bad, or ugly, they'll let you use it for free for two months. And typically it's like 30, 40 bucks. It's a great program. So if you're getting started, something worth looking at. And then I think that's all on the freebie stuff, uh, unless I'm forgetting something. And then we will send out a survey later. So please take two minutes to fill it out. It's two questions on a scale of one to five. How well did we do? If it's not a five, what could we do to make it a five? That's all we're going to ask from you because we like to know what we can do better, if anything. So let's go ahead and draw for these. So, gonna, David, you pull them out. I'm going to be completely everything unbiased up. here. You know, yeah, don't play mix favorites. Them all up. Well, we don't know who's getting one. And then for those who win, uh, email, uh, go to daviddufour.com forward slash contact and say, hey, I won the X prize at Nashville. And then we'll take care of getting you wrapped up. But you guys have to email us if you want. Have we got everybody's emails? Did everybody fill this out? Did everybody okay. put email and name? Yeah, we're good. Okay. All right. All right. Let's first see. one. Here's the first one. So for the Zoosurance lead package is uh, Jay. Come on down. Yeah. Ah. Right. I think I'll, I'll, let's see what I'll do. Yeah, you keep it right. Right on, right down there. Okay. Right what? down there, Zoosurance, and then I'll call you. Zoosurance. Yep. All right. All right, let's sex one. one. Yeah. Okay, that one right there. Yep, second one is Mike. You're going to win the Facebook course package. So, excellent. Nicely Facebook done. course. Slip again. All right. Who is this? Uh, Hannah? Is it Hannah or Hannah? Either. Hannah, Hannah, you get both of them. Yes. Hannah, you get three months of the CRM with Agent Autopilot for free. All right. 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 It just put AAP, AAP CRM. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one. Last one. This is the, the free video branding goes to Brandon. So very All good. Right. Excellent. Oh, yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I still screwing this up. Sorry. <laughs> Put down skill my social. Okay. Skill my social. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Again, special thanks to Alvin at Trinity, 
Kyle at uh, American Home Life, and then Jack at Prosperity Life and ttcleads.com. Uh, go there if you need leads, of course. And uh, special thanks everybody who attended in person. Appreciate you guys for being here. Also, the we had a, a peak of about 140 people that were on our live stream. So thanks everybody who watched throughout the day and uh, look forward to seeing you at another event. Y'all take care. Thank you. And we'll be hanging around. If you want to hang around and talk, we're going to be here for the next hour or so. So free to hang out fine with us or get out of here. <laughs> I got a phone. It's oh, right okay. at the bottom. So.